So hey guys welcome back to my channel today we are gonna see what if Harry. Time traveling to the Marauders era this is part 1. So let's begin Harry Potter stared placidly at his ceiling. To anyone else, it would have seemed the normal action of the so-called delinquent boy, Potter. However, if someone watched him long enough, they could see his eyes traveling around the room, along the walls, often flitting to another spot altogether, smirking every now and then. This would, of course, draw their attention to the same spots, and if they looked closely enough, they could see human-like shadows zooming around the walls, so dim that they could barely be seen, all wearing bright orange robes. The only reasonable reaction would be to blink and rub their eyes before turning around and walking from the room, muttering about lunatics, unless they were one of the three other inhabitants of number four Privet Drive. They didn't approve of his abnormality. You see, Harry Potter was a not-so-typical 17-year-old who just happened to live with his aunt, uncle, and cousin, his only living relatives. Harry Potter was a wizard, a wizard who had become famous because of an act he couldn't even remember, surviving the killing curse, Avada Kedavra. His life had been dogged from day one by Voldemort, the most vile and wretched being to walk God's earth in young Potter's opinion. Harry's life had recently taken a nasty turn at the end of his sixth year. Albus Dumbledore had been murdered, it had taken quite a toll on him. Harry groaned, remembering that McGonagall wanted to meet him in the park the next day with some new information Dumbledore had left behind. He hadn't been active all summer, choosing to wallow in misery, until he was in the company of others where he smiled broadly and laughed along. It hadn't taken him long to realize the change in himself. Though he found that if he was with the right people, he could easily push his feelings aside, unlike most people he knew, even fooling himself into believing he was fine. He had a gift for bottling everything up so that no one could see how he was truly feeling, unless they got him mad. It was the day before term started and Harry was usually bursting at the seams in excitement, but now Hogwarts was closed. They were in a war, and all Hogwarts staff was needed. McGonagall had tried to convince Minister Scrimgore the school was safe and they could stay open by adding more security, but he wouldn't hear of it. Harry hadn't minded. He had decided at Dumbledore's funeral that he wouldn't go back for his seventh year even if the school stayed open. McGonagall had accepted this when he told her and had immediately inducted him into the order. So Harry was officially a member of the order, much to Mrs. Weasley's displeasure. The world had turned upside down on him again, and his name now appearing daily in the newspaper was not helping him get over the sudden loss of such a great man. The ministry didn't seem to mind. The minister happened to be terribly upset with him. Harry couldn't say that he minded much. Scrimgore's plans were nothing like Dumbledore's and it was being proven by the confusion in the ministry. Even getting his apparition license had taken a whole three hours due to the congestion throughout the entire ministry. Luckily the order wasn't running around in such a chaotic manner. Harry groped blindly on his bedside table and grabbed a week old daily prophet. He flipped through the pages, not really taking in anything, until he came to a small article in the corner of the page that he hadn't taken time to read before. Small flaw in defense system may cost millions the Department of Mysteries, a place of unfathomable questions, many of which remain unanswered. For years wizards have tried to infiltrate the department in search of treasures. Only two years ago this maze of doors, complex spells, and confusing rooms was subject of a Death Eater raid halted by the Chosen One. Even after many new measures have been taken, there has been a slip-up in their tangled web of security. Late last night, a number of new products went missing from a high security vault deep within the department. While unspeakables are refusing, as usual, to reveal the item's qualities and uses, a few details have been slipped to the daily profit. The items are about as big as a golden snitch and are almost completely black in color. They were being tested when they disappeared and are considered highly dangerous. The question now is not what they can do, but who took them. Harry grumbled and stood up. He grabbed his backpack and raced downstairs, sprinting out the door. He'd only just reached the park when Dudley and his gang suddenly appeared. They were laughing uproariously at something Dudley was saying, but they froze in their tracks when Harry walked between them, breaking their ranks. Hey, just who do you think you are? Piers Polkas sneered. And where are you off to? This is Big D's neighborhood. You don't blink without his say so. You should know that better than anyone. Harry stopped and turned around. His fake smile evaporated. Really? Well, does Big D have a problem with me going to the park? Dudley glanced at him. Huh. I thought you'd be home packing for that freak school. What, they not want you back? Keep to your own business, Dud. 
at least you half understand it. The boys started forward, a couple cracking their knuckles, but Dudley stopped them. A vein pulsed in his temple. I'm making it my business. I make the rules around here. I want to know why you're not going. Harry fixed Dudley with a glare, feeling an urge to instill some fear in his clueless cousin. Because the school's not open. We're in the middle of a war. And, Dumbledore's dead. Dudley gaped at him, ignoring his gang's murmurs. Dead? You mean that nutcase that picked you up last summer? He's dead? How do you know? Besides the obituaries? I saw it happen. He was a great man. Dud, I've seen things even Stephen King couldn't dream up. You'd die of fright if you glimpsed my nightmares. When you joke about hearing me moaning in my sleep, Dud, you have no idea, until you do, you should keep quiet about my nightmares. Dudley blinked and opened his mouth but a loud screech cut him off. A large tawny owl zoomed toward him. The boys laughed as it neared Harry, thinking it was attacking him. It didn't even stop. It simply dropped its parcel at his feet and flew off. Harry glanced at it, and noticed no name was attached. Dud, if anything happens, contact Minerva McGonagall for me. Do you understand? It's extremely important that you do. Just use my owl. Dudley nodded nervously. Harry bent down and flipped open the box's lid. There were two small items inside. To Harry, they looked like medallions. He reached out and carefully touched one. It started rocking wildly and suddenly flew into the air. It spun around once, and attached itself to Harry's chest with enough force that he stumbled back a few paces. Four straps snaked around to his back. Harry frantically tried to pry it from him, but it stuck tight. He gasped as the ground fell away from him, and everything went black. Harry awoke slowly. His entire body was aching and he couldn't remember why. It all came back to him in a rush. He sat up and felt his chest. The strange object that had attached itself to his chest was gone, but he noticed that his arms and legs felt a bit heavier than normal. He reached down to massage his wrists and felt something oddly smooth, too smooth. He looked down at his wrists and ankles saw that the device had separated into four pieces, but they looked different than the original. Instead of a medallion, the part on his left wrist resembled a gaudy watch, with no face or hands inside the small gem-shaped bubble. The other three were simple, skin-tight black bands. They moved as though they were part of his skin, only black and much too smooth. Harry tried to pull one off but failed, not even able to get a fingernail under them. He sighed in defeat and stood up. He realized with a jolt that this wasn't where he'd fallen. He was now inside and the stones forming the walls around him looked extremely familiar. He ran to the door and flung it open. Harry let out a gasp when he found a wizened face gazing at him. Ah, finally awake, good. You took a rather nasty fall, young man, right into the lake. At first I thought you were one of my students, but upon closer inspection, I saw I was wrong. So, instead of letting Poppy torment you upon awakening, I brought you to my office, where I believe you were most comfortable for the few hours you were out. Well, as long as you were up, please come join me for tea and we will discuss your incident. The man's blunt statements startled Harry into obeying without complaint. The man led him into a large circular room, one Harry had visited many times in his nightmares as well as his time during school. He fell into the armchair in front of the desk and gazed around. A pensive sat on a table behind him. A patched hat sat above a cabinet, twitching every now and then. A large red gold bird was perched above the wizard's head. And a number of silver, whirring and spinning instruments were placed precariously everywhere. But what really set off the room was the wizard himself. His hair and beard were gleaming white and long enough to be tucked into his belt. He wore half-moon spectacles behind which his blue eyes were sparkling with a seemingly hidden knowledge. He was old, but nowhere near as old as Harry remembered him. It was Dumbledore. Harry felt his hands start to shake. He clasped them together and leaned forward, determined not to look up, at least until asked. He started murmuring under his breath. P. Professor Dumbledore, it's not possible, I'm dreaming. That's it. I have to be. What other explanation could there be? My boy, calm down. You obviously just woke from a nightmare. It seems you know me at least. Good, good. But I am afraid I do not know your name at all. Would you please tell me so we can establish some even ground? Harry's brow furrowed. This had never happened before. No matter how many times Harry dreamt about Dumbledore, he always knew his name. There was something very odd going on. He drew out his wand and pointed it at the man's face menacingly. 
Dumbledore just blinked in reply. Who are you and why are you impersonating Albus Dumbledore? I have not a clue what you mean, my boy. Harry began again, keeping his wand in his hand, but lowering it to his knee. The real Dumbledore knew me for many years, even held me as a baby. He knew everything about me. Why would he ask such a meaningless question? That was a major mistake in your plan. Harry looked up when silence ensued. Dumbledore was staring at him in a totally different light. I assure you we have never met, but I have met someone who looks like your double. In fact, he has already visited my office and it is only the second day of term. Could you tell me who you believe that is? Harry shook his head, frowning slightly. No his eyes fell on a calendar beside the desk. It was turned to September but nothing else was visible. His name is James Potter. I would have guessed that to be your name, but you were laying in that back room when James was in here only a few hours ago. Harry felt his blood run cold. James? James Potter? But, that can't, he's been. Harry sprang up and seized the calendar. He turned it over and the large numbers declaring 1977 glared up at him. The calendar slipped from his numb fingers and onto the floor as he slumped into the nearest chair. Is it really, really the year 1977? Yes. I must say I am surprised by your shock. I did not think you had hit your head that hard. I didn't, sir. That must mean you really are Dumbledore. I am sorry about my reaction. It's a bad habit of mine. Quite all right, but I do not believe you have explained yourself. I comma I don't understand myself. I wasn't born until 1980. How could I be? Ah, that explains it. Dumbledore chuckled, cutting him off with a slight wave of his hand. I did not expect this for a long while honestly. What, sir? Harry asked, sitting up and staring at the smiling professor. A time traveler, of course. That is the only explanation for your confusion, appearance, and hostile reaction, as well. Taking this into consideration, I now have at least a last name for you. I believe you are, as anyone would guess, related to James Potter. Your father perhaps? Yes, sir. Harry paused, still confused. So, time travel really is possible. I mean, I've used a time turner, but I didn't think it could take you back very far. True, mister. I am sorry, I do not think I caught your full name. Harry, Harry James Potter. Harry, you are correct in your theory about time turners. You see, time travel is illegal. Even getting a hold of a time turner is extremely hard. Any and all other forms of time travel are illegal. I must say I expected nothing less from James Potter's son. I didn't choose to come at all. Harry jumped out of his seat in indignation. It was this thing. Harry tried again to relieve himself of the bracelet but it refused to budge. You are suggesting they were the cause of your time traveling? Yes. And I can't remove them. Well then, it seems you are stuck here until I find a solution. Dumbledore stood and walked over to Harry. Will you mind being a student until then? Not at all, Professor. Very well, I believe, however, it would be in both our interests to refrain from spilling any more secrets about the future. We do not want to change anything or give the media an unexpected field day. He smiled slightly. So, you must try not to tell anything to anyone, Harry. However, if something does get out, memory charms can be used. What about my name? And my cover story? Let me worry about your name, and the staff. You may make up your own story. Goodness knows you could probably make up some good ones, knowing your father. Dumbledore smiled. Uh, yeah. Harry's mind was in turmoil he was back at Hogwarts. But who was responsible for bringing him into the past? It just didn't make sense. According to Dumbledore, time travel was illegal because no one knew whether time was linear or planar. Either way, the headmaster didn't want to take any risks. He had explained that if his guess about the timeline being linear was correct, then certain things had to happen at some point so time did not become trapped in an unending cycle. If a time traveler did not let a certain event transpire, the timeline would become stuck in that time period. It was all rather confusing and Harry didn't like thinking about it. He was tempted to run away and find a way out of it, but if Dumbledore couldn't find a way, how could he? Harry sighed and lay back on the grass. He was in really hot water now. Dumbledore was taking care of everything for him. He would be in Gryffindor, a seventh year. His classes would be exactly like his sixth year and maybe he'd try out for backup seeker. But he doubted anything could put his mind to rest. Oi, watch out. Harry jumped up at the call, startled rudely out of his musings. A large boarhound was racing toward him, 
chasing what looked like a niffler or an oddly colored chipmunk. Harry grabbed the hound's collar as it rammed into him. It dragged him to the ground, forgot the niffler, and started licking his face. Fang, Harry whispered. Get off. Sorry about that. Fang was dragged away from him. Fang's usually well behaved. Harry got up. That's okay. A young Remus Lupin was standing before him. Harry gave him a half smile, too startled to do anything else at that moment. Um, hi. I'm the new transfer student. Name's Harry Times. And you are? Remus Lupin. I'd shake your hand, but, well, Remus nodded at the boarhound, which, Harry noticed, had to be at least half the boy's weight. I'll get him. I think he'll follow me. Harry turned toward Hagrid's hut, then mentally berated himself. He wasn't supposed to know anything about Hagrid and he especially wasn't supposed to know where the gamekeeper lived. Where are we taking him? To Hagrid's. He's the gamekeeper. Huge fellow. Come on, I'll introduce you. Remus released Fang and led him to Hagrid's hut. Hagrid. Hagrid. You have a guest. Hold on a minute. I got Tay get out of this mess. Hagrid's back appeared in the doorway. He was hopping on one foot fighting off some unknown creature with sharp jabs from his pink umbrella. Move along. Get off. He slammed the door and turned around. Well, wa, do we, avenue here? Hagrid, this is our transfer student, Harry Times. Remus gestured to Harry who was shooing Fang into the house while trying to catch a glimpse of the creatures inside. Well, it's good Tay meet ye. Hagrid shook Harry's hand so hard that Harry's shoulder gave a nasty pop but he smiled and shook Hagrid's hand just as hard, knowing the giant liked anyone with a firm handshake and a smile. Glad to meet you, Hagrid. Rubius Hagrid, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Now, how'd ye know da, Hagrid asked, amazed that a foreigner knew his name. Harry was prepared for this and rattled off his excuse. There's a list of the staff in Dumbledore's office. I just remember seeing your name. Duh, so? Well, I've got work to do. See ye both later, Harry, Remus. The sound of his name from Hagrid made Harry smile. After all, he felt quite alone now and he was, whether he wanted to admit it or not. And here was Remus Lupin, seventeen, skinny and slightly pale yet healthy and happy, with only a smattering of grey hairs, walking beside him. He was starting to wonder how he was going to get through this without going paranoid. Oh, Harry. Have you been to the common room yet? Wait, what house are you in? They were inside now, heading toward Gryffindor Tower. I've been there, and I'm in Gryffindor, don't worry. I knew it. Remus looked back at him and then stopped in his tracks, staring. I just noticed. You look exactly like one of my best friends. His name's James Potter. Really? He can't look exactly like me. They had reached the fat lady. Bravery. Harry filed the password away and followed Remus through the portrait hole and into the crowded common room. No, really. Except for your eyes and that scar, you're identical. Remus, James. Over here. A voice rich with emotion called out to the pair. Harry froze as he recognized who the voice belonged to without even turning to look at him. Harry looked over towards the fire. Sirius Black and Peter Pettigrew were sitting on the flagstone floor, books already strewn in front of them. Serious, Harry whispered. He felt his heart contract as his eyes locked on the familiar face. His godfather was almost exactly like he'd imagined him to be at school, with only a few small differences. Sirius's black hair was unmatted, framing his face, and relatively short compared to how he had always seen it. He wore a large grin, and his eyes were very much alive, completely opposite of the Sirius he had known. Laughter bubbled from his voice when he talked. Serious. Remus laughed. What are you up to? Whatever do you mean, Remus? Sirius asked, smiling innocently. Remus rolled his eyes. Where's James? What are you talking about? James is right beside you. And they say you're the smart one. Sirius gave a bark like laugh at his teasing. Just then, James came bounding down the stairs from the dorms and Harry couldn't help but stare at him. James Potter was indeed handsome and Harry now knew why everyone always commented on his uncanny resemblance to his father. James was a bit taller than Harry and was more confident. Harry was pleased to note that he did not strut, as Snape had always told him, but walked with his head held high, an air of carefree bliss surrounding him. His warm, laughing hazel eyes swept around the room, looking for something, and his face lit up in joy when he spotted his friends. Sirius, Remus, Peter. 
James walked over to them. What are you all doing down here? We've got pranks to plan. He caught sight of Sirius and Peter's stunned faces. What's wrong with you two? Remus. What did you do? Sirius asked in a shocked tone, quickly comparing James and Harry while his best friend looked on in confusion. Why'd you made a carbon copy of James over the summer? You can't have missed him that much. James looked around at Harry. His eyes widened in astonishment. Wow. He looks just like me. This is, amazing. How'd you do it, Mooney? James circled Harry, taking in everything about him. But the eyes are wrong, and I don't have a scar. Harry, who had never liked the scrutiny he received at home, felt uncomfortable with his father circling him like a hawk and decided to get out of his sight as soon as possible. That's because I'm not you, James. I'm Harry Times, a, a transfer student. I had no idea that I looked so much like you. Harry wished desperately that he didn't have to lie. He was accustomed to doing so, but not to his own father. Well, now you do. James exclaimed, extending his hand for Harry to shake. James Potter. Sirius closed his mouth and suddenly popped up from his seat beside Peter. Sirius Black. Harry took Sirius's hand and had to fight himself to let go but turned to the last marauder and took his hand. Peter Pettigrew. Harry nodded. Nice to meet you. Well, it looks like we're going to be dorm mates. You snore at all? Sirius asked. Remus rolled his eyes. Padfoot, leave him alone. Even if he does, you won't notice a thing. What are you implying? Sirius asked, his eyes narrowing. Oh, nothing, James sighed. Never mind, Pads, never mind. So, Harry, you feel up to some exploding snap? Er, actually, I, um, it's been a long day. So, if you don't mind, I'm going to bed before I drop. I'll see you all later. Harry sprinted up the stairs and went to the only bed without a trunk. He sat down, but sprang back up immediately. A pile of new books and a robe sat on his bed. Harry put them on his bedside table and lay down to sleep. How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Harry. Harry, it's time for breakfast. A voice broke through the fog in Harry's mind. Huh. What? Harry's brain seemed to be frozen. It didn't want to let him get up. He had been having the most wonderful dream, but Ron's voice calling to him made it all seep away. Harry. I know you're awake now get up. Harry's eyes flew open. That wasn't Ron's voice. Remus Lupin was bending over him, hands still on Harry's shoulders from shaking him. Come on. You're as bad as James. Harry gulped. Oh, sorry, hold on. He jumped out of bed and hurriedly threw on his robes. Are we late? No, Remus laughed, just a few minutes behind schedule. Harry rolled his eyes and chuckled quietly as they left for breakfast, jogging down the corridors. So, I get to see what classes I have today. Yeah. I hope you're in some of my classes. I could use a study buddy. That is, if you're the exact opposite of James and Sirius. I don't usually study extremely long, but I'll be around to help. That's better than James and Sirius. All they do is plan pranks. Don't let them get you in trouble. Remus sighed as he and Harry walked into the Great Hall and he sat down across from James and Sirius. Ah, Remus. Trying to ruin the new kid before we can have our fun with him. James laughed as he pulled Harry into a seat. Eat up, Harry. You skipped dinner last night. Sirius shoved a plate toward him. Harry nodded but took only a bit of food. He wasn't very hungry despite skipping dinner and now he remembered why. It was the thought of his father that had upset him so much. He was too nauseous to touch food, let alone eat it but he tried anyway, just to placate Sirius. Harry times. Harry looked up. A girl with long red hair and green eyes was staring down at him. He nodded, dumbfounded and much queasier than before. Here is your schedule. Ask Remus to help you find all your classes. I'll see you later. James whistled as she walked away. Isn't she a beauty? That's Lily Evans, brilliant girl, just not enough so to realize what she's missing. He quickly ruffled his hair even though Lily was walking away, just as Harry had seen him do in the pensive. Harry, thinking he should look curious, raised an eyebrow. Remus rolled his eyes. He's talking about himself. He's been after her since third year. Ah, well, she'll come around. Harry laughed quietly, a sad smile tugging on his mouth. Believe me, the girl who hates you secretly loves you. I've seen it happen. You think so? 
Sirius asked thoughtfully. I don't think so. I'll take that bet, Harry mumbled, not intending for them to hear. Okay, Sirius growled. I'll bet you three galleons they aren't together by graduation. Okay, Remus glanced at him. I'll bet you five galleons they are. Six galleons they aren't, Peter squeaked. They were all looking at Harry. He thought for a moment. Ten galleons they will. They gaped at him. Are you serious? James asked. Yep. Harry nodded. But the bet's off if you do anything you normally wouldn't to get her. James nodded. All right. I'm in. That means Sirius and Peter will each be out fifteen galleons. Or the other way around, Sirius grumbled. Harry shrugged. So, the bet is on. Someone chuckled lightly behind Harry, making him tense. Already mixed up with these ruffians, Mr. Times? You certainly don't waste any time. But perhaps you should reconsider and stay out of it? Harry turned around and almost yelled in surprise. A wizard stood not a foot behind Harry. The man lifted a hand and ran it absently through his grizzled brown hair. A small smile played on his lips as he watched Harry's reaction. He had a weary and slightly pinched look about him, but he held himself gracefully and a playful air showed in him. His eyes bore the same weary expression as his face. He wore extremely tattered and patched robes that hung from his lean frame and a briefcase with peeling letters which read Junior Century was clutched in his hand. You may be happy to know your things are now in your room. That includes trunk, broomstick, and your own clothes. Perhaps you should try for backup seeker. I think you'd even give Mr. Potter here a run for his money. Harry grinned. Professor. What are you doing here? How are you? The professor smiled cheekily back. I've taken the defense against the dark arts position. The headmaster was most pleased to hear it too. As for how I've been, well, I've been better. Worrying myself to death over someone tends to make me ill. Harry reddened slightly and bit his lip, keeping eye contact with his professor as he went on. But you've shed some light on the situation. So, I'll see you in class later. He strode past Harry and out of the hall. The marauders watched him go in dazed wonder. You know him? Remus asked. Yeah. He used to teach at my old school. We got pretty close over the summer. It helps to have a teacher as a friend. Of course. It always helps if you're the teacher's pet. Sirius grumbled, sharing a look with James. That's not always true, Harry said seriously. It doesn't matter with him. Either you make the grade or you don't. Nice to know before you start ing up to them, eh, Peter? James asked. Harry smiled and looked down at his schedule. He groaned. Man, potions with the Slytherins. I hate potions, and I'm horrible at them. You'll get better, Remus said reassuringly. Especially with Remus here, he's a big help, James said, nodding to the young werewolf. But I'm not even in the class, Remus protested. Yeah, but you know all the logic and stuff behind it. You just can't brew most the potions, James laughed. Remus grumbled. Sirius smiled. Don't worry, Remus. I'm sure if you got poisoned you could just find a bazaar. Right, because they're so easy to come by, Remus retorted. Harry smiled, remembering the last time he'd used a bazaar. Once you get one you should always keep it on you. You can never know when you'll need it. Sirius laughed. Are you that paranoid? No, but my friend should be. He got a sip of poisoned whiskey and almost died. My professor stood there like an idiot, until I shoved a bazaar down his throat. Wow. Bet he loved you for that, James chuckled. He couldn't complain. Come on, Remus urged. We've got to get to defense. All right, class. I am Professor J.R. Century. I have taught teenagers before, and, believe it or not, I was one once, so don't try to pull the wool over my eyes. Now, I will use a familiar face for any demonstrations, at least until I'm more familiar with you all. So, with the formalities out of the way, Harry, come here and help me. Harry walked to the front. Hello, Remus, Harry whispered. It still felt a little odd to call Lupin by his first name but the man had persisted and would at times not even answer Harry if he called him Professor Lupin. He had claimed it depended on his mood whether he cared or not. Lupin hushed him. Don't you dare. Apparently this was one of those times that he cared. Harry just rolled his eyes and stood calmly beside him. Lupin raised his voice as he addressed the class. Harry and I are going to demonstrate a duel. None of you will be hurt. I want you to watch carefully and hold all questions until the end. We will commentate if we feel necessary. 
They both moved to the front of the desk and faced off, almost ten feet away from each other. They bowed and settled into comfortable dueling stances, waiting for the impending start. Harry stared at Lupin, it was the same game every time. They'd stay still as long as possible until an opening came up. Lupin fidgeted and Harry struck. Impedimenta. Lupin deflected it and flung a stunner toward Harry. Protega. The stunner ricocheted and almost hit Lupin's foot. Harry let a few curses fly over his head as he poured a thin layer of water at Lupin's feet, determined to end the duel quickly and with as little harm to his professor as possible. He sent his own stunner toward Lupin who dodged and sent Expelliarmus at him. Harry just had time to freeze the water below Lupin's feet before it hit him. Harry flew backward, his wand soaring across the room. Just as he hit the wall, he heard Lupin yell as he slipped and fell, his head making a loud cracking noise against the ice. Harry staggered to his feet. He slipped and slid across the ice and made to plop down on Lupin's chest. He missed and fell flat on his back, his legs lying over Lupin's chest. He grabbed Lupin's wand and lifted it above his head. I win. Lupin started laughing and Harry dug his heel into Lupin's side. This only caused Lupin to laugh harder for some reason. Harry scrambled to his feet and slid over to level floor. He waved Lupin's wand to clear the ice and retrieved his own wand. Lupin picked himself off the floor. Well done, Harry. Oh, I haven't enjoyed myself so much since your third year I'd say. He chuckled to himself, catching his wand as Harry tossed it to him. Those were the days. Oh well, have a seat, Harry. Lupin looked around at the stunned class. I see you all expected a different outcome. The truth is that if this had been a real duel, and we had both held nothing back for fear of hurting each other, I probably would have lost in a matter of seconds. Harry snorted at the absurdity of that suggestion. However, we were much more laid back today, and I know neither of us wanted to spend a week in the hospital wing. The first half of this year, in the very least, we will focus on dueling occasionally throwing in additional lessons when a break is in order. I will often use Harry for these demonstrations because I know his abilities. As you progress, I will use others. Now, this is your first lesson in dueling. Notice that Harry had no hesitation when he attacked me. When you get caught in a duel, the last thing you want to do is hesitate. Why? Because that is when you become vulnerable. Any questions so far? Remus raised his hand. Professor Century. Why do you want to teach us about dueling? Shouldn't we be learning about more useful things? Lupin leaned back against his desk, arms crossed. Remus Lupin, I believe. Remus nodded. For someone with your reputation for brilliance, I would expect a higher understanding from you. James and Sirius snickered. I don't mean to be harsh by saying that, but you do realize there is a war brewing in our midst, do you not? This fact sobered James and Sirius. James spoke up. But, sir, won't the war be over by the time we graduate? The ministry has really made some progress in the fight. Lupin's expression changed from one of mingled surprise to one of knowing sadness. I am afraid you are far from the truth, Mr. Potter. This war will likely drag on for years, until your children are of age. After all, Voldemort the class gasped collectively, all except Sirius, Remus, James, and Harry. Lupin ignored them has already been terrorizing our world for six years or more. Defense against the dark arts will prepare you for this tragedy. You could be in a duel five minutes from now and you would have no idea what to do. That is what the Death Eaters count on. Most of them are cowards, but there are some of them in his army who don't care who you are. They will rip you to shreds if you let them. But Lord Voldemort, James, will not back down from you. Pain is nothing to him. Understand that. Harry pursed his lips. The bell rang, making a few people jump. I expect you all to know a bit more about dueling before next class. Harry went to get up. Harry, if I could have a moment? I'll catch up later. Harry waved Remus out. He turned back to Lupin and smiled. Lupin sank into his chair and put his head in his hands. I. Not a word out of you. Lupin parted his fingers so he could glare at Harry while hiding his smile. You have caused me a lot of trouble and many headaches. Do you know what I thought had happened after you disappeared on my watch? I almost had a heart attack. I was sure you'd been shipped straight to Voldemort. So, naturally, I convinced myself you were fine, retrieved your things, and reported to McGonagall. Then what? You mean besides making myself sick with worry? Harry turned scarlet. I mean, did you figure out that the bracelets? 
It's called a tempus inflecto, one of a large number of experimental mechanisms that have somehow found their way to us. You remember that article about the stolen objects from the Department of Mysteries last week? Well, I've figured out what they do. What? Harry sank onto a desk. You mean that these things are? Yes. Unfortunately, Arthur couldn't get any more information. It would have made the ministry suspicious. Lupin looked up at Harry. We have other problems, Harry, ones that stem from our biggest problem. Such as? Harry rested his hands against his knees. The marauders map for one. Harry, if they notice us, we will be found out. I'd be careful around your father and the others. You know what we were like separately, but together, Harry, you could be in over your head. I don't know what you can do, but you have to do it quickly. The next full moon is in two weeks. Lupin turned his back to Harry. Professor L. Century, how long do you think we'll be stuck here? And how did you know where I was? It so happened that I remembered a boy named Harry Times in my seventh year. I don't remember much about him, but from the strong resemblance I figured it was you. So, it was a hunch, more or less, but Arthur's information helped a great deal with my theory. I hoped I was wrong, of course, but no such luck. Harry, understand this, because it is extremely important. I don't know how much you end up telling, or, for that matter, how much we figure out. Either I forgot or a memory charm was placed on me. You must be careful. Every time you reveal something to me, the past me, I will remember it. But you could change the future, your past. As tempting as that may seem, you have to remember the consequences. First and foremost, you could end up not existing. I could. Yes. You have to be careful. There are two theories about time. One, it is linear. Two, it is planar. No one is sure which it is, because there have been instances where things have been changed, but at the same time, there have been times where they have already happened. You understand? Harry nodded. Professor Dumbledore already explained the theories to me, in acute detail. He believes time is linear, to an extent. And I agree. You remember how in third year, I told you I thought I had seen my dad scare off the Dementors. It wasn't. It was me. If I hadn't survived, I couldn't have gone back in time. And if I hadn't gone back, I wouldn't have survived to save myself. It's all a big circle. Lupin sighed. That's true. But we aren't sure that something big enough wouldn't disrupt the line. So, I still want you to be careful. All right. And as to how long we could be here, I don't know. I hope not long. That's two of us, but knowing my luck, it'll be a year. Just go for now, Harry. We'll talk more later. You just need to get the map right now. Hurry or I'll get suspicious. You you or young you? Harry asked with a snicker. Harry. Harry walked out the door and started running toward Gryffindor Tower. Happy thoughts chased around his head. He wasn't alone, at least completely. Now he had to take care of the Marauder's map. Can my life get any more difficult? Potter. Harry froze and almost turned when he remembered that he was now Times, not Potter. Potter, turn around when I'm talking to you. Harry closed his eyes and turned around. Can I help you? A young Severus Snape was standing in front of him. He was flanked by two girls, one with blonde hair and the other with black. I want my potions book back, Potter. Harry felt his stomach knot at the thought of Snape's book floating around the school with such important things in it. I don't know what you're talking about. I am Harry Times. Take your problem up with James. Harry turned back around. Don't turn your back on me, Potter. He's just an ickle scaredy. One of the girls cackled. Stop, Bella. Don't provoke him. Why not? He can't do any damage, sissy. She cackled. Did you say Bella? As in Bellatrix? You too are Bellatrix and Narcissa Black? Harry turned back around, unable to conceal the grimace on his face, and laughed. Where is your lovely sister, Andromeda Black, or is it Tonks now? And what about her beautiful baby girl? She dropped out of school didn't she? But somehow she still has a better job than her own mother, or so I've heard. Bellatrix lunged at him, but Narcissa caught her and held her back. Snape whipped out his wand. I don't know how you found out about that, but you'll regret saying it. Snape shot a curse toward Harry. Harry threw up a shield. Expelliarmus. Snape was caught off guard. He flew backward and landed hard on the floor. His wand clattered off the ceiling and into Harry's waiting hand. Mr. Times. Harry cringed. He knew that voice. It was McGonagall. No magic in the corridors. That's detention for a week. Be in my room by eight. I'll have something for you to do. 
Yes, Professor, Harry groaned. Good. I'll see you tonight then. Miss Black, Bellatrix, please take Mr. Snape to the hospital wing. She sighed and walked away, closely followed by a tottering Snape and fuming Bellatrix. After they had gone, Narcissa turned to Harry. How do you know that, about my sister? We have told no one but Severus. Her tone was sharp and to the point. I have ways. So, where's Lucius? I thought you two were in the same year. Narcissa's eyes widened. Lucius Malfoy is three years older than me. You know a lot for a transfer student. Usually, Gryffindors don't bother with such information. I'm not your usual Gryffindor. I hope we can learn to be friends, now, and in the future. Why would I want to be friends with a Gryffindor? Harry walked up to her. He pressed Snape's wand into her hand. Because, there's a little Slytherin in all of us. He walked past her and disappeared into a shortcut hidden by a tapestry. Harry? Sirius's voice carried up the stairs. You up there? Harry bit back a surge of panic. He had been searching through Peter's things for the map. He hastily stuffed everything back inside the trunk and flung himself onto his bed. It was only his fourth day at Hogwarts, but his detentions were almost over. The marauders had been curious at first about where he was going every night but he blew it off as meetings with Dumbledore. His time was slowly running out until the next full moon. What could Sirius want that had interrupted his search? Suddenly the door was flung open and all the marauders paraded inside. They were closely followed by Lupin. Harry frowned. This couldn't be good. Professor Century here wanted to talk to you. Don't mind if we stay, do you? James asked as he and the others got comfortable, obviously not intending to leave even if Harry objected. Harry shrugged. Lupin was looking down at him with something akin to amusement. How on earth did you manage to get detention your first day here? Detention. You told us you were having meetings with Dumbledore, Sirius barked. Harry ignored him. I got into a spat with some certain Slytherins. Who? James asked, propping himself up on his elbows. Severus Snape and Bellatrix Black. Lupin's eyes flashed. Ah, well, I guess I'll let it slide. What I really wanted to know is whether you have you been working on finding that layout I asked you for? Layout? Oh, that. Harry berated himself for the small slip up. No luck yet, sir. And I still need the charm to fix it. Lupin sighed. Tell me when you find it. All right. He turned and walked from the room. Nosy git, Sirius grumbled. The others laughed. Harry smiled slightly and relaxed onto his bed. What sort of layout does he need? Remus asked. He wants one of Hogwarts and the grounds. It's for a project later this year. Harry fought back a triumphant grin as Peter fell into the trap. We can help. We have the Ma Peter was knocked backward by three pillows, each thrown by his fellow marauders. What Peter means is we can help make one, James explained hurriedly. Yeah, Sirius agreed, sharing a look with James. We know this place really well. Thanks for the offer, but Professor Century wants a specific one. It's really a fantastic accomplishment he says. It has extremely complex magic that allows hundreds of people to be tracked at the same time. Useful, isn't it? Why yeah. Sirius stuttered, his eyes darting to James's trunk. Amazing. Yes, well. I don't know about you, but I'm tired. Good night. Harry drew his curtains closed and smiled. That conversation had gone quite well. At least now he knew the map was in James's trunk. Sirius really needed to work on being discreet, because he wasn't all that good. Two are better than one, because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up but pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. I give up. Sirius shouted. Peter squeaked and a long line appeared on his parchment as his hand jerked. Is this guy for real? Why did he dump an essay on us? And right on the full moon too, Remus muttered. He looked quite ill, but he was relentlessly scribbling, his writing turning a bit sloppy at times. It was already six and Harry's time to find the map was running out. Hey, Remus, Harry said hoping to put his plan into action. You don't look too good. Maybe you should go to the hospital wing. He's right, Mooney, James muttered, glancing at Harry. You should go. But I still have to finish the essay. And I don't know anything about dueling in the first place. Remus sank back into his chair, head in his hands, fighting the migraine that had already set in. Professor Century will understand. He'll excuse you, Harry sighed, marking his paper with a flourish. Done. Really? 
Sirius and James cried. Can we see? Potter. Black. That's cheating. Harry looked around. Lily Evans was standing behind him, her eyes blazing in the duo's direction. Come on, Evans. James snapped. Don't tell me you're an expert duelist. Besides, it's just an essay. What could it hurt? Everything. Didn't you listen to Professor Century on the first day? Yes. Sirius grunted. But that doesn't mean I don't think he's nutters. Harry grit his teeth. You know you should take him seriously. Everyone looked at him. He's a great man, one of the kindest people you could ever meet, but he's tough as iron. You can't go wrong with a fighter and friend like him. You really think a lot of him, don't you? Lily asked, her gaze softening. Harry nodded. That's probably because he gets good grades. Up, Sirius muttered. Harry, his temper on edge because of his failed attempts to alter the map, shot out of his seat. You really are thick. He stormed up to his dorm and locked the door. He sank down beside his trunk and sighed. He was already losing his temper. An irritating beep filled Harry's ears. He looked around and noticed his wand. It was vibrating noiselessly on the nightstand. He looked at it curiously and picked it up. When he touched it a thick smoke poured from its tip. Harry watched in fascination as a face materialized in the middle of the cloud. Harry squinted, thinking he was seeing things, but the image in the smoke didn't disappear. It got clearer and suddenly Lupin was staring at him with a worried expression evident on his face. Harry. What, Professor, how don't worry about that? Have you got the map? I'm not planning on stealing it. Lupin bit his lip. Have you at least fixed it? How? I've been looking for a charm for a week. Lupin looked worriedly at him. You don't have anything. Harry shook his head. You know, I wonder. Lupin's head disappeared but soon returned, a smile on his face. A concealment charm, Harry. It's one of the only spells that won't interfere with the map's own magic. Are you sure? I mean, it can be removed without any trouble? Harry knew he was being loud, but hopefully the marauders were downstairs planning their night. Yes. It will be fine. Just hurry. Harry went to James's trunk and opened it. Accio Marauder's map. It flew into his hand, a slightly faded piece of parchment. I solemnly swear that I am up to no good. Lines began to branch out from Harry's wand tip until a complete layout of Hogwarts and its grounds lay in Harry's hand. Harry, just find our names and place the charm over the words you want. Conceal my entire name, yours, just the last. I'll see you, Harry. I've got to take my potion. Good night, and don't even think about sneaking onto the grounds tonight. Please. The smoke disappeared and Harry went to work. Soon Lupin's name was gone and his professor was a mere dot on the page. Harry concealed his last name and sighed. A knock on the door made him jump. Harry? It was serious. Hey, can I come in? H hold on. Harry whispered urgently, mischief managed, and threw the map back in James's trunk. Alohomora. The lock clicked and Sirius walked inside. You need something? I wanted to apologize for what I said. Sirius looked uncomfortable. Harry assumed it was because Lily or Remus had forced him to come apologize. Sirius rushed on, you aren't a up. This teacher is just, I dunno. He reminds me of Mooney. Remus, I mean. He likes to go in depth. Sirius sank onto Harry's bed, relief evident on his face. It's okay. I'm used to it. Used to what? Rumors, lies, etc. Harry shrugged. I can survive a few more. And, can I ask you something? Sirius nodded, ing his head slightly. Do you honestly think I haven't figured out your nicknames yet? You all hardly call each other by your given names. Sorry. No one else has figured it out, at least that we know of. I wasn't sure you'd caught on, since you're so new and all. Harry nodded and flexed his fingers. They were aching slightly from writing so much. Hey. He said quickly, just remembering, if you and James want to copy my essay, go ahead. I don't mind. Harry sat beside Sirius. Really? You're a saint, just like Remus. Sirius jumped up. Maybe, but I'm no genius. Defense against the dark arts just happens to be my best subject. I help people in that subject as often as I can. Harry placed a hand on Sirius's shoulder. Go on, before Lily finds out. And make sure Remus gets to the hospital wing. He looks really off. Sirius nodded and bounded down the stairs without looking back. Harry woke early two days after the full moon to a low moan. He grabbed his glasses, crawled to the edge of his bed, 
and peeked through the curtains, curious to know who was making noise so early. Remus was sitting on the edge of his bed. His head was in his hands and Harry was shocked to see how pale he still was. But perhaps it was just the lighting. Remus seemed fine otherwise, unless absolute exhaustion was considered an illness. Harry was about to get up when a shadow appeared beside Remus. Harry stilled instantly, unable to recognize the man until he spoke. Mooney, are you all right? It was serious. Harry almost sighed in relief. It was still a shock to wake up in the same dorm but with different people. Remus sighed. Why yeah, I'm fine. It's nothing. Another groan came from James's bed. Man, do you have claws, Mooney? He was nursing a slash on his arm. Harry grinned, knowing now why he had jumped when Sirius had touched his shoulder earlier that evening. Sorry, James. You know I can't help it. Remus stood and swayed on the spot. Sirius and James both rushed to him. Remus instantly pulled away. Oh, let go. I'm all right. I can manage. I'll get my balance without your help. Mooney, you have about as much balance as a werewolf on a broomstick. Sirius barked, chuckling quietly as Remus swayed again, his arms out like a tightrope walker. The full moon must have been a hard one to make the usually graceful werewolf stumble. Yeah. Well you have as much logic as this bedpost. Remus snapped, grabbing onto Harry's bed, making it lurch unpleasantly, almost making Harry topple forward. What? I'll get you for that you mangy wolf. Sirius laughed and leapt toward him. Harry couldn't react fast enough. Remus and Sirius came tumbling through the curtains on his four-poster and landed right on top of him. Harry cried out as he tumbled to the floor along with them and his sheets. The boys struggled for a moment before Sirius and Remus stood. There was a sickening crack as Sirius put his foot down, resting his entire weight on Harry's right wrist. It was followed by a second crack, this time his left ankle, as Remus detangled himself. Harry, not stopping long enough to wonder how they had managed to step on the right spots to cause such damage, wriggled free of them both. They fell to the floor again with strangled yells. Harry's momentum carried him too far. He gasped as his back made contact with his trunk. He heard everything shift inside. Peter squeaked as he fell from his bed, having just been woken up by the noise the three were making. Sirius, Remus. Stop, you're hurting Harry. James yelled. There were a couple shouts and the pounding of feet then everything went quiet. Harry kept his eyes closed as James helped him up. Hey, Harry, how many fingers am I holding up? Harry squinted at him. Two. See, he's fine, prongs. No worries. Sirius playfully punched Harry's arm. Harry ground his teeth together as he felt the bones shift slightly, giving a small pop from the jarring. Come on, we have class today. We don't want to be late. Sirius took off down the stairs, a bewildered James behind him. Who are you and what have you done to my best friend? Remus laughed, all traces of exhaustion erased from his face. Hurry up or Sirius will eat everything. He and Peter started down the stairs as well. Harry's smile faltered when the door slammed. He screwed his eyes shut in pain and collapsed onto James's bed. He reached for his wand gingerly. His wrist throbbed as he grabbed it. I'll kill them next time I see them. Farrella, he murmured, pointing his wand at his ankle and then his wrist. It was then he noticed something odd. The Tempus Inflecto was on top of the bandages and splint. That's weird, Harry muttered. He tapped the Tempus in Flecto, hoping the magic on it would give way, but nothing happened. Deciding now was as good a time as any to try removing it, he started whispering all the spells he could think of to sever it, but nothing worked. Finally deciding he would rather not be able to see it if possible, he tried a concealment charm and to his shock it took on the same tone as his shin, making it indistinguishable from it. He sighed and heaved himself up. First steps the hardest. Serious. Leaves him for everyone else. Remus batted Sirius's groping hands away and reached for the food himself. Oi! Don't hog it all, Mooney! I'll starve! Sirius moaned. Oh, lay off, Padfoot! We all know about the stash under your bed! James laughed. You're the one that's been stealing my candy! How dare you! Haven't I been good to you? Why did you steal it? Sirius grabbed James by the shoulders and shook him because you add so much to it each day that I thought you wouldn't notice. What do you mean by that? Sirius asked indignantly. Are you saying I'm stupid? No, he's saying you're dense. Now shut up, and eat. Remus sighed. 
Oh, Sirius grumbled and lapsed into silence as he started eating, managing to slop his food everywhere. Potter. James turned around, his mouth full of eggs and pancakes. Wah, he mumbled. Lily Evans was standing behind him. I need to talk to you. Really? James swallowed so fast he choked. Sirius thumped him on the back. W what about? Not homework, I hope. No it's about the new kid. Harry. Oh. James looked crestfallen. What about him? He was still in the common room a couple minutes ago. Really? You mean he didn't come down to breakfast? What's wrong with him? Sirius yelled, waving a piece of toast through the air. Not everyone thinks with their stomach, Sirius. Remus looked up at Lily. Why are you asking about Harry? Are you saying it was odd that he's still in the common room? Maybe he had homework to do. No that's what was strange. He just sat there staring at the fire for a while then he got up and he looked really, I don't know. He had this weird look on his face. I just felt like I should have helped him. We didn't do anything to him, if that's what you were thinking. James and Marauders stood up and started down the corridor. Well, I wasn't thinking that. But now I'm thinking you did. Lily ran to catch up with them. You've got it all wrong. Sirius groaned. Then why was he just sitting there like that when you all were down here eating? Lily protested. How should we know? He's only been here two weeks. All I know is he transferred. James looked at his watch. And we've got transfiguration. See you, Evans. Open your books. We are beginning our study of human transfiguration. This is highly complex magic. I don't expect you all to do extremely well. And as this is a dangerous subject, I will later have Professor Century joining us. McGonagall paused as a hand began waving in the air. Yes, Mr. Black? Will we learn anything about Animagi? Like, how to become one? His question was innocent enough, but Harry detected a hint of pride in his voice. The marauders shared his smirk. No, Mr. Black. We will be talking about them and some of their history, yes. But you will not learn how to become one. That is an issue to take up with the ministry. Sirius sighed. Ah well, I tried. James thumped him on the back. Now, human transfiguration is a touchy subject for many wizards. Harry tuned McGonagall out almost immediately. He was too focused on his ankle and wrist to think. Besides, how could she expect him to take notes with a fractured wrist? He twitched his fingers and no sooner had they moved than a fresh wave of pain lanced through his arm. He gasped and cursed his luck. Peter looked curiously over at him. Mr. Times? Harry's eyes snapped to McGonagall. She was glaring at him. Is there a reason you are not taking notes? Harry gave her a small smile. Sorry, I was just thinking. Well, I believe everyone would appreciate it if you stopped your daydreaming and focused on our lesson. Now, pick up your quill and start writing. Thank you. Harry grimaced but picked up his quill and gingerly wrote a few words. It hurt to move it but Harry pressed on, determined to not get on McGonagall's bad side so soon. But, eventually, all he had were disconnected sentences and random words. Remus, who was sitting next to him, pulled out his wand and muttered a spell. Suddenly, the entire page filled up and Harry's quill began to write on its own. Harry noticed that it went through the same motions as Remus's quill, even tapping up and down at prolonged pauses in McGonagall's lesson. Remus smiled slightly as Harry sighed with relief. The words, you were getting behind, appeared on his page. Harry grinned and murmured, just a bit. The bell rang almost an hour later. Harry packed up the notes Remus had so graciously given him and used his left arm to push away from the table. His ankle and wrist were merely throbbing now, but he was mentally preparing himself for the pain as he stood. He let his breath out in a rush as he put pressure on his ankle. He hobbled out of the classroom, and headed down the hall wishing for all he was worth that Lupin wouldn't be in the mood for another duel. Well, class, we have another duel set up for today. You have already seen Harry and me duel. I want you to pass your papers to the front and we will start. The sound of rustling paper got louder as they passed the papers up. Lupin collected them and sat behind his desk. He looked tired and worn and his eyes were dim. I am, as you can probably tell, not at my best today. Therefore, I will ask. Lupin's eyes swept over the marauders, Mr. Potter to step up. Let's see how you fare against Harry in a duel. Use mostly spoken spells please. We will start on nonverbal spellwork later. Begin when you're ready. James approached the front of the room and surveyed Harry warily. Harry didn't really notice. 
he was focusing on keeping his wand clutched firmly in his right hand though he should have declined the duel in the first place and avoided the situation altogether. But if he knew anything about his father, he loved jokes. He would likely try a jinx or hex then. Good, he could block those easily. Harry was proven right when a bat bogey hex came soaring toward him. He threw up a shield. James scowled. Harry's eyes darted around the room, searching for something to help him, something he could do without much movement. He sent a mess of books flying toward James's back. Peter cried out, warning James. James dodged the books and yelled, Stupefy, Protega, Incendio. Harry shot a long jet of fire at James. James's eyes widened, but he retaliated immediately under the onslaught. Defendo, Reducto. James watched as both spells hit the fireball, deflecting it. Harry didn't notice what had happened until he heard Sirius's scream and Remus's horrified shout. Harry allowed himself to be distracted for a quick glance. He looked around and almost doubled over in laughter. Sirius was jumping up and down, his face a mask of horror. Not that Harry could blame him. He would do the same thing if his hair was on fire. Sirius began running around the room, obviously forgetting his wand was bouncing around in his pocket. He was screaming at the top of his lungs. My hair. My beautiful locks. Someone help me. He was practically crying he was so upset. Remus, however, was sitting in his chair, shocked stiff. In his shaking hands he held what was left of his defense textbook. Harry thought it looked like a bomb had been stuffed between the covers. The gaping hole left by the reductor curse showed Remus's devastated face. Stupefy. Protega. The spell leapt unbidden from his mouth. He turned back to the duel at hand. James was obviously fighting the urge to laugh as well. Harry waited for the next spell and when none came he focused on his next attack. A pugno. A small flock of quills flew towards James, scratching his flailing arms. Harry pointed his wand at a chair. It zoomed toward James and hit his legs, causing him to fall onto it. Ropes jumped from Harry's wand and bound James to the chair. Harry noticed James's spell at the last moment. He only had time to cast a vanishing charm on the chair's back legs before the spell hit him. Immediately, his legs began to jerk around in an odd tap dance. Harry yelled in pain as his ankle gave another louder crack than it had that morning. His ankle, now completely broken, gave out and he fell forward. He threw his arms in front of him to help break his fall but thought better of it. He drew his arms to his chest and winced as his head crashed to the floor. He knew instantly that his glasses had been broken and the metallic taste of blood filled his mouth. He coughed, trying to rid himself of the vile taste. His eyes were screwed up in pain. He didn't dare open them. Slowly, after what seemed like ages to him, he used his left arm to lift himself up far enough so he could point his wand at his legs. They stopped trying to tap dance and he gasped as his ankle hit the floor. He could hear laughter, a cruel mocking sound, and he snarled. They thought it was funny. Wait until it was their turn. Harry heaved himself from the floor and onto his good leg. He grabbed Lupin's desk to keep from falling and leaned against it. James. It was obviously serious. Harry opened his eyes and squinted as three black blobs attached themselves to the chair on the floor. Harry coughed as blood continued to seep into his mouth from his nose and cut lip. The blood dribbled down his chin. He raised his right arm, ignoring the pain, and wiped his mouth with it, determined to not let anyone know how badly he was injured. Gingerly, he put pressure on his ankle. He bit back a scream and clutched the desk for support as his knees buckled. He coughed again and swayed on the spot. Harry's back slammed into the wall and he slid down it, his broken ankle twisted at an odd angle in front of him. He heard a crunching sound and knew his shattered glasses were beneath his right foot. Cradling his fractured wrist in his lap, he wiped furiously at the blood dripping down his chin. He sat painfully still, patiently waiting for Lupin to dismiss them or at least announce a winner. Who won? He heard James ask. There was a whispered comment. I did. I won. You're kidding. There were soft footsteps and someone above Harry chuckled. Yes, but only just. If this was a real duel, Harry would have won by a long shot. How can you say that? James is standing. Harry isn't. It was serious now, sounding very offended that Professor Century couldn't seem to tell the two apart. That may be true, but, if you and the others had not freed James, who do you think would be standing? Certainly not James. He paused. It seems Harry obtained some extensive damage. Harry, can you hear me? Lupin was kneeling in front of him. 
He handed Harry his repaired glasses and watched as Harry used one hand to put them on, his broken nose not making it any easier. Harry sighed and slowly got up, using the wall as his support until he could push away. He wobbled slightly. Lupin grabbed his right arm to help balance him. Harry yelped and tore his arm from the professor's grip. Lupin stared at him, his face clouded with a thoughtful expression. Sorry, Harry mumbled, leaning against the wall again. Harry, let me see your arm. Harry held out his left arm. Lupin shook his head. The other one, Harry. A few people laughed. You think this is a laughing matter? Lupin snapped, suddenly strict. Everyone stared at him in shock. They had yet to hear him snap. Lupin carefully took Harry's sleeve and pushed it back. His eyes rested on the splint. He tapped it with his wand and it disappeared, as did the concealment charm. Harry saw Lupin falter a moment, realizing Harry had successfully charmed the mysterious object, but quickly snapped to attention as Harry's hand, with nothing to support it, lolled downwards. Harry tried to move it, but bit his lip and gave up as pain coursed up his arm. You have been dueling with a fractured, perhaps broken, wrist, Harry. Lupin asked in a voice so low and dangerous, Harry knew even Fred and George Weasley wouldn't dare cross him. M maybe, Harry murmured. And what about your ankle? It's completely broken after that, Talantalegra, Jinx I suppose. Lupin's voice rose sharply in volume. He was near snapping and Harry suddenly felt guilty for putting the werewolf through it. He was tired enough, even if it was two days after the full moon. You should have known better. Why did you even leave the common room? You. It is not like me to dote upon myself, especially in my condition. Harry murmured quietly to him. The pain is a part of who I am, a part of my every living moment. You cannot change that, and neither can I. Harry saw a flicker of sorrow and pain in Lupin's eyes but it quickly passed. Lupin fixed a new splint for Harry and released his arm, seeming shocked by Harry's response. Wait a moment. You mean, Harry, I won because you were already hurt? James's face appeared over Lupin's shoulder. Harry didn't answer. He bent down and fixed the splint on his ankle, making it ache painfully as it snapped into a new position. That happened this morning in our dorm, didn't it? When Sirius and Remus fell on you, Lupin's eye twitched involuntarily as he realized whose fault it was that Harry's ankle was fractured in the first place. Why didn't you tell us? I told them they had hurt you. Harry looked up at James. I didn't want anyone to worry. Besides, I've had worse. On purpose? Someone shouted from the back row. Everyone laughed. Harry swiped at the blood again and started painfully limping toward his seat. Where are you going? Lupin asked, a slight tinge of anger in his voice. To my seat, if you don't mind. Actually I think he does mind. James walked over to Harry and threw Harry's left arm over his shoulders. You're going to the hospital wing. Harry sputtered indignantly. But I think Mr. Potter is right, Mr. Times. Go with him and make sure you get fixed up soon. Thank you, James. Harry looked around at Lupin. His eyes were filled with mirth and he was barely concealing a smile. It took Harry a moment to realize what was so funny. Then he smiled. His father, oblivious as he was to the joke, was forcing his son, whom he thought was merely a new friend, to the hospital wing. The other marauders were shooting him sympathetic looks. Harry thought to keep himself from laughing when he noticed Sirius's hair. It was more or less gone, including his eyebrows. Harry chuckled despite the pain in his limbs, thinking of the time his aunt had cut his hair and found it perfectly normal the next day. Sirius would be back to normal, but he wasn't too sure about himself. I can't believe it. He dueled James with a fractured wrist and ankle, and then he said he's had worse. Sirius was leading the way to Hagrid's hut, his hair back to normal after James and Remus had experimented on it for an hour. You weren't the one who dueled him. Think about it. If he could think and move that fast while in pain, what do you think he could have done if he was fine? James asked, sticking his hands in his pockets, still a bit put out that he had only one because of Harry's injuries. Still, that was a bit stupid, Remus muttered. I think he was awesome, Peter protested. Do you think anyone with more talent than a tick is awesome, Wormtail? Sirius jibed, Peter fell silent. You have to wonder though, how did he ever have worse? I mean, people don't just start randomly jinxing each other, do they? Remus glanced up from his book as he walked. I don't know. Hey! James stopped walking. Hagrid's is this way, James, Peter said, pointing down the hill. I know. 
It's just, someone's in our spot. He pointed to the beech tree by the lake. Wonder who it is. Let's go see. Sirius grabbed James and started dragging him toward the tree. Yes, let's go scare the living daylights out of someone else. It's not enough we almost killed a classmate today. Remus shut his book with a snap, following a few feet behind. Lighten up, Mooney. He'll be fine. James gave him a smile. You're still here aren't you? Remus muttered a reply. No thanks to you three. There wouldn't be enough of me to put in a matchbox if not for Madame Pomfrey. Sirius laughed and called out to the student. Oi, you there. What are you doing out here all by your lonesome? James raised an eyebrow at Sirius's choice in words. Remus shrugged and was about to comment on it when the student's answer caught his attention. Trying to get some peace and quiet, from you lot, I might add. The marauders gawked at him. Harry? Remus asked, staring at the raven-haired teen. No it's the Easter Bunny. Yes, me. Harry stood up. He quickly stuffed his notebook back into his bag, hoping they hadn't noticed it. Is it really you? I mean, James trailed off. He was just staring at Harry in amazement. Harry raised an eyebrow. Last I checked. Why? You got away. Remus asked, dumbfounded. Pomfrey let you go. No Harry lifted his bag further onto his shoulder. Then how? Sirius gasped. Did you sneak out? Harry nodded. Even we have a hard time with that. You actually pulled it off by yourself. Are you serious? No I believe you are. Harry smirked, knowing just how much the joke irked his future godfather. The marauders snickered as Sirius grumbled. But really, James cut in, you escaped Pomfrey, the terror of troublemakers? Yeah, so? I've done it loads of times. Harry saw Remus's puzzled look and added, at my old school. So, you're used to being in the hospital wing? Peter asked. Harry nodded, ignoring his loathing of Peter long enough to turn away. A new voice caught his attention. Excuse me. I have a message for a Mr. Times. Harry turned to the speaker. His heart gave a painful pang of recognition. A young woman with sandy blonde hair and a round face stood in front of him, a large smile on her face. It was Alice Compton, later known as Mrs. Frank Longbottom. She handed the note to Harry and waited patiently for him to read it. Harry was holding a small scroll sealed with the Hogwarts crest. His name was scrawled in green ink across it. He recognized the loopy handwriting at once. He felt his breath hitch in his throat. He never expected to see one of these letters again after his sixth year. Harry broke the seal carefully. He read through the note quickly and pursed his lips. Thank you, Alice. He turned and started toward the castle, dreading having to face Dumbledore. D did any of you tell him my name? Alice asked, looking around at the marauders. No, Remus answered. Then how did I don't know? Harry sat in Dumbledore's office, waiting for the headmaster to speak. It was painful waiting for the moment the man would address him. He was about to give up and leave when, finally, the man's mouth opened and Harry found himself raptly at attention upon hearing his voice again. Harry, I have noticed that you have already attracted quite a bit of attention to yourself. Harry nodded slightly, moving his eyes to the sleeping portrait of Phineas Nigelus. Would you mind telling me why you brought so much attention to yourself? Having no clear answer to this himself, Harry chose not to answer. He didn't trust his voice at the moment. Dumbledore went on when Harry didn't even look up. You do not strike me as one who seeks attention, more one to whom. Attention is attracted. Harry smirked. Irony as well, if you understand, sir. It would seem so. You have already made yourself known to the teachers, many students, and to Madame Pomfrey. She tells me you have seen her twice already, a headache and some more extensive injuries, I believe. I probably should warn her that I have a habit of getting into trouble. He smiled slightly as he remembered all the visits he had to the hospital wing. Actually, it's the other way around. You do not go looking for trouble, much like your father? Harry tensed. He was uncomfortable enough around Dumbledore. This was one subject of many that could only make it worse. No. I have a feeling you do so more than you let on. Harry shrugged and stood to leave, finding the conversation a bore and not at all what he had expected. Mr. Times, I know I ask you to keep the secrets of the future to yourself, but it seems that there are some things I might need to know, for your benefit. I can take care of myself. I always have. Harry paused and muttered, you made sure of that. What about your childhood? Surely you were protected then. What childhood? Harry snapped. 
I don't know what the word means. Dumbledore placed his fingertips together and stared at Harry. I see I was correct in my theories about you. I knew from the moment you fell into the lake you were special, not only because of that incident. There were other small hints you gave me as you were sleeping. Harry frowned. It doesn't seem to matter where I go. I always strike people funny. I will leave the story for another day, as it seems to bother you. What I called you here for is a matter of safety, if you will. From the little I know of you, I suppose you are familiar with Hogwarts, the Hogwarts of your time. Harry sat back down, a tiny bit curious now. That should make this all the easier. First and foremost, I know how important Hogsmeade visits are. However, there is the small problem of your materializing out of thin air. This may cause you some difficulties, even here. For instance, you have no way of proving that your guardian gave you permission to go to Hogsmeade. Harry pursed his lips, memories of his godfather surfacing, he did. Dumbledore's eyes seemed to reflect his frown. Only your father? Not your mother? Harry looked away. Legilimency was easiest with eye contact. Harry willed himself to believe Dumbledore would never go that far. Nevertheless, he threw up his feeble barriers. I will make you a deal, Mr. Times. I will extend the privilege of Hogsmeade visits to you. However, if anything happens that should jeopardize your safety, I will decide if you may continue the visits, which means some questions may need answering. The reason I am taking such precaution is because I feel you are very important to the future. Do we have a deal? Harry thought for a moment. It seemed he would be getting the raw end of the deal, but then he remembered the tunnel into Honeydukes. Yes, sir, but please understand I have to be careful with what I tell you. Anything else? Yes, I understand perfectly, but I was wondering just how well you are adapting. Are you getting along with everyone well? Surely you are having at least a bit of trouble fitting in, should I say? A bit of trouble. And have you found it easier with Professor Century around? Harry's head shot up. Do not worry. I know that Professor Century is from your time as well. I guessed as much when I noticed the strange bands around his wrists. Although I know he is familiar, I cannot seem to recall who he is. I will just wait until he decides to reveal his name. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Harry moved toward the door again. You have many secrets, Harry, many scars hidden from the world. If ever you need someone besides Junior Century to talk with, I am here. Harry felt his throat tighten. Thank you, Professor. I'll, I'll remember that. Harry closed the door behind him with a soft click. He forced himself to walk slowly and calmly to the bottom of the spiral staircase. After he passed the gargoyle, he broke into a flat run. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Harry, welcome to Hogsmeade. James spread his arms, gesturing toward the shops and people. Harry looked around happily, his mood lifting at the sight of the village and its colorful scenery. The marauders began leading him through the familiar streets, practically dragging him from the displays at times. Harry's eyes lit up at the sight of each store, something that did not go unnoticed by the marauders. They visited Honeydukes and Zonkos, milling about inside each store for quite some time, and finally dropped into the three broomsticks. Harry noted thankfully that nothing in the small inn had changed, unlike the shops outside. He gulped down his butterbeer, thankful for the warmth it gave him even though it was only October. He sighed and settled down in his chair to listen to the conversation going on around him. Divination is awful. Peter groaned. You're still taking that? Sirius asked incredulously, moving his mug a couple inches away from his mouth and laughing. It's a load of dung. You don't need a crystal ball to see that. I thought you said the new teacher was weird, Remus said, a carefree expression on his face as he spun his bottle experimentally. Peter snorted. Weird as putting it lightly. She's a student teacher. Boards at the Hog's Head Inn too. Dodgy place. Harry choked on his butterbeer at this. W who is this now? Her name's Sibyl Trelawney. She wears about twenty shawls and has these huge bug-eyed glasses. Peter held up two empty mugs to his eyes, magnifying them to almost ten times their size. She's creepy. He sat the mugs down amid sniggers. I mean it. She even has this weird mystic sounding voice. How do you know it sounds mystic? For all I know she could sound like your mum. James laughed. Sirius and James shared a look and Sirius collapsed onto his friend's shoulder, howling with laughter at some inside joke. Peter blushed to the roots of his hair. Remus shook his head, 
rolling his eyes slightly and looked over at the bar as he usually did when his friends started to get a tad out of hand. There were the usual students, flirting shamelessly with Madame Rosemerda, the drunks, the townspeople, and Professor Century. Remus did a double take. Teachers were never seen by students in Hogsmeade. They usually used the free time to plan their lessons or relax, but it seemed Century wasn't a normal professor. But then, that was obvious by his gentle, carefree, patient manner. Remus couldn't remember the last time he'd had such a kind professor. The man had his own agenda, and even showed it by changing his lesson plans with a little coaxing from Harry. That was another thing that was different about Century. He loved to be with the students, especially Harry, who seemed to love the attention he received as well. Hey, guys, isn't that Professor Century? The others turned to look, with the exception of Harry. It wasn't surprising that Lupin was here. If this was hard on him, just being around the marauders, he couldn't imagine how torn up Lupin was, no matter how well the man hid it. Yeah, so? James asked, turning back around to face the others. Teachers aren't confined to the school, you know. It's not only that. Look at him. He's so, old. Sirius finished, winking at a couple passing sixth-year girls who giggled and blushed. Remus shot him a withering glance. No, Padfoot. Seriously look at him. It's like he's ill or something. Harry, now curious, turned with the others to watch Lupin. He was slightly shocked to see how ill Lupin did look. His normally disheveled hair was sticking up in so many directions that he could have been distantly related to James. It looked like he hadn't combed it for days. His face was extremely pale and drawn, and he looked extremely tired, as though he hadn't slept for a week. He would wince every time there was a loud noise and tried to keep his eyes away from the mirror across from him. Madame Rosemerda came over to him and, at his nod, put two drops from a small vial into his butterbeer. The professor sighed and gulped it down. A small amount of steam issued from his ears and he smiled, looking relieved. Harry guessed it was pepper up potion she kept in her stores. But why had Lupin wanted it? Wonder what she put in his drink, James muttered. Love potion. Sirius suggested, sipping his butterbeer. The others gave him a disbelieving look. He frowned. What? It's possible. Don't tell me I'm the only one who's noticed she's not married. Sirius, you're impossible. James sighed. I do agree with you though, Mooney. He looks really ill. James tipped his chair back onto two legs, hands clasped loosely behind his head. Sirius rolled his eyes and leaned forward so his elbows rested on the table. I still say he looks old. Not that old, James protested. He has gray hair. Sirius responded, eyes wide, obviously not understanding why they weren't agreeing with him. I have gray hair, and I'm only seventeen. Remus interrupted indignantly as Sirius reached lazily for his drink. So what if he has gray hair? James asked Sirius, acting as though he hadn't heard Remus. So, he's old. Sirius waved his mug in the air, raining small drops of butterbeer over the table. Are you trying to imply something? Remus growled, his eyes narrowed. Pads, you need to lay off the fire whiskey. They say the mind's first to go, then the ears, then the eyes, don't remember what's next. James's voice trailed away as he watched Sirius puff up in mock indignation. I'll have you know my mind, ears, and eyes work perfectly. But are they functioning to the highest degree? Remus asked slyly, smirking. Ye. Now how should I know that? Sirius snapped, glaring at the werewolf. You hesitated, Remus chuckled, looking smug, and you ignored me for a good two minutes. I chose to ignore you, Mooney. How did we get on the subject of Padfoot's mental health? James asked in a bored tone, staring at the ceiling. I thought we were discussing Professor Century and how Sirius thinks his gray hair signifies how old he is. Which it does not. Remus interjected. Peter snickered. Sirius ignored Remus again, earning a glare from the young werewolf. We were. Then you had to go and change the subject, prongs. Sirius grunted. And I've never had fire whiskey in my life. It's not a wise thing to do that, lie, I mean. James, so startled, fell over backwards as a new voice joined the friendly debate. P. Professor Century, Sirius stuttered. A hand came down on Harry's shoulder, lightly applying pressure. He looked up into the newcomer's face and was greeted by Lupin's widest grin. I couldn't help overhearing. The boys exchanged startled glances. S. Sorry, James stuttered, hastily getting up. It's quite all right. 
I don't mind, especially when the conversation turns out to be so entertaining. He paused, watching the boys as they laughed and smiled. I didn't know we were being so loud, Remus said, a smile still on his face. Oh, you weren't that loud. I just have a bit of a sixth sense. I can tell when someone's talking about me. So, because I have gray hair I'm old? Sirius gulped, nervous again. He didn't know enough about Century to tease him yet. This was awkward for him. I, I didn't mean it. Well, okay, I did. I just had to prove my point to Jamzy here. Ah, well, I understand. But, for your information, Mr. Black, I am only 37. Stress can turn a person's hair gray very easily. And, I'll have you know, many of my gray hairs have come from this ruffian here. He ruffled Harry's hair, making it even more unruly than before. Harry looked up at Lupin indignantly. I try to get it flat, you know, and you're not helping. It looks better that way. James mused. Now your hair is just as messy as mine. Harry felt heat creep slowly onto his face at this. Why, he had no idea, but Remus looked at him oddly. Do you not like looking like James? He asked. Lupin's hand tightened on Harry's shoulder. He knew the older man wished he had learned to keep his mouth shut and listen when he was young. I it's not that. Harry said, ignoring the sudden ache in his stomach, gripping his mug tightly in his hand. I just, sometimes I wish I wasn't, that I'm not, who I am. The marauders gaped at him, throwing each other bewildered looks. That was about as clear as mud, James whispered. You want to enlighten us, Harry? Sirius asked. Yeah, I've never heard of anyone who wished they weren't, themselves. Peter hid behind Remus when Harry shot him a dirty look. It's nothing. Forget I said anything. Harry knew he was shaking, and not only from nerves. How dare Pettigrew ask that? How dare they all pry into his life like this? Couldn't they just leave it alone? Lupin's grip on Harry's shoulder was so great that Harry bit his lip. He could feel his mask slowly building up as his temper rose as well. Come on. I want to know. Remus whined, something Harry had never heard him do before. Yes. You sound like Siri here. He's always complaining about his family. James Mock groaned. Sirius rolled his eyes. What are you angry about? Did your dad leave you? Put up for adoption? Peter squeaked. Abandoned by the road? Remus suggested. Beaten and humiliated? Sirius asked, his face one of glee. Neglected? James laughed. Forced into something? Remus glared at Sirius and James. Seen someone die? Peter asked. Lost everything to a power hungry warlord? Sirius gasped in excitement, almost bouncing out of his seat. Stop it! Harry yelled. His mug exploded sending butterbeer and glass everywhere. The marauders yelped and covered their faces. A few small shards of glass wedged themselves into Harry's palm but he ignored them. Lupin drew his hand away with a yelp as Harry's magic flared. Harry simply stared at the table for a moment, breathing heavily. The bar had gone quiet. Harry. James asked. We were just having fun. Harry took a calming breath and sighed. I know. Then why do you react like that? Sirius asked glancing at James. You didn't have to blow up like that. Peter said grinning. Harry remained quiet, determinedly looking away from Peter. He simply stared at the butterbeer slowly dripping to the floor from the table. You did overreact, Harry, Remus murmured. We were just spouting whatever came to our minds. It's not like we meant it or anything. I've never even heard of half those things happening to anyone our age. He cleaned the table with a wave of his wand. Harry stood up quickly, leaving his shattered mug on the table. He was careful to keep his hand from sight, knowing Lupin would become upset at the sight of his bloodied hand. Harry bit his lip to remind him to hold his tongue, but he still bit out a parting thought. Don't talk about something when you know nothing about it. Harry strode purposefully from the room, trying to keep his anger and hurt under control. As he passed, the lights and mugs on either side of him exploded making people scream while showering each table with sparks, multiple drinks, and glass. He tossed a few galleons to Madame Rosemerta, nodded to her, and walked out into the crisp autumn air. Well, that was weird, James murmured. Yeah. Remus turned to look at Professor Century, who was gingerly moving his right arm so that it was out of view, but Remus caught sight of it. Professor. Lupin hid his hand quickly. Yes, Remus? What happened to your hand? Did Harry? Harry can be very, emotional, but he hides them very well normally. 
I think the new environment is messing with him a bit too much. Lupin drew his cloak tightly around him. Good day. He turned and rushed out the door. Sirius let out a whistle after he had walked away. Did you see his hand? Yeah, James breathed. It looked like he'd stuck it into a grate, while the fire was going. Peter cringed. It was all red and bloody. But how? Remus asked. He wouldn't answer me if it was Harry that did it or not. What about it, Mooney? Sirius asked, finishing off his butterbeer. Why would it matter? You're not making sense. If it was Harry, how did he do it? That had to be strong magic. Think about it. That was serious, nothing like the spells he uses in duels. But Century acted as though it happens every day. Wonder why he got so upset. Sirius grumbled, any normal person would have laughed with us. Are you saying you think he's laughing at us? James stood and the others followed. Sirius opened his mouth to respond, but Remus beat him to it. No, prongs. I don't think he's laughing at all. Harry. Hey, Harry. James waved his hand in front of Harry's face. Harry jerked out of his silent study of his injured hand. Surprisingly, it had been easy to heal, but it still hurt to write. What? Sorry. Did you want something, James? I want to know if that transfiguration essay got on your bad side. You're staring at it so hard that it's going to combust any second. Sirius laughed, bounding up behind James and throwing his arm around his neck. I don't know what James wants though. Ask him yourself. Shove off, Padfoot, James hissed. He glanced around quickly and then looked back at Harry. I need a really big favor. Harry quirked an eyebrow. And that would be. James looked hesitant to tell him. I have Quidditch practice tonight and. You're trying to find someone fool enough to do your defense homework for you, Harry finished. Well, yeah. James looked relieved that Harry hadn't started yelling. Harry sighed. I can't do that, James. James's mouth fell open. WWY? Tell me how I'm supposed to read an entire chapter for you and then transfer the information from my mind to yours. Harry raised both eyebrows and spread his hands. I am not telepathic, no matter how much I would like to be. You won't learn anything if you depend on others and defense is one subject I will not let others weasel out of. James was dumbfounded. You mean there is no way, James. I refuse to read it and then hand you a one-page summary. And I seriously doubt you can talk Remus into it. I believe Sirius is a beater on the Quidditch team so he's out of the question. And you wouldn't dare ask Peter for fear of your grade, correct? Remus bit his lip to keep from laughing but a few chuckles slipped past his pursed lips. Sirius, however, burst out laughing. He got you, prongs. He got you good. James growled and huffed loudly. Come on, Padfoot. Time for practice, James muttered. Sirius whooped and followed his friend from the room. Harry sighed and rubbed his temples, trying to fight down the migraine he could feel coming. That was nicely done. Harry looked up. Lily Evans was standing above him, a smile on her face. Either you're extremely brave or extremely foolish. Both actually, Harry groaned. Lily laughed as she sat down. I'm glad you aren't as obsessed with Quidditch as they are. Harry tried to maintain a blank face at this but his hurt obviously showed on his face. She gasped. You are, aren't you? I'm sorry. It's okay. I take it you don't like Quidditch much, Harry said, using what little information he knew about his mother to keep the conversation going. Remus snorted from behind his book, catching Harry's attention. Um, hate it, maybe? Lily sighed. I used to like it. It just got so old listening to everyone talk about it night and day. Besides, it's not my type of sport. I wouldn't like thinking about falling to my death all the time. And Potter goes around talking about it so much, that I can't even stand to think about it. So you and James don't get along? Harry asked tentatively. Lily laughed. Potter? No he gets on my nerves, but he has gotten better. I'll give him that. I'm surprised you can stand him honestly. I mean, don't take this badly. You're different from anyone I've ever met. You have a bit of Potter, Black. Pettigrew, and Remus in you. Harry smiled at her use of Lupin's first name. She definitely wasn't on good terms with the other marauders yet. If I didn't know better, I'd say you were raised by Potter and his crew of miscreants. Harry gave her a surprised look though inside he was jumping up and down in delight. Really? How so? Well, you act like each of them at times. You're quiet and modest like Remus, yet loud and boisterous like Black. 
and still you're shy and reserved like Pettigrew and outgoing and arrogant like Potter. And you seem to love a great joke. But you're also so different from them at the same time. Remus had started writing, distracting Harry a bit. So you're saying I'm just a bundle of paradoxes? Harry asked, and muttered under his breath, among other things. He could feel heat creeping up his neck from the slight blush he knew was starting to show. Well, I guess you could say that. Are your parents like that? I mean, are they complete opposites? Harry laughed. Let me put it this way, my father annoyed my mother so much, I'm surprised I'm here. Lily giggled. Where are you from? I, Harry thought quickly, running over the many stories he had thought up while lying awake in bed at night. I'm really from England, but my parents have taken to traveling. We've been on the road about two years. Really? Where have you been? Lily's eyes lit up in excitement. She reminded Harry so much of Hermione that he had to stop himself from laughing. Uh, well, I've been to Bulgaria, France, Scotland, Ireland, Romania, Lithuania, Italy, Germany, Spain, America, China, just about anywhere you can imagine. Harry breathed a sigh of relief, happy he hadn't forgotten everything he'd learned in history of magic and geography. He'd never imagined when they said he'd need it later that this was when he'd recall it. Wow. Lily sighed, her eyes glazed. I'd love to go to all those places. Where'd you like it best? Harry grinned, glad he could at least answer one question without lying to his young mother. At home, in England. What about school? Where'd you go to school while you were traveling? Oh. Harry blinked in surprise. I was, homeschooled. My mum taught me. Harry thought he heard Remus's quill abruptly cease its rhythmic scratching but didn't think anything of it. What was it like being taught by your mother? Was it odd? Lily frowned in thought, genuinely interested. Was she strict or did you hardly do any work at all? Harry smiled wistfully, thinking over just what it would have been like to have Lily teach him. He frowned, stood up, and turned away, knowing his face showed his obvious dislike of the subject. It was about like here. Now, if you'll excuse me. He almost ran to the dormitory steps and started up them, taking them two at a time and slumped onto his bed. He lay there, staring at the ceiling, for what seemed like hours. The more he thought about his parents, the more painful memories surfaced, reminding him of his situation. He turned over and looked out the window. It was already dark, and, from what Harry could tell by the light of the slowly waxing moon, the pitch was completely empty. Not caring to dwell on the fact that he'd been thinking for so long, Harry jumped up and dug through his trunk. He pulled out his firebolt and raced to the window. He paused as his rationality caught up to him and bit his lip. Perhaps he shouldn't. What if someone saw him? It could blow everything. Lupin would never be so rash if he was in this situation. Harry shook his head to clear these thoughts, and in an instant, the window was open and he was on his broom, soaring toward the pitch. Harry felt as if he'd left all his worries back in his dorm. He gave a loud whoop and started doing his most intricate tricks, not even giving his mind time to wrap around the absurdity of the first stunt before he spiraled into the next one. He twisted through the air like the very wind he was riding. He flew straight through the goal hoops and shot upward. When he was so high that he could hardly make out the goalposts, Harry turned a backward somersault and shot like a lance back toward the ground. He was so wrapped up in the exhilaration of the dive that he didn't notice the two figures coming out of the changing rooms. That was a wonderful practice. What do you think, Prongs? Sirius asked, throwing an arm around his friend's shoulders. Let me see. James threw his broom over his other shoulder and held up his hands to tick things off on his fingers. Corey couldn't fly in a straight line. Andrew somehow figured out how to fly into the goalpost. One of my beaters almost killed me. Sirius gave him a sheepish smile and scratched his head with the end of his broom handle. No one would listen to me there was so much going on. Linda and Alex are at least making it to the goalposts, but they can't get the quaffle in. They miss it by feet. Feet, padfoot. Peter's better than they are. Jordan keeps dropping his bat. And he's claiming he has a weak grip. If you have a weak grip you shouldn't be a beater. You shouldn't even be playing Quidditch. Oh, oh. And let's not forget, I was so wrapped up in everything else that I lost the snitch. Can it get any worse? Define worse. Sirius answered quietly, looking up. James groaned. Speak English, Sirius. I have a killer migraine, partly thanks to that bludger to the head, and the spectacular fall eye. Shut up. 
Sirius turned James toward the pitch. Look. What did you just say to me? Never mind that. Look at him. He's going to crash. Sirius pointed at the smoky outline of a person who was laying flat against the broom handle. He was heading toward the ground at lightning speed. James's eyes widened. The player extended his arm, reaching for something glittering near the ground. He was so close. If he didn't pull out, pull only inches from the ground, he leveled out, stopping dead, only the grass billowing beneath him showing how close the dive had been. Sirius whistled. He could stomp you in a match, prongs. Wonder who he is. I don't know. The person on the broom looked around. His eyes glowed a brilliant green in the moonlight. He suddenly shot upward and flew into the maze of Hogwarts roofs and out of sight, but I intend to find out. You can't be serious, Remus groaned, walking into the Great Hall. No, he's shut up, prongs. I hate that joke. You know I do. Sirius snapped, sitting down at the breakfast table. Padfoot, just stuff it. I want to hear the story again. So, you two say this guy just dove straight down and didn't crash or anything? Remus asked calmly, reaching for the sausage. Right. And when he saw us, he took off. James slumped down beside Harry, past the eggs. What are you all on about? Harry asked as he gave James the eggs. These two buffoons want me to believe that they saw someone on the Quidditch pitch last night that could beat even James on a broom, Remus sighed, waving his sausage dramatically in the air. Harry choked on his juice. Ah really? He sputtered. James nodded. That's what Sirius thinks. He rolled his eyes. But the thing that is bothering me is that he was in the shadow of the stands, so we couldn't see him. Oh. Harry glanced at the staff table and found Lupin giving him a glare. Harry chuckled nervously. Uh, right. I'll talk to you all about it later. I've got to go do some, homework. See you. Harry raced out of the hall, only slowing down when he was a few corridors away. He was walking past an empty classroom and when someone pulled him inside. How many times have you been told you can't mess with time? Lupin snapped. Three, Harry answered, slightly startled by Lupin's ferocity when he was usually so understanding about such things. And each time I have been told that we really aren't sure I can mess up the timeline anyway. Besides, all I did was take a little flight around the pitch. And you were seen. Harry, they're going to get suspicious of you. They always find out people's secrets. That's who they, we are. We're some of the nosiest people I've ever known. Then it won't matter how careful I am. The marauders will find out anyway. Lupin watched him thoughtfully for a minute, his face relaxing slightly the calm and patient man showing through now that he was thinking rationally. You're right, but that is no reason to be careless. We still don't know why we're here. We have to be alert. I don't know. I think he's Slytherin honestly. Sirius stretched and yawned, looking around at the others to see their reaction. No way. That guy was definitely a Ravenclaw. James argued, shaking his head as he looked at Sirius who was walking beside him. What makes you say that? Peter squeaked almost jogging to keep up with the three much more graceful boys. He took off when we saw him. That was the smartest thing anyone could have done. Could you see a Slytherin doing that? I don't think Remus stopped, throwing his arm out to catch the others in the chest, stopping them in their tracks. He shushed them as they protested and leaned toward a door a few feet to his right. You're right, but that is no reason to be careless. We still don't know why we're here. We have to be alert. A voice was coming from the classroom. The marauders crowded around the door so they could hear better. So you're saying I already have to be miserable and now I have to keep my feet firmly planted on the ground? That doesn't seem fair. The second voice paused, as if contemplating his reasoning, and laughed bitterly. Since when is my life fair? The other person sighed. Just be careful. I know that is very hard for you to do, but I desperately need you to listen to me this time. Just lay low, please? Come on. They didn't even see my face. They don't know that it was me on the pitch, and what would they do if they found out anyway? The marauders looked around at each other, smirking. I don't care. I know how their minds work and soon you will too, but until then stay under their radar. Fine. May I go now that I have been thoroughly interrogated? The second voice held a slight edge now. The doorknob turned and the marauders scrambled quickly for cover behind a pillar. Sirius on James's shoulders with Remus crouching near the ground and Peter as a large rat perched near his feet. The door swung open and they peered around the pillar in interest. Their eyes widened when Harry backed out of the classroom. 
he glanced around and ran down the corridor without a backward glance. The marauders watched as Century came out as well and mimicked Harry. As the professor began walking toward them down the hall, Sirius slipped from his spot on James's shoulders and fell to the ground with a muffled thump. His foot stuck around the pillar, right in the professor's way. He couldn't move fast enough. The marauders braced themselves for the impending collision, but it never came. Professor Century, still gazing straight ahead, stepped nimbly over Sirius's foot, and walked on. The marauders had just breathed a sigh of relief when a calm voice floated back to them. I believe you boys might need a better pastime. Your current one might get you in trouble someday. So get back to your dorm and never let me see that pet rat of yours again. The marauders wheeled around. Professor Century still had his back to them, but he was the only one in the hall. The boys gulped visibly and sprinted all the way back up to Gryffindor Tower. Sirius collapsed in a heap on his bed, laughing heartily. The new teacher let us off. I don't see what's so funny about it, Remus mumbled, letting his breathing become even again. We could have been in serious trouble. Yes, we couldn't have marred your perfect record now could we? James asked, ambling slowly around the room. Remus snorted, watching him. What perfect record? With you all around, I must have the worst record in the school. No, no you've got it all wrong. James sat down on the window seat, grinning widely at his friend. You don't have the worst record in the school. No. You have the worst record in the world. Sirius laughed, sitting up. I don't find that funny. Remus sat beside James on the window seat, pulling one leg to his chest. Yeah, well, you wouldn't. Sirius rolled his eyes and attempted to sit between his two friends, but found he couldn't. Instead, he transformed into Padfoot and jumped up onto their laps, forcing Remus to put his leg down. Padfoot lay down across their laps, head on James's knees. Get your furry, flea bitten behind out of my lap. Remus pushed Padfoot, but he had planted himself firmly. Padfoot merely grinned toothily back at him, a strangely smug expression on his face. Peter grimaced. Century called me a pet rat. That was so. True? James asked innocently, laying his hand on Padfoot's head. Peter glared at him and crossed his arms. No, judgmental. You were a rat. What did you expect him to do? Fetch Mrs. Norris. Remus smirked at the panicked look on Peter's face. Ha, ha, very funny. But anyway, I don't understand why Professor Century was so upset with Harry. Peter yawned, laying down on his bed. I don't think he was mad. I think he was off his rocker. James finished for Remus. He was scratching Padfoot behind his ears, making the bear like dog's tail beat against Remus's chest. No, Remus snapped vainly trying to catch Padfoot's tail as it beat slowly higher, toward his face. Maybe they're hiding something, James suggested still patting Padfoot's head as the dog's eyes slid shut in content. He could be a secret agent or something, he could have a code name and everything, Peter squeaked excitedly, sitting up again. James's eyes widened and he jumped up. Padfoot fell from his lap and landed face first on the floor. He quickly transformed. Get your feet out of my face before you break my nose, Remus yelled, his patience finally snapping as he dodged Sirius's feet, pushing him away. Your nose? What about my nose? Sirius sat on the floor, nursing his bleeding nose. Wah, was dat foe, prong. Peter gave me an idea. James started throwing things haphazardly from his trunk as the others watched in confusion. I don't underst. Ah. Remus ducked a boot that almost hit him. It bounced harmlessly off the window and thumped to the floor. Watch where you're throwing that stuff. You're going to kill one of us. Better you than me, eh? James joked, still rummaging. Aha! Here it is. James stood up. He had a simple piece of folded parchment in his hand. Da Mirabur's Mab! Sirius exclaimed, his nose making it hard to talk. Since when was it the Mirabur's Mab, Pads? Remus asked. Sirius glared at him. Remus sighed and tapped Sirius's nose with his wand and said, Episky. Thanks. But what's that got to do with Harry? Sirius got up, rubbing his nose, as Remus used his wand to remove all traces of Padfoot's presence from the window seat. Everything. James shouted, brandishing his wand. He tapped the map and exclaimed, I solemnly swear that I am up to no good. What are you doing? Sirius sat on James's closed trunk and watched as the map came alive. Finding our lost friend, and his favorite teacher. 
James scanned the map quickly. He frowned. I don't see. Wait. Harry's in the astronomy tower. But, I don't understand. What? Remus asked, lying down on the window seat which was finally free of dog hair. The map, it, Harry's last name is, gone. James held the map up to the light to examine it. Gone. Peter asked, perplexed. Yes, and it, hang on a moment, we've got a stray dot. That's impossible. Remus cried, his head shooting up from its pillow. But look. It's headed to Professor Century's office. James followed it with his finger as it swiftly crossed the map. Sirius grabbed the map from James. I don't see Professor Century. He's not here. I mean, he's not on the map. Is it possible there's a glitch on the map? Remus sat up, supporting himself on his elbows. There wasn't before. Could someone have jinxed it? James asked, running his wand over it. I doubt it. Nobody knows about it but us, right? Yeah. No one could have figured it out that quickly, even if they found it. The map is too well protected. Harry sneaked back into the dorm early in the morning and crept into bed. He had stayed in the astronomy tower to think after his conversation with Lupin. The man knew how to get him thinking. And now look where that had landed him, sneaking into his dorm in the early hours of the morning so he could catch a few hours and be up in time for classes the next morning. He had to have a death wish. Harry winced as the bed creaked under him. He glanced at his watch and almost moaned aloud when he saw it was five. He slumped onto his pillow in defeat and fell into a fitful sleep. Is the plan in motion then, Wormtail? A high-pitched voice came from Harry's own mouth and he shivered in revulsion. Why yes, my lord, a short, balding man quivered in front of him. My memories are coming back. He is in his dorm as we speak. Good. The cold voice laughed. Bring me the inflectos. Wormtail scurried away and brought a box to him. He took it gingerly, almost reverently, from his servant's hands. Inside was a pile of the strange little objects that he had so painstakingly planned to steal. Harry's anger flared as he realized what it meant, his own emotions overriding his enemies. Yes. Harry Potter will soon meet his end. He caressed one with his long white fingers and laughed quietly. He snapped his gaze onto the cowering man before him. Gather the Death Eaters, Wormtail, even the two in the dungeons. I may find a use for them yet. Yes, of course, Master. They will be brought. Wormtail scrambled from the room. Harry tried to turn his head to watch him go, but found his eyes turning to a large black snake. The cold laugh sounded from his mouth again as he reached out with his bony hands to stroke the snake's body. He hissed to her, and Harry felt his body tremble. Go fetch your dinner, Nagini. It's waiting over in the corner for you. Harry watched the snake as it slithered to a dark corner of the room. Harry felt his blood run cold. A man's corpse sat slumped against the wall. His eyes were blank and staring. Harry watched in horror as the massive snake came nearer and nearer to the body. Just when the snake had reached it, Harry's scar suddenly seared with pain. He screamed as the cold laugh rang in his ears, causing his scar to burn even worse. Harry felt a sudden pressure on his stomach and someone yelled. Get his legs or he's going to knock my teeth out. Got it. I've got his other arm, James. Good, Remus. Where's the water, Sirius? You told me to get his legs. Someone just get the water. The laughter continued to ring in Harry's head, slurring the words. He screamed again as his scar throbbed painfully. A sudden spout of cold water made him sit up, throwing the marauders away from him as he curled into himself. He could feel his whole body shaking. A hand lay gently on his shoulder making him recoil. Whoa, Harry. We're not going to hurt you. Remus sat in front of Harry, making the bed sink slightly. Get him some water. Harry pushed the water away when James offered it to him. No, he rasped. I'm fine. Fine? Sirius roared. Fine? You were screaming loud enough to wake up the whole bloody castle. Sirius, you're not helping. Can't you see his head hurts? Remus turned back to him with a smile on his face. Let's put it this way, Harry. You woke up Exhibit A, James the Human Chainsaw and Exhibit B, Sirius the Living Undead. Does that put it in perspective for you? Remus asked quietly, his voice like a soothing balm to Harry's aching head. Remus pressed the water into his hand again. Harry thought for a moment that his eyes were deceiving him and it wasn't a young Remus Lupin before him but the beloved professor. He blinked and found a 17-year-old Remus staring worriedly at him.
a mixture of pity and understanding in his eyes. Knowing Lupin would berate him later for not following his younger self's instructions, Harry lifted the cup to his mouth with a quivering hand. Water dripped down his chin and he suddenly choked on it, spilling it all over himself. His stomach was churning so badly that he couldn't even stand the water running down his throat. He placed his head in his hands, shaking so badly that the bed trembled. Harry opened his eyes again rather quickly. Each time he closed them he saw the dead man staring into his eyes, as though accusing Harry of letting him die. Harry groaned and tried to crawl past the marauders, but they pushed him back against his pillows. Where do you think you're going? You're in no state to even be moving. I need my trunk. Sirius opened it and poked his head around to look at him. What am I looking for? Harry frowned. He could have sworn he'd locked his trunk. He prayed desperately that Sirius would follow his instructions and not root around more than necessary. There should be a small box in the top left corner. Can I see it? Sirius got up and placed a small black box in Harry's lap. Harry flipped it open with trembling hands. His scar seared with pain again. Biting his lip, he rummaged through the box. It was full of small glass vials. They were filled with potions of every color. Harry, what exactly is this? James asked watching as Harry sorted through the various potions, grumbling as he put each one down. My personal store of potions. They're basic, but powerful. I advise you to never try to use them. Harry pulled out the smallest vial and held it up to the dim light. A small amount of black liquid swirled around inside. Harry unstoppered it and downed it in a single gulp. He screwed his eyes shut as it traced a burning path down his throat. Harry? James asked concerned that he was making such a face after the small amount of potion. Harry's eyes snapped open. What? I'm fine now. He replaced the vial, knowing he had to make the potion again soon. But on the positive side, his scar felt perfectly normal again. The numbing potion had done its job. He lay back down contentedly. What was that? Remus asked. Dreamless sleep potion, Harry lied smoothly. He'd done the same to Aunt Petunia when she had asked if it was drugs. Not that it was, but he didn't need her knowing he was brewing potions in the dead of night, right under her nose. You have nightmares often? Peter asked from his bed. Harry nodded. I had a rough childhood. Some things just don't leave you. Harry sighed. Sorry I woke you. Go back to bed. The guys nodded and got up, all but serious. He stared at Harry for a long moment before turning to his bed and whispering, that was no dreamless sleep potion. Harry drew his curtains closed and placed a silencing charm on them before he could say anything else, he was in for another rough year. A man who lacks judgment derides his neighbor, but a man of understanding holds his tongue. Harry. Harry looked up from his essay in surprise and turned toward the door. James was leading the marauders toward him, all looking rather why, each in their own way. Hello. The marauders sat down at the lunch table with evil grins on their faces. Harry frowned. What's up now? Oh, nothing, Sirius snorted, hiding a smirk. So, Harry, I've been thinking. Whoa. That's a first. James laughed, his mood having improved since he and the others had decided to approach Harry about his flying. Sirius shoved him playfully. Git. Anyway, I was just thinking about that nightmare you had about a week ago. You remember, don't you? Harry didn't answer. A sudden weight had settled on his stomach at the mention of the nightmare. He had hoped the marauders wouldn't bring it up again as it had obviously upset him, but it seemed luck wasn't on his side lately. Sirius took Harry's silence as incentive to continue. It wouldn't happen to have been about, I don't know, say, falling off a broom to a gruesome death? Harry didn't even blink in response. He merely lifted his fork to his mouth and proceeded to chew his food painfully slow as he tried to figure out how to answer. He sighed inwardly and looked up at them with a strangely blank face. I don't see where my dreams are any of your business, but as you asked, no. Sirius frowned. But we heard you and Remus quickly interrupted. What Sirius is trying to say is that we he stopped, looking awkwardly at the others, knowing nothing could fix their little blunder. Our snoops who just can't keep their noses out of other people's business, Harry finished. Not how I would have put it, James mumbled, glancing at the others. At least someone has the backbone to say it. Harry growled. He stood and stalked out of the hall, his anger calming slightly as he reached the grounds. Unfortunately, the marauders had followed him outside. He pretended not to notice them even though they were walking beside him. Are you saying we're cowards? James asked. 
Harry didn't answer. He just continued walking. Are you trying to get us annoyed? Sirius snapped, irritated by the silence. No, Harry murmured. What is it with you? We just want to. Go talk to Dumbledore if you want to know so badly. Maybe he'll exile me so you can get on with your life. Lord knows it wouldn't kill me. The dream was just a bad ruse to get you to talk, Harry. We didn't mean anything by it. All we want to know is why you didn't tell us you're such a good flyer, Remus protested. Yeah, I mean, you could even beat James, Sirius exclaimed, stopping Harry in his tracks. No, he couldn't, James argued, offended that Sirius was jumping to such wild conclusions. Sirius grinned. But he is. You saw that dive, he pulled out of it with less than a foot to spare. That doesn't mean he's better, James snapped, but you have to admit, he's a wicked flyer. All right, so he can fly. Big deal. You're just in denial. You don't want to think about the possibility that he's better than you. What if he is? It wouldn't make any difference, Sirius shrugged. Maybe not, but don't you want to know? James hesitated. See? You want some competition. I do not. Sirius jumped in front of Harry. What do you say we test your skills right now, eh? Harry wasn't even able to answer. His godfather had already raced off to the broom shed. Sirius turned and, running backwards, shouted back to the stunned group. Meet you at the pitch. Harry and James looked at each other. James rolled his eyes and shrugged, leading the way to the pitch. Sirius ran out to meet them beneath the goalposts, a broom in each hand. He tossed one to Harry and James, who caught them reflexively. Sirius was bouncing on the balls of his feet, a goofy grin on his face. I say Harry's faster. You say he isn't. To figure out who's right, you two are going to race. You two can agree on the terms, but no weaseling out of it. Harry scowled. He turned to James and was surprised to find a scowl identical to his own on his young father's face. James seemed not to notice and grunted, well, what do you think? Harry was silent a moment, but a smirk quickly made its way to his face. I think we should string Sirius up by his ankles, tar and feather him, then leave him for the Thestrals. Sirius paled at his suggestion. Nah, that's too nice. Why don't we strand him on the roof? Going without food for a little while would do him some good. No he'd just gorge himself once he got down. We need something more permanent. We could get Hagrid to find us a manticore to feed him to. James shook his head. How about throwing him to the giant squid or the centaurs? Lock him up with some blast ended scroots? Some what? Never mind. Feed him to the acromantulas? Lock him in a room with Snape? That wouldn't be punishment. He'd torture Snape, not the other way around. Tie him up and chuck him to the Slytherins? Make him listen to Frank sing? No, I say torture, by tickling. Sirius screamed. No, not that. Anything but that. He hid behind Remus whose shoulders were shaking he was laughing so hard. That's a bit much, isn't it? James asked, trying to sound worried, but failing miserably. He'll get over it. Sirius clutched Remus's shoulders as he peeked around his back. No. I'm too young. You can't. You love me. Remy, don't let them. Remus pried Sirius off his shoulders and moved away quickly. Sirius sniffed indignantly, crossing his arms. I see I'm loved. James and Harry rolled their eyes. Remus stopped laughing and stared. That was weird. What? They both asked, eyes wide in wonder. That, Remus said, pointing. It's like you both can predict what the other's going to do. Harry shrugged, trying to stray from the subject. So, this race. Say I agree to do it. If I win, I want no questions asked. And if I win, James crowed, which I will, we get to ask whatever we want. James, Remus looked uneasy. How about this? If Harry wins, we get to ask him three questions each, and he gets to choose if he answers them. But then he could get out of them, Sirius whined, still staying well away from Harry and James's reach in fear that they might carry out their threat. No, he can't, he has to answer at least three from each of us. We keep asking him things until we've used up our three questions. Oh, all right, and if James wins? James growled at this. If James wins, Remus said, ignoring James, we get to ask him whatever we want, but Harry gets to choose two he doesn't want to answer from each of us. James nodded and turned to Harry. Deal? Harry hesitated. Deal. He and James shook hands. 
What's the course? James asked, sighing. Across the lake and back. Sirius suggested, bouncing once again. Use the snitch, Peter exclaimed, his eyes shining. Brilliant idea, Pete. Whoever catches the snitch first wins. Sirius yelled and he and James shared a smile. Harry fought to keep the smirk from his face even as the others started to snigger. Sounds good to me. Remus retrieved the snitch and let it go. Harry watched it until it disappeared. Sirius, still grinning like an idiot, raised his wand. On your mark. They mounted their brooms. Go. Sirius yelled and sparks shot from the end of his wand. The two shot into the air, knocking Remus over by the gust of wind thrown at him. He picked himself up and asked, whatever happened to get set, the three on the ground turned to watch their friends as they circled the pitch. Harry felt his heart soar at the new freedom he had now that he was airborne. There was no other seeker. He didn't have to worry about the marauders and their bothersome questions. He didn't care that he was trapped in the past amid a million tragedies ready to happen. Nothing was there to hold him down now. It didn't matter what that stiff, no-nonsense defense teacher said. He was going to have his fun. Harry's face lit up when he thought of the Ronsky feint, a trick he had learned in his fourth year from Victor Crumb. He longed to try it, and now seemed like a good time. What better way to try it out than on James? Harry shot suddenly toward the ground. He felt a gust of wind hit him from above and knew James was right on his tail. Good. Now if he could just get the timing right. Harry pulled up only inches from the ground and soared around the pitch. He looked down and smirked. James was spread eagled on the ground. The others clustered around him worriedly. He got shakily to his feet and mounted his broom, but Harry didn't give him time to leave the ground. The marauders gasped and pointed up. James froze and gaped opened mouthed at Harry. Harry, however, had no idea what was going on below him. He had stood up on his broom. He crouched low to the handle and soared around the goalposts, letting his fingers brush against the cool metal. He laughed aloud and used his heel to guide his broom into a vertical position, shooting straight up. He flung his arms out and allowed himself to fall back, his feet leaving the broom. He heard the marauders yell in horror as he plummeted down, his robes flapping madly about him. Harry's hand clasped around a small ball of metal. He smiled and let out a whistle. He heard the marauders' awe-filled gasps as the ragged school broom sped to him. Harry caught it with his free hand and flung himself onto it. He lay down on the broom handle, his hands behind his head. He floated slowly down to them, eventually lying with the broom handle digging into his back on the cold ground. Show off, Sirius grumbled. Harry held his fist out to them, and the boys backed off, slightly wary. Remus gasped when he heard the snitch's tiny wings fluttering feebly. No way. Between his thumb and forefinger, Harry held the snitch. That's impossible, Sirius choked. James's mouth was hanging open. Harry sniggered and stood up. He held it out to James, but the stunned seeker just blinked furiously. H how'd you do that? Harry grinned. That's my secret. He pressed the snitch into James's hand and walked away. What must Lupin want to do to him right now? Harry groaned and hit his head against his bedpost. Stupid, idiotic, dim-witted, daft, brainless, stupid, moron. You said stupid twice. Not that I disagree with you or anything. Harry whipped out his wand and pointed it at the intruder. It was Lupin. He was leaning casually against the doorframe. Oh, it's you. Yes, it's me. He paused. Would you mind explaining why you acted the part of a fool today on the Quidditch pitch? Or would you like me to flay you first and ask questions later? Honestly I wouldn't object to doing it because I am under extreme stress, and you are not helping. Lupin slumped down onto James's bed, cradling his head in one hand. You are the most fool-headed person I believe I've ever had the misfortune to meet, Sirius and James included. Gee, I feel wanted. Harry huffed, leaning against his bedpost. I don't mean to be harsh, Harry. I just can't get you to understand how dangerous this is. Why, I have no idea. You honestly think I don't know that? Now I have to answer questions about who knows what. You agreed to it. Lupin snapped. You were the one that suggested it. You could have backed out and avoided this entire mess. Harry felt his anger snap. Oh, sure. Let's all blame Harry because he has so much control over everything. It's not like everyone dumps their problems on him or anything. He can take some more stress in his life. He won't mind. After all, it's not like he gets blamed for every bloody thing that happens around this place. Nothing's ever his fault. 
Harry kicked his trunk open in a blind fury. Lupin jumped up as Harry started throwing things into a rucksack. Harry don't talk to me. Harry drew out his money and invisibility cloak, and don't even think about following me. He threw his cloak around his shoulders. Where are you going? Out. Harry sighed as he exited Honeydukes. He hoped Lupin would cover for him. He just had to get away for the weekend, that was all. He shuddered as the wind threatened to rip his invisibility cloak from his shoulders. But he didn't remove it until he had reached the hog's head in. Stuffing it into his pack, he took one look at the sign before striding inside, hoping no teachers would be there to recognize him. Harry walked up to the bar, eyeing all the other customers suspiciously, knowing full well that they were doing the same to him. The bartender scowled down at him when Harry reached the bar. He didn't look much different than he did in the future. At least Harry didn't think so. One butterbeer, Harry murmured, and two days lodging. The bartender's scowl deepened but he pushed a dusty bottle to Harry and threw a key on the counter. Room 13, Mr. Never mind the name. Harry pushed his money to him and started toward the darkest corner of the room. He was surprised to find a heavily shawled, bespectacled woman sitting there. He thought immediately of the irony of his situation but sat down across from her anyway. Afternoon, Harry murmured, reluctant to draw her attention. She looked up at him with moist eyes. Oh. H. Hello. Harry was momentarily stunned by the tears but quickly recovered. I didn't mean to disturb you. Or, is something wrong? It's nothing. It's, I just she broke down in tears. They hate me. All the students hate me. Harry was startled. He'd never imagined it was this bad. What do you teach? D. Divination. A. At Hogwarts. I am the great granddaughter of a great seer, Cassandra Trelawney, but I am nothing but a fake. They all know it, they all do. You're not a fake, Sibyl. You just can't control your gift. Maybe you should apply for the divination position in a few years. By then you'll have more, control. Harry winced at the blatant lie but smiled nevertheless. Trelawney looked up, blinking away tears. H. How do you know my name? Are you a seer as well? Uh. No I just have luck with names. Harry took a large gulp of butterbeer, skirting the subject. She brightened immediately. Are you sure? You have such an air about you. So mysterious, charming, powerful, brave, heroic. Idiotic more like, Harry interjected bluntly, but you seem so. Yes, seem. But under the skin flaws mar the person. Harry hissed. He stood to leave but Trelawney grasped his elbow firmly and pulled him back down. She took his hand in hers and turned it over, palm up, and started tracing patterns nimbly. She mumbled to herself, a frown forming on her face. She pursed her lips and froze. Your destiny is twisted, my boy, and very dismal. I see many tragedies have formed you and more are still to come. You are becoming a guarded person, veiled from everyone around you. It is hard to read you but I can see you have already distanced yourself from the world. What has made you this way? Harry yanked his hand from hers. Excuse me, I'm turning in. Harry found the dark staircase to the second floor and started up. It was dark and cramped but he continued forward despite the sense of dread it gave him. He jumped when the wall gave way. It was a small alcove. Harry breathed a sigh of relief and traced his fingers over the brass numbers on the doors until he found number 13. He opened the door wincing as it squeaked, and walked inside. Harry, already frustrated by Trelawney, stomped his foot in irritation when he realized there were no lamps and a fire came to life in the grate. Harry started and whirled around, looking for an intruder. When he found none, he turned to look at the fire again. It suddenly occurred to him what had happened. He had created the fire. Harry watched it for a few minutes, shocked at what he had done. Harry looked at the window, then down at his hand and flung his arm out to the side. The window flew open, letting in a gust of cold air, and he gasped. Harry bit his lip and glanced at the thin wafer of a mattress in the corner, then around to the sink. It was dripping sickly black ooze and the basin was caked with grime. Harry pointed a hand to the sink and the mattress and said, Scorgify. He felt the magic leave him in a rush. Harry sank to the floor, shaking. A dull ache filled Harry's arms and lungs. He struggled to his feet as his energy returned swaying slightly as he walked. He glanced at the mattress and did a double take. A full, completely white mattress lay on the decomposing bed frame. Harry whipped around to look at the sink and gaped. The stone basin gleamed at him and pure water trickled from the silver tap. 
Harry sank down on the mattress and willingly let sleep overtake him. Harry spent his next day at the Hog's Head Inn by walking around town, disguised by a few glamour charms. He ended up buying a large slab of chocolate from Honeydukes, eating it whole to cover the taste of the horrible slop called food at the Hog's Head. As he ventured further into town, he found stores he never knew existed. It occurred to him that many of these shops likely didn't exist in the future. After a close run in with a professor outside a small arms dealer's store, Harry decided to stay in the Hog's Head for the rest of the weekend, no matter how dismal it was. The next day found Harry stuffed into a forgotten corner mulling over his purchases, waiting for whatever would be thrown his way, and it came in the form of his future professor, Trelawney. A bottle of sherry in her hand, she slumped into the chair across from him. Ah, you're keeping busy, she said, noticing the small stack of books Harry had picked up for light reading, as well as a knife identical to the one his godfather had given him, she examined one book. A study of ancient magic. She glanced at the other titles. If you're interested in the study of the old magic, I have a book that might interest you. Harry sat down his butterbeer, mildly interested. Really? Yes, I bought it to study the stories of ancient seers, but alas, only witches and wizards with abnormalities, you could call them, fill those pages. Such nonsense stories about centaurs and wandless magic and. Harry interrupted her, excitement and disbelief coursing through him. His experience two nights ago had set him wondering and the only conclusion he had made was that he had performed wandless magic. You have this book here, with you? Yes. It's in my room. I don't know why you'd want it though. The author is somewhat of a nutcase, name of Jonathan Lovegood, although his son is much worse. He's in one of my divination classes. Strange fellow. May I see it? What? The book? Oh. Of course, follow me. Trelawney led him up the stairs and to the very end of the dismal hall. Harry followed her through the door and was surprised to see a fairly clean and well-lit room beyond it. A crystal ball and numerous tea sets cluttered the corners. A bookcase along the wall towered to the ceiling. Trelawney was on her tiptoes, easing a book out by its spine. It fell to the floor with a clatter, spinning wildly until it rested by Harry's feet. Harry picked it up. The title, Stories of the Paranormal, glared up at him. Ah, interesting. As I said, I don't want it. Take it. I have enough books as it is. She sat down in a large armchair and sighed. It doesn't matter how much I study. I'll never be a good seer. Yes, you will. Just give it time. What's wrong? Harry quickly sat down in front of her. Trelawney had gone rigid and her eyes were wide. She began to speak in a loud, hoarse voice which made Harry suppress a shiver. The lightning child must prevail. The Dark Lord is on the move. His darkness reaches through all time. Friends will be divided. The shadows will ease the pains of loss drowned in a sea of tears. He shall brave heartache. Betrayal, mockery, forgiveness. Trelawney paused, her eyes rolling madly in her head. A plot to kill is on the rise. Silver hand still stands. Pain, disbelief, anguish. The lightning child must prevail. She shuddered. Her eyes slid out of focus and she went limp. Harry stared, at a complete loss. He had heard her give a prophecy before, but never one so dark. It was meant for him, he knew that much. The lightning child part was kind of a dead giveaway. Trelawney suddenly sat up. Why what happened? You don't remember? Harry asked, knowing that would be the case. Trelawney shook her head. Did I say something wrong? Not exactly. You just gave your first, real prophecy. Harry watched as her mouth dropped open in awe. I I, what? Uh, yeah. Look, I need to go get something. Just wait here. Harry tucked the book under his arm and left the room. He pounded down the hall and into his own room. Throwing his things haphazardly into his rucksack, he tugged on his invisibility cloak, took one glance at the window, and jumped out of it. He ran down the streets at breakneck speed and threw the door to Honeyduke's open, almost bowling over most of the customers. A shelf caught Harry's cloak in his hurry and it toppled behind him, scattering merchandise on the floor. A few shouts later and he was running through the dark underground passage beneath the cellar. He was so deep in thought that he didn't pay attention to where he was going. He suddenly ran into something solid and fell to the ground with a loud thump. Harry scrambled to his feet, ripping the invisibility cloak over his head in exasperation. He stuffed it in his pack and was about to start walking again when a groan sounded somewhere to his right. 
Harry had automatically assumed he had simply been going so fast that he had clipped the wall, but somehow, the groan did nothing to reassure him. Who's there? Harry growled. He gasped when the tip of the wand lit only inches from his face. It took a few seconds for his eyes to adjust to the sudden brightness but when his vision cleared he found himself staring at a very shocked Remus Lupin. They stared at each other for a split second before Harry took off running. He couldn't tell if Remus was following him. All he could hear was the pounding of his feet and the unsteady pulse of his heart. Harry heaved himself out of the tunnel and ran a ways down the corridor before sagging against the wall to catch his breath. He sighed in relief. Harry? Harry sprang away from the wall and stared at Remus's accusing face. He was slightly out of breath owing to the fact that he must have sprinted after Harry. His stamina had made it easy to keep up. Harry, however, was too panicky to marvel at Remus's superb abilities. Remus reached for Harry's shoulder, not fully convinced that he was really there, but Harry stumbled back a few paces to evade him. Remus's eyes widened and he choked, watch out, but it was too late. Harry's stomach sank as his foot plummeted through the air. He fell backward, and his back connected with the stairs. Harry braced as best he could as he rolled down the stairs, every inch of his body colliding violently with the stones. Harry hit a landing and flew into the corner. A suit of armor clanked loudly as it tried to move out of his way. Harry slammed into it with a loud crash and it went tumbling down piece by piece onto his head. Remus grimaced as the helmet clanged down onto Harry's head. The visor clapped wildly as Harry staggered to his feet, confused by his sudden blindness. Remus gasped when he realized what was about to happen. Stop. Don't but Harry stepped forward and his foot sliced through thin air as he missed a stare. Remus flinched as Harry hit each stair, falling head over heels, the helmet hitting each one with a resounding gong that made him flinch as the sound crashed over his own sensitive ears. Finally, the noise stopped and a groan rose from the floor below. Remus ran down the stairs, tripping over the armor but managing to not face fault after Harry. He paused on the last few steps, his hand on the banister. Harry was lying spread eagled at the bottom of the staircase. Harry. Remus called gently. I'm okay, Harry managed to groan, the words slurring together. He staggered to his feet and raised the visor helmet to look around. He let it clang shut and started down the hall with the helmet still on his head. Wait. I wanted to talk with you. Remus called as Harry disappeared around a corner. Remus ran after him. He turned the corner and stopped. Harry was gone. Harry ambled into the defense classroom and sat his backpack on a desk. He flipped the visor up and held it open. Lupin was leaning low over his papers, oblivious to Harry's presence. How that was possible, Harry wasn't sure. Harry wrapped his knuckles against the nearest desk to get his attention. Lupin looked up curiously and stared at him. Get. It. Off. Harry pointed to the helmet. Lupin's face contorted slightly. With a suppressed laugh, he stood up. You think this is funny? Lupin laughed uproariously at the indignant look on Harry's face. I I'm sorry. I it's just so f funny. Lupin clutched his sides, tears of laughter rolling down his face. I can't s stop. Harry crossed his arms and waited for him to stop laughing. With a final sigh, Lupin straightened up wiped the tears from his eyes, and came over to him. Well, I'd say the manual way is the only thing. You might want to take off your glasses, he said gently, a smile on his lips. Harry pocketed them and braced himself against a desk as Lupin took hold of the helmet. Lupin heaved and Harry's feet slid across the flagstones. Harry grabbed the desk and dug his heels into a crevice. With a loud pop, the helmet slipped from Harry's head. Harry stumbled backwards, carried by his own momentum and Lupin's arms snapped back. The helmet connected with his head. He dropped the helmet on the floor with a clatter. Harry shoved his glasses back on and looked over at him. Lupin sat on a desk, his head in his hands. Ow, 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 ow. Harry chalked back a snigger. Lupin was likely not hurt badly, but hearing him react in such a childish way was funny. You oh okay? Harry chuckled. Lupin looked up. His nose was bleeding. No, I am not. And it's not funny. Harry burst out laughing. Why yes, it, is. You should have heard yourself. I it was hilarious. Lupin seemed to recover rather quickly after this. Hilarious, eh? I'll show you hilarious. He picked up the helmet, weighed it in his hands and, with one deft movement, lobbed it at Harry, who was doubled over laughing. Harry looked up at the last moment. 
He yelled and ducked but the edge of the helmet caught his temple. He put his hand to the throbbing spot. It came away with a drop of blood on it. Oh, it's on now. Harry grabbed the helmet and chucked it at Lupin who ducked. Books began flying, followed by inkwells, quills, and even small devices sitting around the room. Harry swore he saw a sneakoscope fly past his head. Lupin and Harry, who couldn't remember the last time he had really laughed and meant it, were both laughing raucously, all the while throwing harmless insults and slightly lethal objects at the other's head or any other body part they could catch. Occasionally, the helmet would enter the fray, only causing the combatants to laugh harder. Pompous goody two shoes, Harry yelled, mischievous runt, Lupin jibed, chuckling. Ouch! You hit my hand, you overgrown windbag! Harry shook his hand to get rid of the stinging. Windbag! How dare you, you insolent brat, mangy wolf! Egocentric Quidditch star with your one loss record! What about you and your furry little problem? Just like your father, you are. What's it to you, Mr. Chocoholic? I am not a chocoholic. I may like chocolate, and for good reason, but I think about plenty else. Ow! These were my good robes. You've never had good robes. Besides, you ruined mine a while ago. I thought I'd return the favor. You're such a grouch. I am not a grouch, four eyes, overachiever, attention hog. Pansy. Watch what you're doing with that, marauder spawn. You're going to behead me. I'm the one being careful. You be careful. Oh, yes, Lupin sighed, sarcasm evident in his voice. We wouldn't want our golden boy getting hurt and ruining his appearance for the papers now would we, or is it the tabloids? Hey, I can't help it that I have dashingly good looks. Harry peeked around his desk fort and gave a comical impression of Lockhart's best smile and puffed out his chest, placing his hands on his hips. The grin was quickly wiped off when Hogwarts, a history smacked him in the face. Harry dodged another book, unable to get behind his shelter again. He was now standing in front of the door, out in the open. Oh, you missed. Curse you and your super seeker reflexes. Lupin cried, leaping out from his own fort. He hefted the helmet again and threw it. Harry dodged again. Y-E-O-W-C-H. Harry and Lupin froze. Harry's first thought was that the helmet had rebounded, but the look on Lupin's face told him everything. I guess we're interrupting? Someone grumbled. Harry turned around. The marauders were staring at them in shock. Sirius was gingerly rubbing a bump on his head. Lupin recovered first, sending Harry a warning glance as he cleared his throat. He would take care of this. Boys, what can I do for he stopped and looked over at Remus, whose eyes were riveted on the ground. The helmet was sitting at his feet. Harry growled under his breath. Nothing ever went his way. With measured steps, he walked over to Remus. Remus's eyes bored into Harry as he bent down and picked up the helmet. Ah, uh, sorry, this is for my, project, yeah, Harry felt like disappearing. He couldn't stand people staring at him anyway, but Remus's gaze was so calculating that it made Harry squirm. There was only one thing he could do that would solve this, and that was to evaporate from the face of the earth and do it fast. In an almost horribly foolish attempt to disappear, Harry lifted the helmet and placed it over his head. With as much control as he could muster, Harry strode from the room, feeling quickly for the door handle. Sorry we intruded, Professor. We were just wondering about the noise. James smiled, casting an approving look around at the shambles the room was now in. Um, Professor, you have a James pointed to his hair. Lupin reached up and felt the end of a quill. He tugged it painfully from his tangled hair and threw it into the mess behind him. Thank you. I was looking for that. Harry and I were just. There was a loud bang outside. Lupin beat the marauders out the door. He stopped so quickly that the others ran into him, almost sending him sprawling. Harry was lying on his back, flat on the floor. He lifted the visor on the helmet and gazed at Lupin with a dazed look. I am not okay. Harry steered clear of Remus for the next few days. He could tell Lupin was worried too. The young professor was growing tired and constantly seemed to be drinking pepper up potion. Harry noticed that each time he was in the same room as the werewolf, his eyes were usually trained on the smallest movements Lupin made. He found Lupin's hands shook and the slightest sound made him jump. He tensed or whipped around to watch when any sudden movement was made. And he wrinkled his nose more than normal, something Harry had never really noticed him do unless something extremely foul was around. 
Harry was so wrapped up in watching Lupin at breakfast one morning that he didn't notice Remus had sat down and had been talking to him for almost a minute before Sirius shoved him. Harry lifted his elbow from the porridge bowl with a disgusted look. Gee, thanks, Sirius. I always wondered what elbow porridge tasted like. He tried to wipe his arm off but only succeeded in smearing the mush around. He scowled. You could have just tapped me. I did. You were so busy daydreaming that you didn't even notice. Sirius gestured to Remus and went back to his ravenous eating. What were you saying? Harry asked, searching for and locating his fork. I was just talking about the Hogsmeade weekend coming up. I don't know that I'll go. What? Why? Harry exclaimed, stopping the fork in midair. It seems pointless after going so often. So, isn't it better to go and be bored there than staying here and being bored? Remus shrugged. Not really. At least when I stay behind I get something done. So, if you didn't go then you'd sit up in the dorm reading through that entire stack of books you have stashed under your bed? Remus's eyes narrowed. How do you know about those? Harry smiled and whistled a tune softly. He loved irking Remus. It was too fun. Remus ignored him. Anyway, I just think I'll stay here and, read. But it's not half as fun without you badgering me, Harry whined, imitating a spoiled child. You've managed a whole weekend before, Remus interjected. Yes, but Harry froze and cursed his mental capacity as Remus gave him a small smirk. He should have known Remus would try to find a way to make him admit to going to Hogsmeade. But what? Finish please. That wasn't planned, Harry murmured, looking down at his plate. Indeed? Remus asked, arching an eyebrow, but you still. A screech interrupted him. Owls swooped in from every window. A large tawny landed before Remus. It hooted dolefully and dropped a copy of the Daily Prophet on the table. Remus dropped a canute in the pouch on its leg and it took off, cuffing Sirius around the head. Blasted bird. Sirius snarled, grabbing the paper from Remus's grip and scanning it, flipping the pages noisily. He stopped to read something and snorted. Another article from that new reporter, Rita Skeeter. Can I see? Sirius handed Harry the paper and yawned, going back to his food. Harry thumbed through the pages. It took him two tries to find Rita's article. It was stuffed between ads for the newest Mrs. Scour's product and Bertie Bott's every flavor beans. Has you know who disappeared or is he rallying followers? It seemed as of one week ago that you know who had disappeared from the face of the earth. No such luck for ministry officials who arrived at the scene of the murder of Robert Compton and his wife. Both were found dead, killed by the killing curse. When asked to comment, Albus Dumbledore chose to send reporters and owls away. Is the mighty Dumbledore afraid or has he joined this madman in his search for power? And is his school only for educational purposes or is he creating an army of followers for you know who? Harry growled and threw the paper at Remus, who exclaimed, Excuse you, I didn't do anything. Sorry, Harry grumbled. What's gotten into you? It's just a stupid news article. James grabbed the paper and looked over the article. That's all just nonsense. Who's going to listen to her? You'd be surprised, Harry mumbled. You know, there was a lot of publicity about Compton and his wife. They were famous orers at one point, but they weren't very wealthy. Remus mused, stirring the food on his plate in his distraction. Wasn't the missus sick? Sirius asked, wiping his mouth on his sleeve. That's right, Peter interrupted. Alice and Frank were visiting when it happened. Alice is their daughter. That's why they're both in the hospital wing. James murmured, amazed he hadn't remembered it before. Frank smuggled himself and Alice out on her father's orders, but I still don't understand why they were targeted. What could Voldemort have wanted with them when he knew that they support Dumbledore? James rolled his eyes as Peter flinched. You've got a good point, James. Remus ran his hand through his hair, a frown on his face. There was no point, was there? Except to make sure everyone knows he's still out there. Harry gazed at him, shocked that he hadn't realized it before. The prophecy was already starting its course. Born to the ones who have thrice defied him. Neville had been the other boy in the prophecy. Just because the prophecy didn't exist yet didn't mean it couldn't already be taking place. And the prophecy never said how they had defied Voldemort. Surely running away this once was one of the three times. But why had the Comptons been targeted in the first place? Voldemort had no idea that a prophecy would soon be made. He did go to them for support. Harry groaned. Of course. What? Sirius was baffled. They had nothing to offer. 
The wife was sick. Mr. Compton spent all his time looking after her. They spent all their gold on every possible remedy for her. They have a daughter who's still in school. And they were aurors, meaning they would never have a reason to give their loyalty to him. You're not thinking, serious. They did have something, something very valuable. Just think about it. No. Remus gasped. The others jumped, eyes wide. Quiet down, Mooney. Sorry girls. James waved to a couple girls who had jumped when Remus had shouted. What's up? Sorry. I just realized, Alice. Beg pardon? Sirius asked. They wanted Alice. Exactly. Harry smiled. Now they were getting somewhere. Get into his mindset. He wants purebloods, if he can get them, and he'll get them however he can, even with blackmail. Sirius whispered, horrified. They threatened the Comptons to turn over their daughter, James stopped, looking appalled. Are they and their daughter would be killed, Peter mumbled. Why did you have to choose today, of all days, to plan a prank? Harry groaned, watching the marauders placing the final touches on the last staircase in Hogwarts. Because we've only pranked Snape so far, Sirius laughed, tapping the rail one last time. And besides, this one's just for fun. It might embarrass some people. Remus shrugged, smirking. But it won't mortally harm anyone. James sighed. It is a shame, but I think we'll get our point across. Want a demonstration? Harry looked at him uncertainly. I don't wonderful. Mooney, would you do the honors? Sirius bowed, moving his arms in a sweeping motion toward the stairs. James rolled his eyes and pushed Remus forward. Remus huffed but stepped a little hesitantly onto the bottommost stair. Immediately, music began blaring from every direction, making Harry's ears pound unpleasantly. Domo arigato, Mr. Roboto thank you very much, oh, Mr. Roboto. For doing the jobs, nobody wants to thank you very much, oh, Mr. Roboto. For helping me escape, just when I needed to thank you. Thank you. Thank you I wanna thank you please, thank you. Remus withdrew his foot, a blush on his face. Sirius pounded him on the back, smiling widely. Works like a charm. Always knew it would of course. Never a doubt in my mind. Excellent. Just excellent. James, grinning, was bouncing on the balls of his feet. My turn. He rushed forward but stumbled as Harry grabbed his arm. So, that's all it does? It just plays music? I mean, there's no catch? Harry asked suspiciously. Catch, Remus asked obviously feigning shock at the accusation. Harry frowned. Remus's prankster side had really caught him off guard at first, but he was slowly coming to grips with it. There was no way Remus could fool him into thinking there wasn't a catch now. Harry wasn't going to fall for that again. There's never a catch. Whatever led you to believe such things? James, now smirking, stepped onto the stairs. Yeah he was blinded by the light cut loose like a deuce another runner in the night. Blinded by the light he got down but he never got tight, but he's gonna make it tonight. Sirius, wanting his turn to show off, yanked James off the stairs, but before he had the chance to clamber onto them, Harry caught him by the arm as well. Will it always be the same song? Yep. Its design is ingenious, if I do say so myself. Remus snorted. The spells in the prank pick one of two things. The song is either the victim's favorite song, or one that describes their life or how they feel to an extent. Not perfect, but at times hilarious. With that he stepped up himself and waited patiently for the music to begin. Shout shout let it all out these are the things I can do without. Come on I'm talking to you come on Harry smiled at Sirius as he stepped down, relieved that the prank wasn't any more involved than it appeared. The look quickly turned into horror. What do you say we give Harry a taste? Sirius asked at large, smirking. Harry panicked. No. He was grabbed by James and Peter. With a vicious thrust, Harry threw Peter away from him, feeling no remorse for the rat as he fell to the floor. Sirius grabbed him instead and James nodded. Putting all their weight behind the throw, they hoisted him in the air and threw him halfway up the stairs. Harry landed rather gently for how far he was thrown, but slipped down a few steps. In an attempt to stop himself, he tried to stand and cried out when his legs sank through the trick stair. Harry grunted with the effort to free himself, but his foot was firmly wedged inside. It immediately started aching from the position it was forced into. He looked down at the marauders, stunned that they had bodily thrown him onto the stairs. If they had just asked him, but then he understood. 
Their smirks said it all. He instantly redoubled his efforts. Remus had indeed lied to him about there being no catch, just as he had first thought. And he did not want to be the first one to be subjected to it. But he still couldn't help but pause when the song began echoing off the walls. I don't know what's worth fighting for or why I have to scream. I don't know why I instigate and say what I don't mean. I don't know how I got this way I know it's not alright. So I'm breaking the habit tonight Harry was still pulling desperately on his trapped leg, trying to beat the catch to the prank. It seemed it all had to do with how long you were on the staircases, and, Harry knew, he'd been on too long. And just as his frantic brain processed this fact, it happened. Harry watched in fascinated horror as his clothing was transfigured in front of his eyes. Before he knew what was happening, he was wearing a pair of torn and faded jeans, a black t-shirt, and leather jacket. A silver chain hung from his waist, dangling to his knee before traveling back up. Its clasps were in the shape of lightning bolts. Harry sighed in relief when the changes stopped. He opened his mouth to yell at the marauders but found himself unable to control his own mouth. He was singing along. Memories consume like opening the wound I'm picking me apart again. You all assume I'm safe here in my room, unless I try to start again. Harry tugged his foot from the stair and raced to the bottom of the staircase, praying there was nothing else in store for him. The marauders stared at him, apparently shocked by his new wardrobe. James opened his mouth to say something, but Remus grabbed his arm. Someone's coming, he hissed. The marauders and Harry, who was still seething, scrambled to hide behind a tapestry and into the hidden passageway. With two at each side and Peter watching from underneath, they peered out at their unsuspecting victim. Severus Snape rounded the corner. Harry fought back a groan. Snape started up the stairs and kept walking, oblivious to the music playing. Dancing Queen young and sweet, only seventeen the marauders almost collapsed in shock. Harry's song they could handle, but Snape's, they continued to watch, still stunned. Snape's clothes suddenly began to change. Harry's eyes widened in alarm. Snape's hair began to frizz until it looked like a bush was growing from his head. His robes changed from the normal black. His new wardrobe would have sent the group into hysterics if they weren't so surprised. Snape was now wearing a pink, sequined shirt and skin-tight disco pants. His shoes, usually black and shined apparently every day, had turned into a pair of lime green platform boots. Sirius emitted an odd gurgling noise. It burns. James moaned. I know, Remus murmured, but, I can't, look, away. Harry groaned, suppressing his own laughter. He winced as Snape began to sing along with gusto. He was almost to the top of the steps when someone appeared. Harry whimpered. Uh oh, James muttered. Marauders, Snape started. Professor Century whispered something to him as he walked past. Snape slowly looked down, flushed, and ran off. Century started down the stairs, taking them three at a time. Harry had a feeling Century would have leapt down them in one stride, but his more reasonable side had talked him out of it. Harry tried to shrink back against the wall as he came nearer. The last place he wanted to be at the moment was on the receiving end of Century's wrath. He had never seen it to its full extent, but at any rate it was something to be feared. Domo Arigato, Mr. Roboto thank you very much, oh, Mr. Roboto. For doing the jobs, nobody wants to thank you very much, oh, Mr. Roboto. For helping me escape, just when I needed to thank you. Thank you. Thank you I wanna thank you please, thank you. Century hopped off the last step, landing with the most elegance and grace Harry had ever seen him use. He pulled the tapestry back, revealing the marauders, who blinked up at him in surprise, their eyes wide. Century seemed to barely have a hold on his anger, but Harry noticed a playful glint in his eyes. He seemed to be torn between fury and laughter. Report to Dumbledore. But, Professor James gaped. They'd never been caught so quickly, and by a newbie at that. Now. Century snapped, pointing furiously up the corridor, having decided which he would go with. Harry and the marauders inched past their fuming professor and started toward Dumbledore's office. They passed the gargoyle easily enough. Peter figured out the password, blood pops, and they all walked towards the stairs. But when they tried to step onto them they were thrown backward. I forgot about that, James grumbled, picking himself up from the floor. What now? Harry snapped, having had enough of the tricks. Only one person can go at a time. That way everybody gets a turn. All right, Sirius first. They took the stairs as quickly as possible and found themselves in an empty office. 
it was almost 10 minutes later when music announced Dumbledore's arrival. Splish splash I was taking a bath all upon a Saturday night. Well rub dub I was splashing in the tub thinking everything was alright. Dumbledore waddled through the door. He had somehow managed to retain his robes and Harry breathed a sigh of relief. Dumbledore was wearing flippers, a float ring, a snorkel and mask, and a shower cap. The marauders burst out laughing at the sight. Harry found himself stifling a few chuckles, turning them into hacking coughs to cover them up. Dumbledore sat down behind his desk, not bothering to try to remove the apparel. I thought I would be seeing you today. After all, when my staircase starts serenading Professor McGonagall with witchy woman, you know who is behind it. Dumbledore stared at each of them in turn, making Peter and Remus squirm, though Remus seemed to just been getting more comfortable in his chair. He was hardly ever phased by his friend's antics and the consequences. So, what do you have to say for yourselves? Sorry, Professor, the marauders chorused, all looking rather bored with the routine. Good, now Dumbledore paused, his eyes landing on Harry, and he adopted a look of genuine confusion. Mr. Times, were you also involved in this prank? Harry shook his head. No then why are you here, Mr. Times? Professor Century sent me with them. Harry inclined his head slightly. Ah, I see. And it seems you were one of their victims as well. Harry nodded. Not that I can say I dislike your new wardrobe. It fits you. Thank you, sir. Harry mumbled, heat flaring in his cheeks. Dumbledore had no idea that he liked the new clothes too. After the initial shock was over he had started to get used to them. Well, I think before I punish you, I would like to know exactly what else is involved in your prank. Dumbledore turned back to the marauders. I guess you haven't tried to take off your new wardrobe, Professor, else you would know, James said, smiling impishly. The wizened headmaster reached up and pulled on the shower cap. It didn't budge. He lowered his hand, the twinkle in his eyes brighter than ever. A sticking charm? Yes, sir. It's unable to be removed. It'll wear off at ten tonight. The clothes won't disappear either. They're meant to be a souvenir of sorts. And the staircases? The same. You're stuck with it for a while. Sirius beamed, surreptitiously high fiving James when Dumbledore looked at the others. In that case, I believe it should be two weeks' detention, under Professor Century. Harry grimaced. He had recently started keeping track of the lunar chart in his sketching pad. And the full moon was exactly a fortnight away. Lupin wouldn't be in the best condition to deal with the marauders. Dumbledore must have noticed how quietly he reacted, compared to the others' groans. Is something wrong? Harry? You are not being punished as you were not a part of this plan. I know. But, I believe Professor L. Century has something to do that last night. Is that so? Well then, one week and six days detention. Off you go then. The marauders filed from the room one by one, their spirits not dampened a bit by the prospect of detention. Harry was about to follow Remus when Dumbledore spoke. Harry, may I speak with you? Of course, sir. Harry sat back down and unconsciously began tapping his heel on the flagstones as he waited impatiently. James does that. What? Harry asked, distracted. He bounces his leg like you are now. It seems you picked up one of his habits. Harry bit his lip and looked away. It was ironic how much he was like his father when he had never really met him before this year. Now, as I understand it, you were missing for a couple days about a week ago. A very flustered junior century came to me about it, poor lad. I thought he would have a stroke by the time he was through. He seemed to think you will make him prematurely gray. Harry snorted. Only days after your mysterious disappearance, a rumor surfaced about the Compton deaths. A young Hufflepuff claims she overheard you explaining your theory and immediately told the entire student population. Now, I have found you in this apparel after a run-in with the Marauder's latest and most brilliant prank to date. That may not have anything to do with these other two occurrences, but it seems important enough to point out. Is there anything you would like to say? Harry shook his head. Many of the portraits tutted at him. Harry, I simply want to help. Where did you go when you disappeared and almost caused Professor Century to have a nervous breakdown? Harry pursed his lips and sat back defiantly in his chair. Phineas Nigelus jeered at Harry. Answer your headmaster. I will when I'm ready, Phineas, Harry snapped. I was in Hogsmeade. Where in Hogsmeade? Why does it matter? Harry asked rudely, but Dumbledore didn't react to the jibe. Professor McGonagall was sent to search for you, 
she reported that neither hide nor hair of you was found in the village. Harry snorted again. I am not so easily found, headmaster. He paused. Why not send Century? I thought perhaps you would be more likely to talk with your head of house. After all, Century was the one you ran out on, am I correct? Yes, sir. But sending someone I am less familiar with makes me no more comfortable with approaching them. If anything, it makes it worse as I do know how they will react. Ah, excellent logic. I should have known, Dumbledore said, nodding sagely. Silence fell then Harry sighed. I was at the hogshead. The hogshead? Dumbledore asked, leaning forward in interest. Yes. The hogshead attracts many dangerous people, Harry. Of course. But what's life without a little adventure? Dumbledore sat back, steepling his fingers. Why not take your business to the three broomsticks? Aside from better lodging, it also has a more positive atmosphere. People's minds work in odd ways. Fortunately, there is usually some method to the madness. And what was your method? Do what is unexpected. Harry sighed and murmured, You'll live longer. Dumbledore chuckled. You are very interesting, Mr. Potter. For lack of trying, I might add, you say people's minds work in odd ways, Harry. I agree wholeheartedly with you. They say you know yourself better than anyone else does. That being understood, I am curious as to the origin of your rumor about the Comptons. You see, no one had been told of my suspicions. Your conclusion was right on the galleon, much to my surprise. You came to it very quickly as well. What possessed you to conclude that Lord Voldemort wanted to blackmail the Comptons into surrendering their daughter? Harry frowned and looked down at his feet. I suppose you could say my headmaster instilled a larger portion of himself in me than even he thought. You speak very highly of him. You are close. Harry felt his throat constricting. Yes, we WRR. May I ask his name? You may. Will you tell me his name? I can try. Can you tell me his name? And know why? The interference with time? A bit, sir. Why else, Harry? Harry exhaled shakily. I don't trust myself, Professor. There was silence and then the scraping of a chair against stone. Harry didn't look up even as two flippers appeared before him. Dumbledore knelt down. Look at me, Harry. Harry slowly raised his eyes to the professors. What was your headmaster's name? Albus Dumbledore. We were extremely close, Harry nodded hesitantly. Dumbledore quickly processed this. Harry, I want you to answer me truthfully as though we were positive that the timeline cannot be changed and you could tell me anything. I am not one to try and change the future, no matter how much I want to do so. I will likely forget all the things you tell me, Harry. With that said, I want to ask you something. Harry nodded. In your time, am I dead? Is that why you cannot trust yourself to talk about me? Harry put his head in his hands and fought back a sob. All the stress from the past few weeks was catching up with him, making his emotions go haywire. Fox landed in a flurry of wings on Harry's shoulder, humming gently. Dumbledore stood and walked to his desk. Harry sighed. Dumbledore must think he was weak. A cup of tea was pushed into his hands. His fingers trembled as he brought it to his lips. Dumbledore conjured a chair so he was facing Harry. Harry thought he looked a bit funny sitting there drinking tea in swimming gear. The man never ceased to amaze him. I left you high and dry, eh, Harry? Harry's head shot up. No, sir. Don't think but I did, Harry, Dumbledore sighed. Professor, I believe you knew that night was your demise. For some reason, your death did not, surprise me, sir. I think you were preparing me for it, in a way. Harry shrugged. Maybe it would have been different for everyone if you had died in your sleep, but. I was murdered, then? And did you witness it? Harry looked away again. The thing is that, I believe you may have thought me ready to go on alone. Dumbledore nodded. Perhaps I did. Then again, perhaps not. A boy should not have to carry a man's weight, even if he has come of age. Harry snorted. Since when does that make a difference where I'm concerned? Harry groaned suddenly. Oh no. What is it, Harry? Are you feeling all right? Yes, it's just that Professor Century is going to kill me. Why? You have done nothing wrong. I told you to not mind the timeline. He just likes to be cautious. I could have just messed something up. But you did not. I told you my theory about time, Harry. I also said I will not act on this information. If I try to correct everything you tell me during your time here, what would happen? Hundreds, 
Thousands of people would die. I couldn't let that happen, even if. Dumbledore nodded solemnly, not at all perturbed by the lack of information. I told you when you arrived that I knew you were special. I will not ask for any information that you do not give me. We all have to die, even if it is at the hands of a murderer. I have already had a long life. Two decades more seems like a good wrap up to me. Dumbledore sat his cup down with a thoughtful expression. I have a friend, Nicholas Flamel, who is. 652. Harry asked with a small smile. You astound me, Harry. Yes, who is 652. He says that the way to look at death is as the next great adventure. And I plan to do just that. Is there anything I can do for you before you leave? Sir, it is still hard to talk with you, knowing that when I go back to my time, you won't be there. True. But you have me now, if there is ever anything you need. Harry stood to go. I'll let you know. Thanks. He was at the door before a thought struck him. Actually, Harry turned back to Dumbledore. You wouldn't happen to know anything about wandless magic, would you? Dumbledore looked up from his tea. Everyone does wandless magic, Harry. It is a part of who we are as wizards. But, consciously, can anyone do it? Dumbledore sat his cup down and sat back, studying Harry. There are stories, legends really, and very few documentations, but from the records we have, there have only been perhaps two or three wizards strong enough to perform simple spells and live. Why do you ask? Oh, no reason. But, do you suppose, if someone practiced, they might be able to do even more? I do not know, Harry. Is there something you wish to tell me? No Harry opened the door and paused again. Sir, do you believe that a person really dies, if they have people still loyal to them? No, I do not, Harry. Good. Then, you will never leave Hogwarts, sir. Harry, Sirius groaned. You've avoided the questions from our bet forever. Harry knew his young godfather was not above whining until he got his way, but luckily groveling was not in his repertoire. If it got any worse Harry might have caved right then. He's right. Remus fell onto his bed, sighing. For once. James smirked at the indignant look on Sirius's face. It's been three weeks. We'll do it tomorrow night, since it's Friday. Remus tossed a pillow to Sirius while James wasn't looking. Don't you have detention? Harry asked, careful to keep his eyes on James and not on Sirius and Remus. Yeah, but we're halfway done, so this'll be our celebration. James clapped his hands together and smiled at Harry. At that moment, Remus's pillow went sailing toward James's head and the others laughed as James fell back onto his bed in a heap. Joy to the world. Harry murmured as a pillow flew at his shoulder, knocking him off his bed. A good name is better than fine perfume, and the day of death better than the day of birth. You get the feeling Harry's trying to weasel his way out of our bet. Remus asked quietly, glancing over at Professor Century, who was engrossed in a book. Yeah. He's postponing it as long as he can, James murmured, also keeping an eye on their professor as he dipped his quill delicately into his inkwell. You'd think he'd want to hurry it up, if not to rub it in my face, then at least to get it over with. He hightails it every time it's mentioned, Remus sighed, putting his quill back to his parchment. I'll tie him to the gargoyle outside the window to keep him there if I have to. Sirius grumbled, writing feverishly. Stupid line writing, serves you right teacher. Ah. I broke my quill. Well, Mr. Black, maybe if you were paying attention to what you were doing instead of chatting with Mr. Lupin or coming up with fancy names to call me, you wouldn't keep having these accidents, would you? Such as the miscellaneous holes in your paper, the two pages you handed in to me tonight which are nothing but scribbles, the ink you so gracefully stained Mr. Pettigrew's hands with earlier, or how about yesterday when you dumped a bucket of filthy water over Mr. Potter's head as he was scrubbing the floor of my classroom? Need I go on? The marauders looked up at their professor, who hadn't yet put down his book nor torn his eyes from its pages. Sirius mumbled, Sorry, sir. I don't believe you should be apologizing to me so much as your comrades, who have so graciously let you live so long even with your astounding ability to grace them with bodily harm nearly once a week. Sirius grinned sheepishly and scratched the back of his head. Concerning your conversation with Mr. Lupin, Mr. Black, I do not believe hanging Harry out a window will make him talk. You will only succeed in driving a larger wedge between you. You'll be lucky if you get him to answer your questions in the first place. Then how would you suggest we get him to open up to us, Professor? We all know everything about each other, but we know nothing about him, and vice versa. 
It's just not natural for dorm mates to be so distant. James went back to writing. Harry knows more than you think, James. James was about to respond when the clock above Century's head chimed. All right, I'll see you in class tomorrow, boys. The marauders were at the door before he was finished. Remus was about to leave when Century called him back, looking more tired than Remus had ever seen him. Sir? Make sure they don't terrorize him, Remus. He doesn't take lightly to people prying into his life. Besides, Century sighed, he's been a bit off color lately. Excuse me for saying so, but you don't look well yourself, sir. Neither do you, Century said, smiling slightly, but you don't see me nagging, do you? Remus's face colored, stunned that his professor had brought it up, almost like a subtle form of blackmail. Sorry, sir. I didn't think anyone really noticed. More people notice than you think. Century began shuffling papers about on his desk and chuckled a bit at the look on Remus's face. Here. He picked up two books and held them out to Remus. The first one is for you, the second for Harry. Remus took them, glancing at the covers, and gasped. How Professor Dumbledore said he didn't I was not told, Remus. I figured it out the exact same way your friends did. But, it's only been one full moon since you arrived. That explained the subtle hint about his health. And, no one knows that my friends figured it out. How did you know? Century shrugged, leaning heavily into his chair. I figured that they care enough about you to research your disappearances once a month. As to how I found out so quickly, I have a friend who is a lycanthrope. He always had a problem with self-confidence. That book should help you. My friend even made some notes in the margins for future readers. Professor Century looked down at his own book. Many things are not what they seem, Remus. People know what you are and they assume you are a monster. But you know better. Remember that they are wrong and you are right. Remus frowned slightly. Yes, sir. He left the room and was immediately jumped by Sirius and James. Peter hung back. Remus yelled in shock, clutching the books to his chest in an attempt to keep from lashing out in self-defense. Hey, calm down. Did Professor Century traumatize you or something? James slapped his back playfully as they walked. No, Remus huffed. I was thinking. Must have been some really deep thoughts, Sirius whispered to James. Remus glared as Peter snickered. Come on, let's go get Harry. The marauders, led by James, marched into the common room, attracting the attention of its entire population. James approached Harry, who was bending over an essay, scribbling away madly, and tipped his chair back. Harry hopped up so fast that James dropped the chair to the floor with a muffled flump. Remus, Sirius, and Peter helped direct Harry, via pulling, pushing, and shoving, to their dorm where a single rickety chair sat in the middle of the room. Peter pushed Harry into it and the lamps flickered out. A single lamp suddenly flared above his head, illuminating the marauders' grim faces. Harry Times, where were you on the night of December 20th? James asked. James. You're going to lose our questions. Besides, it's October. Remus cuffed him on the head. Don't worry, we haven't started yet. The lights came back up, blinding Harry who blinked furiously to rid himself of the glare. All right, Remus sighed. He waved his wand and the chair disappeared. Harry dropped two feet onto a pile of miscellaneous poofs and pillows where the marauders were already seated quite comfortably. Harry grumbled and tried to get comfortable. Ready to start, everyone? James asked as he lay down on his stomach and clutched a pillow to his chest, his chin resting on the top. Remus stared at him, frowning slightly. What? Remus pointed at Harry. He was an almost mirror image of James. Even the position of the pillow was the same. This is scary. Harry's eyes widened and he instinctively rolled over. He pushed the pillow away and put one hand behind his head and laid the other across his stomach. Remus, look at Sirius. Peter pointed to Harry and then Sirius. Harry glanced over at Sirius. They were positioned the same way, down to the direction their head was turned. Harry. Remus asked. Harry growled and sat up again. He curled one leg under him and brought his other against his chest with his arms wrapped loosely around his knee. He rested his chin on his knee. Look. James pointed to Harry and Remus. Harry yelled in frustration. You, just, go bother a hippogriff or something. Harry laid back down on his stomach and put his head face down in a pillow. Are you wishing us ill, Harry? Sirius asked with a snicker, tilting his head to watch the smaller boy. No Harry's voice was muffled, 
I'm wishing you were more apt to minding your own business. Well, off that subject, Remus rolled his eyes, let's get to our questions. We get three each and Harry can serious cut Remus off with an exasperated sigh. Choose which he answers, yes, we know, Mooney, get on with it. But, there is a catch, Harry. Harry sighed into his pillow and looked up, of course. Remus ignored him and went on. We want you to tell the truth. So, to ensure your cooperation, I took the liberty of placing a simple truth charm on this ring. He pointed to a ring that Sirius had just removed from his own hand. Well, Sirius's ring actually. It has Sirius's name engraved around the stone, and the Black family crest is on the stone itself. But it'll make do for what we need. The charm will make the ring glow red if you lie in gold if you don't. Simple. Sirius held the ring out to Harry who was torn between laughter at the irony of it all and awe at the realization of what the ring meant. You can do whatever you want to it later. Melt it down, sell it, keep it. I don't have a use for it really. The only thing I like about it is my birthstone. Always liked purple. Reminded me of royalty. He smirked, and Harry felt a smile creep onto his face as he delicately accepted the ring, imagining Sirius parading around dressed as a king. Too bad you aren't next in line for the crown, James laughed. Sirius snarled and stuck his tongue out at his friend, causing James to snicker. Your birthday's February 17th, right? Harry asked, examining the ring at every angle. Master bedroom of number 12 GR Harry froze. He rammed the ring on his index finger, lay on his side, and clutched the pillow tightly to his chest, praying that the marauders hadn't caught his slip. Finish that sentence, if you please. Remus prodded Harry in the side with his foot, making him recoil slightly. Harry didn't answer. There was no way to get out of this now. He was about to answer when he was suddenly hoisted into the air by one leg. He stared down at Sirius, who was still laying on his back, lazily pointing his wand at him, his eyes a darker blue than usual at the mention of his birthplace. I really would hate to hang you out the window because you refused to cooperate. Now, I want a response to Remus's very polite request. Fine. Grimald Place, London, England, the noble and most ancient house of black. Harry took out his wand and let himself down, landing with a surprisingly jarring thump on the pillows below him. Happy now? How serious? Remus snapped. Don't loose our questions. Oh, right. I can't believe you know that. It's not information I usually give out. Just get on with it. Harry lay back down, facing James, not sure he could face Sirius or Remus's questioning gazes. Sirius quickly overcame his shock, replacing it with a large grin. All right then, I'll start. Sirius tilted his head back to look at Harry. What, is the airspeed velocity of an African swallow? Sirius. James kicked him. Ouch, Sirius snarled. What? He doesn't have to answer. Harry almost smirked. Ten meters per second, now get a move on. The ring flashed gold and then faded quickly. The marauders glared at Sirius. Thanks for losing a question, Padfoot. How was I supposed to know he'd know the right answer? Sirius snapped, pouting. James rolled his eyes at him and ed his head in thought. How'd you get that scar? Harry's hand moved up to trace it absently. James nodded. It's wicked. Harry winced and withdrew his hand. In an accident, the ring glowed red. Try again, James said, smirking. Harry ignored the pointed looks he was receiving and went on. That's what I was always told. My relatives said it was a car accident. That's not what I asked. So, you're avoiding the question. Harry looked away, unable to look at his young father's eager face as he answered. I got it the night my parents died. The marauders watched the ring. It blazed gold. The night your parents yes. I don't want to talk about it. Harry snapped. Who's next? Remus leaned back, hands draped over his knee, and looked at the ceiling, frowning slightly. That's why you went off on us in the three broomsticks. We were bashing your parents, though good-naturedly. Though I suppose you don't care that it was in good sport. He smiled gently to encourage Harry. Tell us a bit about your family. What were they like? Harry's eyes dimmed and he clutched the pillow to his chest again. My parents died when I was one. I never knew them, but I've heard hundreds of stories about them. They were two of the best witches and wizards ever. Harry paused. He noticed the frown deepening on Remus's face. I have one friend whose family has sort of adopted me though. It's wonderful. I just wonder if they miss me, next. 
Peter had a thoughtful expression on his face. Do you have a girlfriend? Pete. What kind of question is that? Remus groaned, wanting to severely hurt his friends for the stupid questions they were asking. A good one. Sirius and James answered indignantly. Yeah, I have a girlfriend, well, sort of. I tend to be a bit protective, so I broke up with her to keep her safe. The marauders laughed, astonishment stamped across each face. What? I didn't want her to get caught by this guy who has a grudge toward me. End of story. Sirius snorted but dropped it. My turn again. What is your favorite color? Padfoot, James moaned, burying his face in the pillow. I want to know. Sirius protested, glaring at him. It's black. James. All right. James clapped his hands together. How did you get so good at Quidditch? Harry smiled. That's a funny story actually. At my old school, we had our first flying lesson and I was really scared. I thought I would be horrible at it. Well, one kid accidentally took off and hurt himself. The school bully saw that he had dropped something when he fell and he took it, into the air, mind you. I followed him on my broom. He threw the thing, shaped kind of like a snitch now that I think about it, and I caught it in a straight dive to the ground. Turns out my head of house saw it and I became the youngest player in a century to be on a house team. Being a first year, I was terrified. One of my friends found a trophy with my dad's name on it. He was a natural, so was I its genetics really. That's really unfair. James pouted. Shut up, prongs. You're a natural anyway. My turn. Remus sat up. Why is your favorite subject Dada? Dueling. Whatever you want to call it. Harry sat up too and leaned against Sirius's bed. I think that it's because. Because, Remus prompted. Because I've been raised as a person who, Harry took a breath to calm himself then continued, who has the weight of the world on his shoulders. You shouldn't have been raised to believe that. No one can. I know I shouldn't have. But it's the way I am. I want to protect people no matter what it takes. And defense is the best way to prepare. It doesn't seem like you need to be prepared anymore. You're excellent. Remus murmured, remembering Harry's duels in the class. Harry ducked his head, coloring slightly with the praise. Thanks. Peter was bouncing up and down in his excitement, anxious for his turn. What is your deepest, darkest secret? Harry almost laughed out loud. I'm not answering that. Um. Okay. What's the worst thing that's ever happened to you? Harry was silent for a moment, frowning slightly. Sirius sighed exasperatedly. He's not going to answer. Ask another. I'm thinking. You'd know that if you did it more often. Oh, that was low, but sadly true. Sirius lobbed a pillow at James as he laughed. Answer my last question while you're thinking. Sirius rolled over onto his stomach, his chin resting on his hands. What's your middle name? Alex, Harry answered. The ring glowed red and he growled. Oh, all right, it's James. And to answer your question, Peter, the only answer I think covers it, is that I was born. At least I feel that way sometimes. I know that I'm here for a reason, but, Harry sighed. Anyway, that's your answer. I was born. The ring began flashing from red to gold so fast that it was impossible to tell what color was which. Harry twisted the ring, his magic pulsing slightly, and it went back to its normal hue. The marauders stared at him. Some things are better left misunderstood. James cleared his throat. I think I have my last question. What is your most embarrassing moment? Harry's brow furrowed. Well, I was on my way to school once and one of my friends had this Mimbulus Mimbletonia, an exotic plant. Harry explained when the marauders shared a confused look. He poked it with his quill and it sprayed stink sap all over the train compartment. Just then, my crush walked in and, well, you can imagine. I feel for you, James said. Remus nodded. I want to know about Professor Century. Now, this all counts as one question. Where do you meet him? How are you such good friends? Is there anything odd about him? Well, I met him at my old school. He told me he had known my father and we hit it off. I guess I just like having one friend who knows what it's like. There was silence. Remus was frowning yet again. You didn't answer the last part of the question. Oh, well, no, there's nothing odd about him. The ring didn't react. Harry, confused, tried pushing his luck. In fact, he's just about as normal as you can get, for a wizard. Again, the ring didn't glow. His magic had somehow deactivated the spell. Oh, okay. Remus went on, looking disappointed. 
Pete, your turn. Peter bit his lip and stared at Harry for a moment. What is your worst fear? Dementors, Harry answered rather quickly. Dementors, why? I believe that is the end of our session. Harry hopped up, happy that the torture session was over. I don't know about you, but I'm exhausted. Remus jumped up as well. Before you go to sleep, Harry, I have something for you. He handed a bewildered Harry the book Professor Century had given him. Professor Century wants you to read it. He lent me a book too. Harry nodded absently and turned the book over a few times, examining it. His face showed confusion as he read the title. Legends and Mysteries of the Prowler, Harry whispered. He opened the cover and found a line of letters squeezed along the bottom of the first page. James craned over his shoulder to look. Aka wa Cyril Warp EHT. What in the name of Merlin does that mean? James took the book from Harry and stared at the letters. Isn't it obvious? Sirius asked, rolling his eyes, pulling his shirt over his head as he readied for bed. No, oh masterful one, it is not. It's probably coded, prongs, you troll. Sirius snatched it from James, his shirt slung carelessly over his shoulder. I am not a troll. Then why did you get tea on divination in fifth year? Sirius taunted, smirking. Everyone gets troll in divination, Padfoot. Whatever. Let me see if I can. Sirius ran his wand over the letters and let out a triumphant yell. I knew it. Just a simple revealing charm did the trick. Now, it says, Sirius trailed off and mouthed the words. The prowler is awake. What does that mean? I don't know, but I'm sure Harry would appreciate it if you didn't just yank things away from him. Pads, especially. Remus ripped the book away from Sirius and handed it back to Harry who willingly accepted it, when someone's left an encrypted message for him. Thanks, Remus. Harry lay down on his bed and opened the book. The message didn't make sense. Why would Lupin have left him a message he couldn't decipher? And what was a prowler anyway? He read the dedication and frowned. Dedicated to all prowlers, more commonly known as werewolves in many parts of the world, who have been misunderstood for centuries. The last word, centuries, was underlined. Harry ran a finger over it. He murmured a revealing charm and the word changed to century. Harry pressed his finger over the word again, marveling at how easily he could perform simple wandless spells. Deciding sleep would benefit him more than a night in the library, Harry placed the book aside, turned over, and sighed as the boys started a pillow fight for the sixth night in a row. A terrible scream tore through Harry's mind. He spun around to look for its source, and it wasn't hard to find. A half-human body was curled up on a giant bed in the corner of the room, bright moonlight streaming though the single window to fall across the mutated body. Harry thoughts, however, instead of focusing on the alien form across from him, focused on himself. Everything around him was huge, like it belonged to a giant. It made him feel extremely small, like he had shrunk as he slept. But he didn't remember waking up. Before he could ponder over it any more, his body began to involuntarily move forward, the flicker of his silver paw not distracting him in the slightest until he reached up to scratch his nose with it. Harry started. Why did he have a silver paw, and why was he so tiny? He wasn't even as big as his foot would normally be. His right hand was silver, but it wasn't a hand anymore. It was a paw. Harry's mind flew into action. There were only two explanations. Either he was inside someone's head, or he had finally lost his mind, and he was hoping it was the former. Another scream. He started and quickly scampered up the chair leg onto a cluttered desk. He glanced over at the huddled figure. It was shaking and moaning. The body was transforming, growing hair, a tail, claws, teeth, a snout, ears, and a dog-like nose. Harry made himself small as possible as the figure continued yelling and convulsing. Suddenly, the yells turned to howls. A low whining rose up and Harry felt his body quiver in fear as a full-grown werewolf rose from the bed. It padded around the room on all fours, resembling what Harry believed a wolf on steroids would look like. Harry again noticed his legs were moving without his consent, something he had always hated in his visions with Voldemort, but now it was even worse as he had no idea whose mind he was sharing. The werewolf wheeled around and stared at the small, petrified Harry and growled. Harry squeaked and hid behind a picture frame, poking his head around the corner to watch the wolf. The werewolf swung its paw toward him, but its claws hit something solid and sparks flew. The werewolf roared in anger and began a furious barrage on the invisible barriers. The werewolf stopped and began bounding around the room, 
bouncing off the invisible boundaries around all the furniture. The werewolf growled in frustration and began biting and scratching itself instead. Harry watched in morbid fascination as blood trickled slowly from its mouth. With a particularly vicious bite, its left paw began bleeding, spilling blood over its other paws and tail. Harry screamed, lashing out against whatever was anchoring him to the creature's mind. For a moment he could feel two other presences inside the animal with him. He disregarded them and began flailing with all his might. It felt like his head was caught in a blender. With a wild jerk, he fell out of bed. He struggled for a moment with his covers before he jumped up. He looked around in alarm. Why had no one woken him up this time? He had forgotten to put the silencer on the bed. His eyes were immediately drawn to the window. The full moon blazed through the curtains. Harry's hands began sweating as he remembered his dream. He had been a small animal with a silver paw. It had something to do with Voldemort. Three large animals near the edge of the forest caught Harry's eye. He watched them for a moment until he saw a smaller animal on top of the stag's head. It was a rat. Harry's breathing quickened. It wasn't possible. He couldn't have been Pettigrew. Unless, unless the rat was trying to tell him something and had purposefully connected them. No, that couldn't be it. But, if he had been Pettigrew, then where had he been to witness a werewolf transformation? The Pettigrew of this time didn't have a silver hand yet, but the future Pettigrew did. Which meant, they're here. Harry groaned and sank onto Remus's bed. He put his throbbing head in his hands. Why would the older Pettigrew want to watch Remus's transformation at the Shrieking Shack? But that couldn't be right. The man had been older than Remus. And yet he didn't look too different. But they had been inside, inside the, castle. Remus, Harry breathed. He jumped up and threw his trunk open. He dove into it, his head almost touching the bottom as he searched, praying he was wrong. His fingers finally closed around his cloak and map. He pulled them out and hurried down to the common room, quickly checking that no one was awake. In one leap, he was out in the corridor, his invisibility cloak flapping behind him, pounding toward Lupin's sleeping quarters, hoping to not have any accidental run-ins with teachers by avoiding the adjoining office which was an almost carbon copy of his room. No student would be thought brave enough to come to a teacher at night through the door only used by the teachers themselves. He skidded to a halt outside the door and took a calming breath, trying to keep himself from hyperventilating. His heart was thudding painfully in his chest when he calmed down. He reached slowly for the doorknob, afraid of what he would find, but his fingers came into contact with a barrier. Harry frantically searched for an opening or flaw in the wall but found none. He had to know. That was all there was to it. In reckless desperation he rammed his shoulder against the barrier and it repelled him with such force that he hit the opposite wall of the hallway his cloak still covering him. A sudden, muffled sound came from behind the door, despite the silencing charm that was up, and it shook as something threw itself against it. Harry cursed. Lupin knew better than to attract attention to himself. Something was wrong. Harry tensed as a sudden chill swept over him. He stilled and slowly turned around. He almost yelled in shock. Albus Dumbledore was standing beside him, only mere inches away. He strode forward and started examining the door, his long fingers running its length a few times. He sighed and looked over at Harry who stood frozen, still under the invisibility cloak. Some would call it stupidity, some foolishness. No matter which, it still warrants an explanation. With a small flick of Dumbledore's wand, Harry's cloak flew into the air and folded neatly over Dumbledore's arm. Harry stared at his professor with slight apprehension as he was thoroughly examined by the twinkling eyes. Ah. Mr. Times, I must say this is not an extreme shock to me, though I was expecting someone else. My father, you mean? Harry asked, crossing his arms. Yes, actually. But, I believe you informed me that, unlike him, you did not go looking for trouble. However, that doesn't seem to be the truth as you are standing before me now. It is never intentional when I get into trouble, sir. Unlike my father, I do not normally have the foresight to plan my little trips. And your father does, apparently, as he is rarely caught out of bounds. I take it that you, however, are frequently found out. Harry shrugged. That depends on what you mean by frequently. And, yes, my father thoroughly plans his outings. I, however, am less cautious and more, rash, despite the fact that I should have it drilled into me that caution is life-saving. For instance, we could have avoided this entire conversation had I not failed to take extra precautions tonight where I usually would have. Well then, 
Let us assume you had taken the extra precautions. What was your destination, Harry? Harry floundered for a moment. I was on a business excursion, you could say. To Professor Centuries, yes, sir. And, I suppose, a woman's voice entered, making Harry curse under his breath. A business excursion could not wait until hours when your professor would actually be awake, and able to pass as one of the living. Minerva McGonagall turned the corner, a grim smile on her face. Well? She demanded. I believe you will find him very much in the realm of the living, ma'am. He's a, uh, light sleeper. Drop of a pin, you know. Ah, Minerva, I expected to see you here. Dumbledore exclaimed, smiling benignly. Your rounds have gone smoothly, I hope. They have, and it seems I have located one last student out of bounds. McGonagall placed a hand on Harry's shoulder, her grip like a vice, warning him to stay put. Harry gritted his teeth, willing himself to not shake her off. Actually, I would like to hear Harry's story first and then pass judgment, Minerva. Dumbledore gestured to the cloak over his arm. McGonagall blinked in surprise as Dumbledore pressed on. Since I am sure you would feel left out if I took him to my office, we will discuss this here. And why is it you feel inclined to allow him a chance to weasel his way out of this when no other students are given the same possibility? She snapped, her lack of sleep affecting her mood. This is Harry's first offense. Should we not give him a chance to explain himself so that we can decide whether this incident was a misjudgment on his part or on ours? After all, we would not want to punish him if it was a folly of ours. But, Albus, you always explain the rules of the castle. There is no way. Professor, Harry interjected, looking over at Dumbledore. Have you informed Professor McGonagall of my special status? Dumbledore's eyes flashed. No, I do not believe I have, Harry. You wish to tell her? Harry ed his head to the side slightly. I believe she is capable of keeping a secret, sir. Don't you? I agree wholeheartedly, Harry. McGonagall's hand went limp and it slid from Harry's shoulder. What are you both talking about? My dear, Minerva, Harry here is a very special student. I have simply never found the need to tell you so. Tell me, what do you know about him? She looked at him skeptically but complied. Well, he is one of the brightest students here. He is in Gryffindor. He is a transfer student from, from. Ah, you have found a flaw in my plan. I neglected to tell you many things, including the name of his school, because I felt you did not need it or because I myself do not know. Dumbledore looked back over at Harry. I believe, Harry, that the question is not whether your professor can keep a secret, but whether you trust her enough to tell her. Harry frowned. He'd never thought of it like that before. He took a few steps forward and turned around to look at his professors. McGonagall wore a bewildered expression that almost made him laugh out loud. Yes, I trust her, sir, but, just to be sure I am not being played as a fool, Professor McGonagall, what is the one spell you cannot manage? McGonagall stared at him, flabbergasted, but after a glance at the headmaster, she answered. I, the jelly legs jinx. Harry nodded, turning again. And your favorite jam, Professor Dumbledore? Raspberry. Excellent idea, Harry. Thank you, sir. Dumbledore nodded. Now, would you like to do the honors or shall I? You may, sir. Very well. He nodded again, and turned to his confused deputy headmistress, the twinkle prominent in his eyes. Minerva, Harry is not a transfer student. He is a Hogwarts student. Once a Hogwarts student, always a Hogwarts student. I don't understand, Albus. He was playing with her now. Harry rolled his eyes and leaned against the wall, determined to enjoy the show. Minerva, who would you say is Harry's father? She gaped at him. You have met him. Take your time. We are in no hurry. I, if I didn't know better, I would say he was a potter, but that is exactly what I wanted to hear, my dear professor. May I introduce Harry James Potter, son of the notorious James Potter? McGonagall's mouth fell open and she backed against the wall for support. But, Albus, Potter is only seventeen and this boy must be at least that age. They must have been born the same year. Harry smirked, jumping in. Correction, Professor. I was born in 1981 to a proud marauder. And, by the way, for your future self's health, file this information away into the back of your mind. I, he motioned to himself, am fine, all in one piece, as is our friend. Okay? McGonagall sputtered. But, I, my future, but it's 79, there's no way, you aren't suggesting, time travel? I am, 
actually, as both Harry and Professor Century are proof of that. Professor Century as well. McGonagall shrieked. And who is he, may I ask? The Prime Minister or St. Nicholas? Unfortunately, I do not know the answer to that. Dumbledore smiled, bouncing on the balls of his feet. But now we are finally back on subject. Professor Century is the reason why I am here, and, unless I am mistaken, that is also why young Mr. Potter is up at this hour. Is it not? Harry nodded, feeling apprehensive now that the attention had been brought back to Lupin. Then, without further ado, let us pay a late visit to Professor Century. Dumbledore waved his wand over the door and with a small click, the door swung open. The room was exactly as Harry had seen in his dream, all the way down to the paper strewn desk, except the bed linens were now torn into a million pieces. The werewolf was sitting in the middle of the slashed mattress. It looked up, confused for spilt second, then leapt down to the floor. It barred its fangs and slowly inched toward the door, a feral gleam taking over its eyes. Lupin gave a loud bark, startling Harry back into reality, and began sprinting to the door. Harry, not giving himself any time to analyze the situation, grabbed the door and went to slam it shut, but the werewolf stuck its arm out the door and grabbed onto Harry. Its claws slashed through Harry's arm as he jerked away and shoved the door closed on Lupin's limb. The werewolf withdrew it with a whine. The door shuddered and bucked under Harry as Lupin rammed it hard enough to make Harry's feet slide across the floor. Harry quickly searched for his wand and groaned when he realized he'd left it in his room. Praying his strength wouldn't be zapped by something as small as a locking spell, he placed a hand on the doorknob. It clicked loudly as the lock snapped into place and Harry scrambled to his feet. He replaced the barriers around the door and leaned against it, trying to catch his breath, ignoring the throbbing in his arm. His professors were both staring at him. Professor McGonagall staggered slightly as feeling returned to her limbs. She clutched Dumbledore's arm to keep from falling. That, that was 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 that. Dumbledore patted her hand soothingly. Don't be alarmed. It is Halloween, Minerva. I expect it could be a harmless prank. You know very well that this is not a prank. You, of all people should be able to tell, Albus. Alas, I believe you are right. Harry. Is this the engagement you told me Professor Century had scheduled when I gave the Marauders their detention with him? Dumbledore's gaze seemed to pin Harry to the spot. I, Harry looked away, unable to stand the curious looks, perhaps. McGonagall gasped. You mean that, that was Professor Century? I believe it was, Minerva. She gaped for a moment before recovering, clearing her throat. Well, that certainly explains why he was so snippy today. He and Remus Lupin got into an argument over something trivial at lunch. I think it was the consistency of the pie or something to that effect. I wasn't really listening. Harry felt his mouth twitch slightly as he fought a smile and looked away. Dumbledore looked over at Harry, who was shuffling his feet. Dumbledore smiled serenely. Harry, I have nothing against werewolves. And as such, I will not sack Junior Century, especially since you need him here. I would like you to tell me his name, so that I may approach him with perhaps, a bit more of an understanding. Harry winced as the door bucked again. I can't, sir. And why can't you? Demanded McGonagall, immediately taking on a defensive stance, her shoulders squaring and her hands finding a place on her hips. If he got out he could hurt someone or. He has everything under control, Professor. Harry interjected, his anger flaring at her audacity. Had Dumbledore not undone Professor Century's barriers, that werewolf would never have known there was another side to this door, making him virtually harmless. I only wish to help, Harry. I shall do nothing to harm him. Dumbledore reached out to touch the barriers over the door again. He frowned slightly and turned to Harry, looking him over carefully, his eyes curious once again. Harry ignored the obvious question. I know that full well, Professor, as you hire him in the future. Then you also know that I can arrange something for him every full moon something much safer for everyone, where he can be more comfortable. I don't think leaving him with Remus would be your brightest plan, Headmaster. Harry seethed. A ringing silence fell as the words sunk in and Harry groaned inwardly. You know about Remus? Dumbledore asked, his voice carrying a slight hint of surprise. Of course. He's one of my father's best friends. Why should I not know? Harry snapped, angrier at himself than with Dumbledore. Because, Mr. Potter and his friends should not know about Mr. Lupin's condition, nor should anyone else. McGonagall waved her hands frantically, her face flushed. 
you must have known they would find out eventually, Minerva. Apparently, it only brought them closer together as Mr. Lupin has not been excommunicated nor have we received three requests for dorm reassignments. I believe Mr. Lupin has also become more of an extrovert since his friends have discovered his secret. It seems only good things have stemmed from their knowledge of it. Harry smirked. Now, Harry, again I ask you, will you tell me who Professor Century is exactly? It would help me gain his trust so I can help him. You already have his trust, and I refuse to break his by telling you his real name. He wouldn't have created an alias unless it was necessary. Harry pushed away from the door and brushed himself off. Now, if you will excuse me, sir, I would like to get some sleep. So, I bid you good night, professors. He bowed slightly. Of course, Harry. We will talk later. Here you are. Dumbledore handed Harry his invisibility cloak. Harry thanked him, put it on, and left the professors to talk as he steeled himself for a long night. Are you sure you've had enough rest, Remus? You look dead on your feet. Maybe you should go back to the dorm. Leave him alone, Peter. He'll be fine. I'm not so sure about Harry here. James elbowed Harry gently. Harry grimaced and reflexively grabbed his upper arm, massaging it gently. The marauders shared a befuddled look. Harry, are you all right? Remus swatted Sirius's hands away from his plate as he spoke. Get your own. I'm fine. Harry mumbled, watching as Sirius tried again to swipe some of Remus's toast and was pushed none too gently off the bench by one very annoyed Remus. Yeah, right, Sirius grumbled, annoyed by them both. Your face is hovering inches above your cereal, Remus pointed out, his voice hoarse. You are trying to eat said cereal with a knife. James pried the knife from his hand and gave him a spoon instead. And you're still holding onto your arm. Peter poked Harry's arm again. Harry winced. Not to mention we found him in the common room with Professor Century's book across his knees. Devoted much? Sirius asked as he got up from the floor, giving up on Remus and taking James's scone instead. Harry stood up from the table, determined to start walking before he fell asleep. I'm fine. Let's get to class. Harry couldn't believe his eyes. Lupin wasn't in class. Professor Grubbly Plank was his substitute. Something wasn't right. Lupin never missed class if he could manage it. It was the day after the full moon, but wouldn't Lupin have at least warned him that he would be out? He had been out of control the night before but he normally wouldn't have let that keep him from teaching. And Lupin had obviously not planned on skipping out as Dumbledore hadn't mentioned anything the night before about Lupin asking for sick leave. And, on top of everything else, Harry still hadn't figured out the clue Lupin had sent him. Maybe if he hadn't been so tired he would have understood, but as it was, the clue was way over his head. But at least one thing had gone right. The marauders hadn't seemed to notice anything was wrong, except Remus. He had been prying for information ever since they had gotten into the Great Hall and noticed Century wasn't there. Harry had just brushed him off, assuring him that Century was probably just sleeping in. After all, the teachers weren't required to eat in the Great Hall every morning. Remus, tired himself, hadn't seemed to buy it. Harry knew it wouldn't be long before Remus figured it out. It really wouldn't surprise him if Remus knew before lunch. But right now Harry had other things to worry about. He was sure Dumbledore had set up the substitute for Lupin so that he could interrogate him for as long as he pleased. Being Dumbledore's favorite did have its advantages when it came to figuring out how the man's mind worked, but that wouldn't help him now. Harry had to talk to Lupin before the headmaster had a chance. It wouldn't do for Lupin to be pressured into anything. Harry muffled a groan. This lesson was going to be one of the longest he'd ever had. Wonder what's wrong with Professor Century, James whispered. Sirius propped his feet on his desk. Dunno. What do you reckon? Perhaps he's got dragon pox? Peter squeaked in a frightened voice. Nah. That's not bad. Maybe he fell down the stairs and broke something. He'd be back by now, Sirius, Remus grunted, head on his arms. Oh, yeah. Sirius looked sheepish. What do you say, Harry? Harry? James asked. Huh. What? Harry asked, jerking out of his own thoughts to stare at the marauders. Oh, no idea. Would the peanut gallery please refrain from talking? Professor Grubbly Plank shouted irritably and the marauders quieted. Good. Now. I understand you have an essay to turn in. Hand it up. The class passed them forward, thankful to give it away. You will now divide into four groups, five in each. 
you will be making a list of spells you could use in a duel and explaining how you could use them defensively. Understood? Begin. Harry was barely listening. Before he could even register what they were doing, the marauders had crowded around him. Lily Evans huffed loudly, and why do you get the best dueler, Potter? Simple. We got to him first. James smiled, albeit a bit guiltily. Go on, Evans, we'll see who has the better list. Sirius waved her off. You made a bet that we can beat them at an assignment. What is this world coming to? James sighed, handing Harry a quill and parchment. Well, why me? Harry protested. James shrugged and motioned toward Remus, who was staring with glazed eyes at Sirius's chair leg. Harry sighed, pulling the paper toward him. Start naming. The boys were all too enthusiastic. Remus even woke up long enough to chime in. Harry quickly finished his first page and started on a second, writing down the spells they hadn't already repeated twenty times. As the boys argued over the use of certain color-changing charms, a different conversation caught Harry's interest. Professor Grubbly Plank, where's Professor Century? Lily asked, handing in part of her group's list. Never you mind, Professor Grubbly Plank answered, taking the parchment without even glancing at it. Harry's blood boiled. She had given him the same answer when he had asked about Hagrid in his fourth year. Did she treat every question that way, or was it just the genuine ones she liked to blow off? But, Professor, Lily protested. Please, is he ill or away or? Miss Evans, you needn't worry your pretty head over a man who is years your senior. Lily's mouth fell open in shock. I never. All I wanted to know is why he isn't here. Miss Evans, your professor is ill, Harry answered, cutting through Grubbly Plank's exasperated explanation. No one's allowed to see him. You have to get permission from Dumbledore first. And I believe there are only two students in this room I will allow to enter. Everyone turned to look at the door. Dumbledore and McGonagall came into the room. Harry groaned. It seemed Dumbledore was ready to go along with his lies so that he could get his answers. Mr. Lupin, you are first. Me, sir? Remus stood up, fully awake now that he was being addressed. I believe you had something to discuss with him. Yes, sir. But perhaps I should wait until he's feeling better. Professor Century will not mind a short talk with yourself and Mr. Times. Just try not to tire him out, if you please. I have some very important business to discuss with him. Remus nodded and almost tripped over his own feet trying to get to Professor Century's office. He opened the door carefully and peered inside. Seeing no sign of his professor, he slipped into the room and closed the door quietly behind him. Professor? Remus started as a low groan sounded from the bed. Century's head popped up from the mass of blankets covering him. He blinked blearily at Remus letting a slow smile take over his face. Good afternoon, Remus. Remus approached the bed tentatively. Century was lying on top of the covers, dressed in a loose short-sleeved shirt and slacks. Remus couldn't help but notice the large bruises and cuts that ran up and down Century's arms, a few even marring his face and neck. His hair was also rather disheveled and he moved as though he was confined in a body cast showing how sore he was as he moved slowly onto his side and then into a sitting position so he could face Remus. Professor. Who did this to you? Remus sat down on a stool beside the bed, trying not to stare at the angry red marks that stood out against Century's abnormally pale skin. Century chuckled, his smile turning slightly bitter. I believe it is in an instance like this that one finds there may be meaning behind cliché metaphors. Remus frowned, not seeing how the answer satisfied his question. I don't understand. Century sighed, still smiling. He carefully stood up and trudged over to a cabinet against the far wall. He took out his wand and waved it briefly over the lock. Century opened the cabinet and reached inside. He tried to reach something further back and Remus heard him gasp. Is something wrong? Remus stood up slightly, ready to help. No, no Century waved an impatient hand and motioned for him to stay sitting as he continued searching. He sighed again. It is not surprising that you do not understand me, Remus. He paused, the only sound the clinking of the bottles he was moving around. Have you ever heard the saying, you are your own worst enemy? Remus nodded, his eyebrows knitted together in confusion. Century chuckled. Most people disagree, but, in my case, it is literal. Century removed his hand from the cabinet, a large bottle clutched in his hand. Here we are. I was wondering if I was out. What is it, Professor? 
Remus asked as he watched Century pull out two metal beakers and fill them both with the contents of the bottle. Century slowly made his way back to the bed, careful not to spill a drop of the precious liquid. When he passed Remus, he pushed a goblet into his hands. It was warm and smooth under his fingers. Remus studied the contents for a moment, realizing what it was instantly. Spending at least one day a month in the hospital wing had taught him quite a bit about potions. Even more confused, Remus looked up at the professor. Sir? Just a pick me up, Remus. You could use it. Professor Century raised the goblet to his mouth but drew it away and stared at Remus for a moment. With a lopsided smile, he raised it slightly. Two, the marauders. Remus sat stunned for a second then grinned, raising his own goblet to gently tap it against Century's, echoing, to the marauders. Remus quickly took a gulp from his goblet and felt warmth spread through him like fire. He felt his muscles relax instantly and sighed into the drink, too busy nursing his own goblet to bother looking up. The silence as they drank was comforting. When they lowered their goblets, they gave each other lazy smiles and laughed as they watched steam billow from their ears. Remus looked down at the still smoking beaker, contemplating whether he should break the peace and confront Century. What other time would he have such an opportunity? He bit his lip. It was now or never. Professor Century, I can't help but notice that. As I said before, you're a bit off color, sir. I'm sorry for yelling at you yesterday, by the way. I don't know why I got so crabby. Don't you? Century teased, smiling over the top of his beaker. Remus flushed, crossing his arms. All right. I know why I was crabby. Century nodded in understanding and took another sip of the potion. Remus watched him for a moment then plowed on, sir, how long have you been ill? Century sat his beaker down on a tray beside the bed and looked up at Remus, his face still relaxed. Since I was a child, Remus, it is an illness which never stops tormenting its host, but at least it's predictable. He grinned and turned away, picking up the plate left on the tray and examining the cold bacon. How did you like the book I lent you? It was very interesting. Thank you. Remus paused again, cursing himself for his hesitation. Sir, I was wondering if your illness, I mean, if you've been diagnosed with, Remus trailed off, wondering how he could let such a debauched sentence come out of his mouth when he knew exactly what he wanted to say. Century's smile only widened as he turned his attention to Remus, putting the plate back down. Remus, you are not going to offend me by anything you say. I have been through a lot of tribulation already. Nothing you say will make me violent. Although, I'm not sure I can guarantee that to others as their comments are usually more, demeaning. Century held out his hand to take Remus's beaker. The beaker had almost reached Century's hand when Remus noticed the bandage wrapped tightly around his palm and wrist. Remus grabbed Century's hand roughly. Century yelped. Remus unwrapped his hand and stared at it before he dropped it in shock, scrambling to apologize. I'm sorry, Professor. I shouldn't have. Are those fang marks? Century slowly rebound his hand as Remus's mind reeled. He had never been so inarticulate in his life not even when he was angry at the other marauders. As Century tied off the last knot in the bandage, he sighed. What is it you wish to know, Remus? You're a werewolf, aren't you? Remus blurted. His eyes widened and again he found himself scrambling to find the right words, vowing to never speak again on the day after the full moon. If this was where it got him, there was just no use trying. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have accused you of that. You only accuse someone when you believe them responsible for a certain action. Is that what you think of me? A common werewolf? Sir, I didn't mean, of course I don't believe you responsible. It's just, I'm not sure what to think. I mean, every time someone talks to me it's like I'm a monster? Completely inhuman? Invisible? I know. The prejudices of the world can still have an effect on us so that we don't know what to think until we are faced with the situation ourselves. We may know our view, but any amount of fear can drive us to say things we never meant to leave the confines of our mind, maybe even some things that we never thought in the first place, Century chuckled. As if the transformations weren't enough, we endure the persecution placed on us by every wizard who misunderstands us. Remus nodded, deep in thought. Where do you go during the full moon? You could come with me. I don't believe that wise, Remus. Werewolves, no matter how tame, Century smiled humorlessly will tear one of their own apart, especially the males. They will shred anything they can catch, as you and I well know. Some animals and animagi are the only exception to that rule. 
It's a good thing to remember. Most people don't know about it. Don't do their research. Century sighed. Well, I believe you should be going, Remus. And I would appreciate it if you kept my condition to yourself. No one else knows yet. Remus frowned, his thoughts flying immediately to Harry. Was Century lying to him, hoping he would forget about Harry? It was possible, or perhaps Century just thought no one knew. But either way, could Harry really not know? He was too close to the man to not know. Remus put one hand to his head. But if Harry did know about Century's lycanthropy, then that meant he had fooled the spell Remus had put on the ring during their questioning. Remus's frown deepened. That wasn't true. He had forgotten about the ring and hadn't even been watching it half the time, including when Harry had answered about Century. Was it possible Harry really didn't know and he had just forgotten to look at the ring? Remus shook his head and pushed his thoughts aside to ask innocently, not even Dumbledore? Century shook his head. Not even Dumbledore. Seemingly as an afterthought he added, and neither does Harry. I've kept it from him so that he, well, what would he think of me? He thinks I'm a normal wizard who happens to have a very low immune system. Remus stared at him for a moment then laughed, pushing away all his suspicions about Harry. It was absurd. Harry had never given the marauders a reason to doubt him. And Century's revelation had just confirmed that Harry was being as truthful as he could. Remus stood and walked to the door, completely at ease again. He stopped and turned around one more time. Professor, that friend you told me about, it was you, wasn't it? Sentry smiled, picking up his goblet again. Good day, Remus. Oh, and tell Harry I want to speak with him. Remus left the room, a smile on his face. As he closed the door behind him, the entire class turned to look at him. Remus grinned sheepishly. Ah, Harry, Sentry wants to see you. Harry strode past Remus, giving him a smile and a nod. He disappeared behind the door, making sure it was closed. He looked around the office, but Lupin was nowhere to be seen. El Century? He asked, passing the bed in the desk in his search. There you are, Harry. Harry looked around for Lupin again as he spoke, but still couldn't see him. Confused, he asked, Where are you? Lupin laughed, In my living quarters. Harry grumbled and opened the second door, revealing Lupin's tiny living quarters. It really was an almost exact replica of his office. Harry saw that everything was back to normal. Lupin was standing by one wall, adorned only by a floor-length mirror that had obviously been protected the night before. Harry looked around the room again. Why do they give the teachers such small rooms? This place isn't fit for one student let alone a grown person. Lupin laughed, a slightly mischievous smile on his face. True. And that is why they give us this. He reached out to touch the mirror and his hand passed straight through. Harry started, astounded. W.H. What happened? Where follow me? He started through the mirror but stopped suddenly. Oh, and the password is puking pastilles. Harry nodded dumbly and watched as he disappeared completely. He stepped forward cautiously, mumbled the password, and slowly passed one hand through the mirror. It was an odd feeling, like water or molten metal but it was neither wet nor cold. Harry pulled his hand back out and examined it, counting his fingers and nails carefully to make sure they were all intact. Confident that he would come out in one piece, Harry stepped through the mirror. As he came out on the other side he looked back to see it flexing gently, resuming its flat dimension. He shook his head, still amazed that he hadn't realized that the mirror must have had some magical properties. Harry turned to find Lupin and gaped. An entire apartment was laid out in front of him. He was standing in the entrance to the living area. A small alcove off the right of the room revealed a kitchen, complete with all the food a man could want. Harry looked up to find a balcony with a small study above him, huge bookcases lining the three walls. Doors led off from the main room. Harry just looked at them each in turn, not feeling like exploring any more as his head was already reeling. He turned to gape at the room and started when he noticed Lupin was lying on the couch, one arm thrown over his eyes, the other trailing on the rug. A fire was blazing in the enormous grate. Harry sat down in the nearest armchair and leaned back as he continued to examine the room. Pictures were hung on the walls, many of the marauders and Lily. Harry was slightly surprised to see a lot of him, some of them newspaper clippings. The other handful of personal items that Lupin had managed to bring with him were obviously in his room. Harry shook his head, still dumbfounded. Why do none of the students know that the professors have these rooms? Lupin moved the arm covering his face so that he could see Harry and raised an eyebrow. 
because if the students knew about them we professors would never have a moment of peace. Harry smiled. And why have I never seen this before? I mean, as many times as I've been inside a teacher's office, I've never seen anything that could lead to another room. Lupin waved his hand lazily. Most of the entrances are inconspicuous, blank walls, small portraits, furniture, even mirrors, as you now know. The replica that we call our living quarters is simply there to provide cover for our real living arrangements. And the reason why I never showed you before is because when I taught you, we were simply student and teacher, and letting you into my private chambers likely would have garnered a lot of unwanted attention, no? Besides, I was trying to keep a low profile that year. Inviting Harry Potter to visit me at any given time in my rooms would have blown that plan out of the water. Lupin summoned a few pillows and they came soaring out of one of the doors. Lupin used them to prop himself up. He leaned back, sighing in contentment. Seeing Harry's curious glance toward the door when the pillows had appeared, Lupin pointed to each door in turn. Training room, storage, bathroom, master bedroom, guest room. Harry nodded, noting the place of each door. Right. So, how are you? Lupin asked, sinking further into the pillows. Harry snorted. What do you think? Always something I want to hear, Lupin groaned, sarcastically. Wonderful. Tell me about it. Well, I had another nightmare last night, Harry grumbled. Lupin tried to sit up, but grimaced and leaned back again. And? It was about, well, I wish I could have saved you some of that pain, Mooney. Lupin frowned. What are you talking about, Harry? You don't usually call me Mooney. I should. Harry rubbed his hands over his face then jumped up and started pacing. I can't believe I didn't figure it out even with all those hints. You know, I'm still not sure what I was supposed to figure out, Rem Lupin, whatever I'm supposed to call you. Harry sat back down heavily. Call me whatever you wish, Harry, although, you know I prefer Remus or Mooney in your case. Unfortunately that could be a bit trying for you at the moment. Harry nodded as Lupin shifted, trying to get more comfortable. Tell me what happened. Harry sighed and sat back in the squishy armchair. I was a small animal with a silver right paw. I watched you transform, watched you bite yourself, and then I woke up. I came to see if the nightmare was real. I couldn't get in obviously. Then Dumbledore and McGonagall showed up. Dumbledore and McGonagall. Lupin frowned, unhappy about the turn of events. Harry nodded. Dumbledore took down your barriers and opened the door. You stared at us a moment then came toward us. I'm sorry about your arm, by the way. It got caught in the door when I closed it. Lupin was silent a moment, lost in thought. How did you see my transformation? I think I was Wormtail. Lupin blinked. Voldemort must have wanted him to do something, and he tagged along or used legilimency or something to make sure he did it. You think you were Peter? But, that means they're here. He is at least. Voldemort could be anywhere if he was using legilimency. It's the only explanation I have, unless you have another. Besides that you have finally gone mental. No I think you're right. That's the only possible answer. That's funny. I told myself the same thing. They fell silent, both thinking. Harry glanced at Lupin then asked quietly, Remus, why were you acting that way? Lupin was silent, simply staring at the ceiling. I thought perhaps you'd forgotten to take your potion or something. I spent all night looking for some clue in that book you lent me. Lupin sighed and sat up slowly, making Harry realize how hard the night had been on him, which was unusual in itself. Harry, the book was the clue. How in the world was that the clue? Harry asked, waving his arms. There was so much information in that book that I could barely process it all. And it was all about what happens to werewolves on the night of the full moon, right? Well, yeah, but I don't I'm out of Wolfsbane potion. There was silence. Harry just stared at Lupin until he found his voice. I'm sorry. Run that by me again. I thought I heard you say you're out of Wolfsbane potion. That's exactly what I said. I gave you that book as a hint so that it might hold you off from asking until after the next full moon. I didn't want to come out and tell you. You would have done something drastic, I'm sure. The truth is that I only had enough of the potion for September. I'm sure you've noticed how jumpy I've been lately. It's because I'm used to the wolf being suppressed. Now I can hear, smell, see, feel, everything. My senses have been heightened and it's like overload. I'm almost used to it by now though. I thought your senses were heightened anyway. They were. But Snape put something into his mixture to try and suppress the wolf, 
the wolf's feelings. Honestly, I never liked it. I recently began making my own wolf's bane potion again. Unfortunately I've never been the same after taking Snape's, but I think I'll be back to normal after being off the potion for a while, and then I'll start taking my own again. Good. I hope that's better for you. I've been so worried about it, that I think I've become more attuned. I learned to tone everything down. I think I actually missed having heightened senses. You're telling me you're out of the potion now. Harry snapped, rubbing his temples as he finally lost his grip on the situation. I'm sorry, Harry. The problem is the ingredients. I can't go around asking for Wolfsbane. But I thought it's already being used. It's not. It'll be discovered in exactly a year. And unless there's a secret grove on the Hogwarts grounds, I can't go looking for it. So, that's it. You'll have to revert back to biting and clawing yourself. Harry fumed. No, I won't let you. There has to be something I can do. Harry, there's nothing you can do. Don't get involved. I will find a way to help, Remus. I've heard enough people. It's time to help someone. Someone knocked softly on the mirror, making them look around. Lupin started to stand up but Harry got up and moved toward the portal. He stopped short and just stared at it then looked around at Lupin, looking sheepish. Or, how do I open it? Lupin smiled. From this side? Act like you're reaching for a doorknob. Harry reached out toward the mirror and closed his fist slowly. Something hard pressed into his palm. A glass knob had appeared. Harry turned it and pulled the mirror toward him. It swung open like a normal door, revealing Dumbledore and McGonagall. Harry blinked in surprise then moved back so they could come in. Harry watched as they sat down facing Lupin. He turned to leave, reluctantly admitting Lupin could take care of himself, but paused and looked back around at the chair he had been sitting in. His cloak had fallen off at some point and was hanging over the chair arm. Harry closed the mirror with a soft click and moved to pick it up. Turning back toward the door, he mumbled, I'll just go then. Lupin immediately grabbed his arm his hand closing over Harry's irritated wound. Harry winced as Lupin kept a firm grip. Stay, Harry. Please? Harry nodded stiffly, dull stabs of pain shooting through his arm. Harry, is that the arm you injured last night? Dumbledore asked. Harry tried to pull away from Lupin, rotating his arm to loosen his grip but to no avail. I don't know what you're talking about. Lupin let go of his arm and grabbed his wrist instead using his free hand to roll up Harry's sleeve. Three long, red gashes marred his skin. Lupin dropped Harry's arm in revulsion. I did that, didn't I? He asked, his voice thick with remorse. He didn't even wait for Harry to answer. I could have killed you. But you didn't. I'm fine, all in one piece. Don't start that again. He is right, Professor Century. You have not hurt him very badly and he does not blame you in the slightest. Lupin nodded, still looking sullen. Now, as I am sure Harry has already told you, Minerva and I have realized your lycanthropy. I asked Harry for your name last night. Lupin frowned again. Today was just not his day. Do not worry. Harry refused to break your trust in him. Lupin smiled softly and scooted over as Harry sat down beside him. Dumbledore beamed. So, I have decided to ask you myself. Will you give me your name? Lupin stared into the fire. Massaging his arms gently, avoiding the biggest bruises, his movements slow. I will tell you my name, but I ask that no one is told nor that anything will change between us. Dumbledore nodded. Of course. Are you sure about this? Harry asked. I shouldn't have told McGonagall who I am. You don't have to tell. Lupin nodded. It's fine. As long as word doesn't get out, then it really shouldn't matter. Besides, Minerva should know that I am fine. Harry rolled his eyes. She's probably fine, she trusts you. True, but having us both disappear may have driven her to extreme measures. Lupin laughed suddenly. Your father would have a field day if he knew that. Yeah, maybe, but he'd probably be making fun of Mr. Mooney too. After all, being a professor is against the Marauder's Code, is it not? Lupin snorted. I believe it is, but I don't think they would object much. He looked over at the professors, smiling. Allow me to introduce myself. I am R.J. Lupin. Pleasure to meet you, again, professors. And, Minerva, put down the fire whiskey. Harry and I are alive and well. You haven't lost us. McGonagall sputtered. I hope you are talking to my future self, sir. Of course, Lupin replied innocently. Dumbledore chuckled, the twinkle in his eyes brighter than ever. 
I should have known. I cannot say that I did not notice some things, but still, I should have realized it. Nice to know that I was correct in my assumption that you were familiar. Glad to know I'm so predictable. Not predictable, my boy, well known. Harry, Harry, wake up. Harry groaned. He was too tired. Couldn't they leave him alone for one minute? Come on, man. Sirius is already on my case for leaving you here to study. Wait until he gets you for skipping dinner. Remus shook Harry's shoulder. With a loud grunt, Harry woke up. Huh. What? Sorry, Remus. What were you saying? Harry rubbed his eyes and stretched. You missed dinner for one. Two, you've been in here for two days solid. I thought you weren't into studying, Remus teased. Harry yawned and stood up. I'm not. But I guess I'd do anything for a friend, even study at the unearthly hour of four in the morning. Harry gathered the books strewn across the table into his arms. Can you get the last two, Remus? Sure. Harry and Remus started toward Gryffindor Tower, walking in a comfortable silence. Remus looked at the books in his hands and raised his eyebrows. What are you researching anyway? I don't remember being told to study for any of this. Harry kept looking straight ahead. It's just a little extra credit stuff. Nothing too big. Remus nodded in understanding and fell silent, still tempted to open them and read at least the introduction. When they entered the common room, everyone looked around at them, as usual and many of them started sniggering. Remus nudged Harry. You get the feeling something's not right? Harry nodded slowly. His head felt heavy and he didn't like how quiet it was, despite the chuckling. Harry noticed the other marauders were sitting by the fire, each wearing a large grin. They glanced at each other then back over at Remus and Harry. Sirius suddenly burst out laughing and most of the common room followed suit. Remus glanced over at Harry as James fought to stay in his chair. What is so funny? Remus asked tentatively, his voice carrying over to the marauders. They made their way over to their three friends and sat down Harry's stack of books. You two are what's funny, James howled. Why? Harry asked. Sirius conjured a mirror and held it up for Harry to see. Harry gasped, grabbing the mirror from Sirius. Harry gaped at his reflection. He now had the tail, ears, and antlers of an animal. He reached up slowly and felt his ears, but quickly moved on to his antlers as he realized the ears reminded him of the times Sirius had sat beside him, allowing Harry to scratch his own dog ears. He turned to look at his tail as it swayed gently behind him. What did you do to me? Harry asked in a strangled voice, turning back to the mirror. His eyes widened as he noticed that they had become slanted, almost like a cat's. James smiled. We were bored, so we said a little prank for you. But we couldn't decide what animal to give you, so, we gave you four. Remus only has a wolf's tail and ears. Harry looked over at Remus and smirked, fighting the urge to laugh. Remus's ears and tail fit him perfectly, as did the annoyed glare he was sending in his friend's directions. James went on, ignoring Remus. You, however, have a wolf's tail, tiger's eyes and claws. Harry looked down at his hands, dog's ears, and stag's antlers. So, what do you think? I think you need to change me back. Why would we ever want to do that? Sirius asked innocently. He smothered a laugh, leaned over, and whispered to James. Too bad he can't change at will. Harry turned to him sharply. What? 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 Nothing, Harry murmured, frowning slightly. James snickered and faked a sigh. He took out his wand and gave it a lazy flick. Harry nodded in satisfaction as he returned to normal but his mind wasn't completely focused on the prank. A sudden thought had occurred to him. The marauders had turned him into part of an animal, some of their animals. They were animagi. What was keeping him from becoming one too? The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopards will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. I've never seen someone so, er, keyed up for transfiguration, have you? Remus asked, watching as Harry walked ahead of him a slight bounce to his tired step. I dunno. I think Padfoot or Prongs could give him a run for his galleons. Peter laughed. They've always liked transfiguration. Sirius and James glared at him. What's that supposed to mean, Wormtail? James growled. At least we look forward to the lessons. You only look forward to the girl you'll pick up. Sirius smirked. Do not. You're the one always hunting for the girls. Sirius made a rude gesture behind Peter's back as they went to their seats. Harry rolled his eyes, 
ignoring his godfather altogether, and chose a seat in the corner, out of everyone's view. James nudged Sirius and motioned toward Harry, raising an eyebrow in question. Sirius shrugged. Antisocial? He sat down beside Harry, James following his lead and sitting down on his other side. Harry glanced at them but said nothing. If they wanted to keep an eye on him, fine, just so long as they didn't ask questions he would be good. Harry sighed, tapping his fingers impatiently on his desk. Professor McGonagall seemed, to the untrained eye, to be absent from the room, a tabby cat sitting on her vacant desk. The bell rang and everyone's eyes fixed on the cat. Sirius nudged Harry and whispered, that's McGonagall. Bet you didn't know she's an animagus, did you, Harry? Harry shrugged, failing to look surprised in his anticipation. Doesn't mean much to me, just that she's smarter than the average wizard, or in this case which. Sirius and James beamed, sharing a mischievous look. That's quite a compliment, Harry. James whispered, his smile widening. Well, anyone who has successfully become an animagus deserves it. The cat chose that moment to jump down from the desk and transform into McGonagall. She watched the class passively for a moment then sighed. I believe it best to get the Animagus section out of the way. You all know most of the history behind the Animagus, therefore we will try to only cover the theory behind the transformation. Professor Century, she gestured to the corner where Century sat patiently, is here to help me even though he has never had any experience in this subject. Harry fought back a laugh and coughed to cover it up, trying to focus on McGonagall again. Today is your opportunity to ask me any questions you would like. This will help you decide if you want to become an animagus in the future. Begin. Lily Evans was first to raise her hand. Is it true the transformation is painful? McGonagall nodded slightly. When first learning to transform into your animal, it is painful. Your DNA has to merge, in a sense, with the animal's DNA. You are, however, still fully human, and retain all human thoughts. When you successfully turn into your animagus form, one tiny strand of DNA will combine with your animal's DNA. So, you just give up enough of your DNA so you can turn? Yes. You see, with beings such as werewolves, the entire body of DNA fuses with the werewolf. In an animagus, the tiniest strand possible is used, and yet it is enough to completely transform. Of course, I am explaining it in the simplest terms possible. Any other information on the mechanics of the spell and I am certain that I would lose a number of you. Harry put down his quill and looked at McGonagall with a confused expression. So, Professor, you're saying that the DNA does not fuse at all until the wizard calls on the transformation. The animal's DNA is just latched onto a strand of your DNA, like a, buddy system? Professor McGonagall bit her lip, frowning slightly. He seemed to have really stumped her. Century intervened. He began to slowly walk around the room while answering, his movements relaxed, as though he thought about the theory behind the animagus transformation every day. Yes, that is exactly right. As you can see, Professor McGonagall has no cat-like features on her person. If her DNA had actually fused with the cats, she would likely have yellow eyes and perhaps claws or even a tail. Good question, Mr. Times. Harry smiled and went back to his notes, jotting it all down as fast as he could so as not to miss anything. Is the DNA of the animal added to a potion in order to make the DNA fuse, or is it a spell? Frank Longbottom asked. It is both, but firstly a potion, and a very complicated and time-consuming one at that. McGonagall answered. However, it is neither the time nor effort toward the potion which diverts most wizards from the animagus. It is the pain involved, as Miss Evans pointed out. McGonagall clasped her hands in front of her and looked around the class. The potion takes one week to brew, which is relatively short. It is drank right after the DNA, which is kept in its own solution called Puris Elementus, is added and a permanent transmutation spell is then performed on the potion. The spell is considered the easiest part of the transformation. The spell takes effect whenever you want to transform, as is normal for all transfiguration spells involving permanent transmutations. Next, the drinker has to learn how to concentrate on their animal. They must be able to feel their animal's emotions before they can transform. This usually takes a wizard months, even years, to perfect. Until they can feel those emotions well enough, it could take them a full five minutes to transform. Sirius shocked Harry by raising his hand. If someone didn't have an outside source, I mean, what if someone tried to become an animagus using only information found in books? How long do you think it would take them to find the right combination of ingredients, 
The right measurements? Is it even possible to do it by yourself? It could be done, but it would take years without outside help. It takes at least a year for the most qualified wizards. It took me two years and I had every material made available for me from the Ministry of Magic. Harry groaned and rested his head against his palm. Professor, can you choose characteristics? I mean, you have those markings around your eyes when you're transformed. Did you choose that or did it just happen? It just happened, Mr. Times. When the DNA fuses completely for the first time, it will choose your attributes automatically. It's all part of being magic. Some things just happen and we have no explanation for it, including much of the theory behind the transformation, which is why it is so hard to understand it. James's hand went into the air. How is it that you can be completely human while in your animagus form? Wouldn't you have, I dunno, like, cravings like your animal? Yes. When you transform, the animal DNA overpowers yours, giving you the body, emotions, and mannerisms of your animal. You must learn to harness those feelings and mannerisms, to fight them so that they don't take over your mind. When you have complete control, you could pass off as your animal for months, years even. Harry growled and clutched his quill so tightly that it almost snapped in half. He ground his teeth together and forced himself to look down at his paper, and not over at Peter. A hand on his shoulder made him look up. Sirius had a worried expression on his face. You okay? He mouthed silently. Harry nodded and looked down again, willing himself not to think about Sirius. Professor McGonagall continued, oblivious to his sudden mood swing. But while you can behave like your animal, you still have your mind. You can think as you would, not your animal. Sirius raised his hand again. What if you didn't know what animal you could turn into? Like, what if you accidentally added something to your potion or you didn't remember what DNA you added, because you couldn't decide or something? Century, who happened to be standing right behind Sirius, answered in an all too enthusiastic voice. Sirius jumped slightly in shock. Excellent question, Mr. Black. First, you would have to realize that you didn't know what animal you were. Say you accidentally added the wrong DNA to the potion and didn't know it. When you tried to focus on the animal you thought you added, you would feel nothing, no emotions, no cravings, nothing. There are four solutions to that problem. First, you could take a simple potion called Brutus Exposus. It causes the drinker to dream while looking through their creature's eyes. From what they learn, they must deduce what animal they are most like. Second, there is the potion Fantasia Horribilius. This potion causes the drinker to dream their animal is attacking them. That's one to avoid if you scare easily. Third, there is the image charm. It takes a great deal of concentration, but when done correctly, it is useful. The wizard can choose any material, such as a necklace or parchment or even their body, and perform the charm. A necklace, most likely the pendant, would reform into their animal. On parchment a picture would be drawn. On their body it would likely be in the form of a tattoo. The fourth solution, century paused, is to forget the whole thing. A few people laughed. Harry chuckled and raised his hand. Do any characteristics of the animal leak out into a person's everyday personality? Like, what if they were a dog? Would that make their laugh change into something like a bark? Harry smiled slightly, glancing over at Sirius. Century smiled too. On the contrary. Usually a wizard will already have something that makes them akin to an animal which normally prompts them to choose the animal they are most like. If a person has too many qualities, like the agility of a deer, the strength of a tiger, the loyalty of a dog, the cunning of a fox, the stealth of a snake, the bravery of a lion, well a person can't be everything, can they? So, another potion is used, Brutus Aquintus which most, if not all, animagi have used to reveal their, inner animal, so to speak. Century chuckled to himself. Knowing their inner animal really does nothing for them, but it makes it easier to choose an animal. Simple as that. It doesn't help the transformation in the slightest. And some people have so many options that they can't choose anyway or can't even be shown. McGonagall spoke up, staring at Century, obviously wondering why he knew so much about her subject. It is the most common way for a wizard to choose his animal. When drank, the potion has a similar effect as its brother, Brutus Exposus, except the animal is shown directly to the dreamer. Harry put his head down on his desk. His head was spinning with too much information. Perhaps this was going to be a bit harder than he'd thought. You've been at this for weeks. Take a break and have some fun with us. Come on. Sirius whined. He slumped against Harry's chair leg, moping. He really didn't like being ignored. 
It's only been three days, serious. Harry took another book from his stack and started flipping through it, leaving the previous one open in his lap. But Sirius is right, Harry. You've barely moved. And look at this. You have piles, mountains of books here. Are you trying to read them all before Christmas? James threw one of the books at Remus who turned just in time to see the book flying toward him. It slammed into his chest, knocking the wind from him in a rush. Remus turned the book over and read the spine. His expression turned stony for a moment before he cleared his throat. What are you researching exactly? Harry shrugged. Just different things. Why? I don't think we have any work on most, no, any of this, yar. Junk? Sirius suggested. Tosh? James picked up another book. Rubbish. Dung. Stuff. Remus huffed, grabbing a book from Sirius's groping paws. Don't you dare touch another of these innocent books, Padfoot. They never hurt you. I wasn't going to hurt them. I love reading. What gave you the idea I was going to torture them? Sirius protested indignantly. Besides the fact that every book you touch somehow ends up with graffiti in it, all the poor books in your trunk have papers stuffed between their covers. I swear they look like overgrown puff skeins on a bad hair day. You're one to talk, Mooney, Sirius grumbled, overgrown badger. Are you implying I look like a badger? Remus gaped at him as James and Peter snickered. That's an insult. At least you aren't a rat, Harry mumbled unconsciously. The marauders froze, watching him. Harry copied down another excerpt from one of the books on his lap, not noticing how quiet they had gotten. He picked up the book hanging on the chair arm, accidentally hitting Sirius's head with it. Sorry. He flipped through a couple pages, skimming it, and suddenly threw his quill down with a frustrated sigh. He placed the books back on the table, all of them still open to the pages he had been working on. I'm taking a break. See you in a bit. Harry stood, stretched, and clambered through the portrait hole. The marauders glanced around to make sure no one could hear them. Sirius stood up and moved Harry's chair slightly so their table was blocked from view, promptly dropping into it so he could talk with the others. Peter gulped. You don't think he knows, do you? James picked up Harry's notes. He read through them quickly, skipping the uninteresting parts. Looks like Harry's doing a lot of extracurricular research. He looked up. And it's about more than one subject. The others leaned toward him, reading the notes from where they were sitting. Sirius let out a low groan, taking a page from James as he read over it. Look at all this stuff about werewolves. He ran his finger down the page and stopped at a note that was in bold. Hey, here's something new. The werewolf is extremely terrestrial. However, researchers have found that when placed among larger animals, it will be more willing to submission. In a study by Ptolemy himself, who found lycanthropy to be a captivating subject, a transfigured witch or wizard was found to have at least a small degree of control over said werewolf. More recent studies show animagi have an unusual ability to control and befriend werewolves. When one subject was bitten, the bite was found to not affect the wizard, even after he had transformed back into a human. Lycanthrope bites do not infect animals, and therefore never transfer to their human counterpart DNA. That's interesting. And we were wondering why none of us ever contracted the lycanthrope gene. James snorted. Yeah, interesting, not that I really cared so long as we didn't get it, no offense, Mooney. Hey, here's something on animagi. He pointed to a few books and then Harry's notes again. Looks like he's trying to get some extra points. He has all the ingredients to every potion Professor Century mentioned right here. And here's how long they have to brew. Peter pointed to another spot halfway up the page. Sirius and James shared a glance then looked over at Remus who had been extremely quiet. His mouth was set in a frown. Peter prodded his arm lightly to bring him out of his thoughts. Remus silently handed them a crumpled bit of parchment on which a crude lunar chart had been inscribed. The date of the next full moon was circled. The boys stared at it in shock. What do you think it means, Mooney? He knows. There's no other explanation. No way. He's only been here for two full moons. Sirius objected. It took us a year and a half. No way could he figure it out that quick. Remus sat in silence. What else is he researching? He asked. James flipped through the notes and stopped, staring. Well? Sirius coaxed. Wandless magic. I didn't know there was such a thing. James looked at the others for some input. They shrugged. So, shall we start our next mission? Sirius asked. The others looked at him curiously. 
And that would be. Puzzle solving 101, Harry Times. The others smiled. Right. When do we start? Lily, it's him, take Harry, and run. Not Harry, please, not Harry. Kill the spare, he's gone, Harry. No, he's just gone through, serious. You're not a killer, Draco. Avada Kedavra. Fangs in there, ye brutes. Now, I want you to write. I must not tell lies. Cold laughter filled Harry's mind. He was falling faster and faster. More voices joined, each clamoring for Harry's attention, but he found himself unable to concentrate on anything but the rushing sound in his ears. The lightning child must prevail. I would not know, Harry. I have never died. The shadows will ease the pains of loss drowned in a sea of tears. And then she went out and got herself blown up and we got landed with you. Betrayal, mockery, forgiveness. He is just a boy. He is too young. Pain, disbelief, anguish. There is no such thing as magic. The lightning child must prevail. There was a flash of blinding green light. We will meet again, Harry Potter. The laughter reached a peak and Harry's scar seared. He woke up screaming. Harry looked around quickly, his heart racing wildly. The curtains were drawn around his four poster bed. Why had the marauders not bothered to wake him this time? Remus wouldn't leave him screaming like that, would he? Harry yanked back the curtains. They didn't make a sound. He sighed. No wonder no one had heard him. He'd forgotten about the silencing charm he'd cast on his bed. Harry got up and dressed quietly. There was no use trying to get back to sleep, not after that. He was pulling on his socks when he noticed how quiet the room was. He couldn't hear James's snoring or Sirius's heavy breathing occasionally punctuated by a loud snore, not even Remus's light sighs. Harry crept to James's bed and pulled back the curtains cautiously. It was empty. Harry let out a frustrated cry. All that creeping around for nothing. He flicked his wrist and the curtains on the other beds flew up. Nothing. All empty. Harry knew he should have been overjoyed by how easily his wandless magic was coming along. What with his luck on disabling Remus's spell on Sirius's ring, but other than a few spells here and there he had no time to practice. And now he'd wasted countless hours sleeping when he could have been researching as the marauders planned their next prank. He growled loudly. Harry stomped down the stairs into the common room. It was empty. Harry let out another frustrated cry. He was really not paying enough attention. He sat down in front of his notes and stared down at them, the words all too familiar. He'd been constantly reading for almost a week, not that he could say it hadn't been worthwhile. He'd learned more in that time than when Hermione had made him and Ron cram for exams. He flipped through the notes lazily and came to some information he had found just the night before. Few werewolves have been known to actually bear children. Many prefer to live alone, out of the way of others. When a werewolf does have a biological child, it will protect it with its life even reverting to primal instincts when fully human. However, more werewolves have been reported to adopt a child, either lawfully or simply paternally. When this happens, the child is seen as one of its pack, and treated the same way as their own child would be. Werewolves have been asked, when fully human, how they get by on the full moons. Most have responded that they had formed a pack, not with other werewolves, but animals, leading to extensive research to determine whether animals have special control over werewolves. Harry had taken it upon himself to write himself a note underneath it. Mooney's pack is, was, will be Padfoot, Prongs, Wormtail, and Lily. Harry sighed. He finally had most of the information to start the Animagus transformation. He knew that. The problem was that he didn't have the time nor privacy to pull it off. If only he could find that vital information he was missing. One important piece and he couldn't get it. He needed a first-hand account and to get that. He would have to admit he wanted to become an animagus to somebody, and that was not a part of his plan. Harry leaned back in the chair and sighed. He was so tired. He felt his eyelids droop and his head slumped forward onto his chest. Did you mean to produce a stinging hex? Remedial potions? The lightning child, filth, scum, creature won't, 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 won't. The shadows, come seek us where our voices sound. We cannot sing above the ground. Yeah, go and tear win, Harry. Betrayal, the Dark Lord did not manage to kill you, Potter. Harry, Harry, wake up, you're dreaming, Harry, the Dark Lord. The voices had risen in pitch and Harry found himself yelling as he began to wake, the Dark Lord. Harry, 
Someone slapped his face and he woke with a start. W.H. what? Harry blinked, and the room swam into focus. The marauders were standing around him, their eyes wide. Sirius's hand was still raised from the slap. Remus and James nudged him away, obviously seeing how disoriented Harry was. Harry, are you alright? Remus asked. Yeah, cause we heard you screaming and couldn't help but overhear. James shrugged, trailing off. No I'm alright. Did I say anything? Harry glanced around the group quickly, praying that he hadn't. Well, you were mainly flailing around like a madman until the last minute. Then you started screaming like crazy and Sirius caught Remus's warning glance and stuttered. Err, no, why? What did I say? The boys shared a look. Peter took a deep breath. You said, the Dark Lord, well, more like screamed it, but you get the point. Harry scowled. Wonderful. See you all at breakfast. Hey, James, you're awfully quiet this morning. Frank nudged him gently, but James didn't reply. He simply stared at his plate, a small smirk on his face. A sudden scuffle seemed to break out across the hall. James and the other marauders looked up, grins on their faces. Harry sighed and looked up from his parchment, frowning slightly. Pranks really were the norm for the marauders, but they were getting to be annoying. Snape had stood up, and he seemed to be having difficulty sitting back down. His body twitched as he tried to force his knees to bend, but they didn't give. Suddenly, he opened his mouth and yelled, I love chicken wings. Sirius stared at the plate in front of him and pushed it away, even as laughter erupted around him. Wonderful. People all over the hall began standing up, declaring undying love for some inanimate object or unfortunate soul who blushed and ran out of the hall. Harry grinned when Alice and Frank stood up and declared their love for each other. It was rather sweet, in a cruel, twisted sort of way. He sighed and reached for his goblet. Peter grinned at him. Harry hastily reached for a piece of toast instead and bit into it. He instantly regretted it as the marauders smiled evilly at him. Harry's body seized up and he found himself standing up. He opened his mouth and bellowed, I love Ginny Weasley. He abruptly sat down again, blinking in surprise, and hastily picked up his quill, ready to start on his paper again before anyone noticed what he'd said. He almost screamed in frustration when he realized the marauders had it. Harry snatched it away and Peter yelped in pain. Sorry, Harry mumbled, not feeling sorry in the slightest, and got up again. Sirius grabbed his shoulder, forcing him to stay. What was that you were writing, Harry? Looked like a big equation to me, Remus said, pushing his hair out of his eyes. I could help. No. Harry snapped. He jerked away from Sirius and cut his way through the students to reach the corridor. James huffed. How rude. Well, we did take his paper. Remus tapped his piece of toast with his wand and was about to take a bite when Sirius grabbed it and stuffed it in his mouth. Remus gagged in disgust. Do you have any manners in your internal programming? Yes, but not around you. Sirius spoke around the toast. Swallowing it, he continued, but why would it matter that we looked at that paper? I don't know, but, Peter turned over his napkin. I got a copy before he noticed. Brilliant. You're smarter than you look, Wormtail. James pulled the napkin to him. He frowned. I don't understand any of this. It's coded or something. Remus took it, smoothing it out. I don't think so. Look, it's like a list, really. Lightning child equals me, Harry in parenthesis, Dark Lord equals Voldemort, oh stop, Peter, shadows is blank, and silver hand equals, Peter. Silver hand. Where'd he get that? Dunno. What is this? It makes no sense. Remus frowned looking it over again. To us. Harry seemed to understand it perfectly, James said with a shrug. He was poring over it well enough from what we saw. Peter yawned widely, a sure sign that class was about to start. Yeah, going at it full speed. Sirius yawned too. Stop yawning. I hate it when you do that. Sorry. So, what now? What do you mean? James asked, getting up from the table. The others followed. Sirius yawned again. I mean, when is Operation Figure Out Harry starting? I thought it was puzzle solving 101, Harry Times, Peter said, munching on some toast he'd taken. Whatever. I think what Sirius is saying is that he's getting anxious, Remus said, rolling his eyes. Exactly, Sirius crowed. So, how are we going to do this? Well, when I think my bed will comfort me and my couch will ease my complaint, 
even then you frighten me with dreams and terrify me with visions, so that I prefer strangling and death, rather than this body of mine. Thanks for watching.